the academic session for which we have gathered here. I am uh, Dr. Chandan Kumar, uh, Secretary Kanpur Orthopedic Association. First of all, I would like to call our uh, president and uh, organizing secretary of this course, Dr. Amit Agarwal, to uh, kindly brief about today's program. Sir, Amit Agarwal, sir. Good morning. Uh, this is a indeed uh, very pleasant to see you all very early on Sunday. It seems that you are very excited, curious about this course. And why not? If the faculty is so learned, so magnificent, then one should be excited enough. I welcome all faculty members, especially Dr. Anand Joshi, sir. Good morning, sir. Who is the director of this course as the sole stopper of this great academic feast? Actually, I was after him when he was in England, London for quite some time requesting for please give the date. And I exactly remember, and he was always busy saying, there is no date, sorry, calendar is booked. There is no slot. And on 14th of June, when he says, saw that this fellow is not going to go away, probably then he said, okay, I can give you one date that is July and that is 10th. So then I sat with my team and asked whether is it possible in such a short time of 20 days to do this program. And I'm so happy that my team supported said, We'll sit day and night, we'll do hard labor, but we'll do the program on given date. So thank team KOA, Chandan, Ajit, Vishal, Raghven, any, everyone, Vijay, Anil. So thank you very much for doing in the given date. And it was very, very short time to arrange this kind of workshop or the course. I welcome Dr. Amit Joshi who has come all the way from Kathmandu, Nepal. He has worked in army hospital and now he's professor in, good morning, sir. And thank you very much for bringing Mrs. Josia as well. Good morning. I welcome Dr. K.D. Tripathi, Dr. Vinay Pandey, Dr. Vinay Pandey was like, he was making all the scientific program very minutely. Thank you very much. Dr. Ashish Kumar probably has not come. He is the professor in KGMU. Uh, he's on the way from Lucknow, he's coming. And I also welcome Dr. Sundar Rajan, whom we saw on the screen from Ganga Medical Center, Coimbatore. He is the secretary of IES. And Dr. Sachin Tapaswi, if he's online, Dr. Sachin Tapaswi, he, I welcome him also. He's from the Pune and he's the president of IES. And I thank you IES who has given us an assurance that the one meeting of IES in the banner of Indian Orthoscopic Society they are going to organize one program in Kanpur next calendar year, that is 2023. I welcome all the enthusiastic delegates who are the strong pillar of this academic bonanza. Without you, this would have not been possible. Friends, we know the evolution occurred. First, the medical science came, then orthopedics, and after that, offsuit came as orthoscopy. And orthoscopy came with full band vaja barat. And every day there is some or the other advancement in the orthoscopy. And we are lucky to have the stalwarts here with us, Dr. Aran Joshi, Dr. Amit Joshi, who has seen all evolution of orthoscopy, how has it been done from infancy to this level. All dhup chao, sir, India mein to orthoscopy ke sir aapko jana kaha jaye to it will not be any surprise. Dr. Anand Joshi, ke liye, sir, ek tali ho jai, sir. 
so uh, we as a delegate will try to extract maximum from such a learned faculty and to do that we have also kept a separate session meet the master so that we can ask whatever we can ask we can we want to ask from them so how the program will run is uh, the program will start with the session on the meniscus and there will be session on the acl and then on the open injuries that is open uh, for the medial injuries and every session will have a question answer session at the end please remain prepared with your question you can come in the central uh, this row and please put a mic over here organizers mr sanjay from ojas can you put a stand mic over here in the center so that the delegates can ask the question and they can come in the queue one after the other we shall have formal inauguration at 12 and post lunch we have kept an interesting session on hands on workshop the hands on workshop is on two topics one is on the acl reconstruction and second is on the mid on the meniscal repair there is table the five tables if you see your badge if there is any number on it is there any number on it dr kk uh, have we allotted the table numbers okay so most of them have got number so see the number if you have got number 2 then see the table number 2 and you have to go there first the demonstrator over here they will show the whole course which will be displayed on this led please wait for their procedure to be finished then only start by your procedure and every table will have the table instructor table demonstrator to help you so please do not be in hurry and please wait till the, the the demonstrator on the main dice they finish the procedure and there is another humble request please all of you please keep your mobile phones on the silent mode main janta hu ki yahan par jo sabhi doctors aaye hue hain orthopedic surgeon they all are not orthoscopic surgeon still they have come main unke jazbe ko salam karta hu kehte hain manzile mile na mile manzile mile na mile ye to muqaddar ki baat hai हम कोशिश ही ना करें तो ये तो गलत बात एंड ये ये तो सैल्यूट टू सर रस्तोगी सर हमारे सर मैं उनसे हमेशा कुछ ना कुछ सीखते ही रहता हूं सर सो विदाउट वेस्टिंग लॉट ऑफ टाइम लेट अस लर्न स्टार्ट लर्निंग फ्रॉम द एक्सपर्ट्स गुड लक एंड बेस्ट विशेष टू यू एंड प्लीज हैव ए कंफर्टेबल स्टे इन कानपुर फॉर द स्मॉलेस्ट थिंग प्लीज बॉदर मी एंड माई टीम वी आर हियर राइट हियर टू सर्व यू गुड लक नमस्ते थैंक यू सो मच thank you amit sir so without wasting any time we are uh, going to start the uh, this very important session on meniscus so we all know that patient may not come to us for acl but he will uh, definitely come for meniscus so this is a very important session i request all the delegates to kindly uh, be seated so that the program can run smoothly so first of all i would like to invite the chair persons for this session i would like to invite uh, dr sanjay rastogi sir on the dais rk singh sir kindly come on the dais and rajiv agarwal sir i request our chair persons to kindly start the program good morning everybody and welcome to the arthroscopic course and i have the 
beauty of introducing our speaker the, the first international speaker we have in arthroscopy is from nepal he is the first generation orthopedic surgeon from nepal previously the students used to come from nepal to india then the trend changed the people from here went to nepal to study their medicine now we have faculty from nepal i must congratulate the nepal orthopedic association for this achievement dr joshi is has practiced orth orthopedic endoscopy in army he served nepal army for 25 years then he switched to medical college at kist kathmandu and he has started arthroscopy from 2007 he has done more than 10000 arthroscopies he has 75 publications he has published three books and the best is that he has seven techniques to his credit which are practiced all over the world and with this the other speaker is our own dr k d tripathi he is from allahabad and he has been he has been trained at central institute of orthopedics at that time it was makka of orthopedics in northern india the center was started by dr durai swami a very very learned person and followed by dr balu shankaran and he has extensively trained himself by fellowships in india and abroad and with this i request dr kd tripathi to give his talk on technical pulse meniscectomy and nightmares thank you chair persons professor astogi dr r k sen dr dawal thank you kanpur arth orthopedic association and uh, up a up arthroscopy association dr amit for making me the part of uh, this great event and giving me opportunity to interact again with dr anand joshi dr amit joshi and uh, this opportunity they give me not only to make me the part of this but as a opening batsman of this uh, session friends 90s was the evolution of arthroscopy in india and uh, dr joshi roamed each and every nook and corner of this country and established arthroscopy in those days when i started arthroscopy in uh, my place So my seniors used to say that a lot of pain dal ke bahar diya aur kehte ho ki arthroscopy karte hain. That was the comment about the two lot of pain dal ke aur joint ho diya aur arthroscopy karte hain. That was the era of evolution of arthroscopy. Then the two decades, 2000 to 2020, it was the era of ligament reconstruction, ACL and PCL and every knee arthroscopy was. being done that this is the decade going to be the decade of meniscal repair and it is very highly market driven area the meniscal repair in this market driven decade i think meniscectomy is going to have a back seat but i think meniscectomy is going to stay and it has its own definite indications we all know that meniscus has the ability to shock absorber and uh, proper reception so we must retain the meniscus as much as it is possible majority of uh, meniscal tears in our day to day practice are the degenerative 
and uh, in the young patients we have the meniscal tear as well along with the with or without ligament injury and uh, we all see the lo lot of log knee and other kind of meniscal tears there may be different kinds of tear there may be bucket handle may be flap tears but the diagnosis is usually made on the joint line tenderness if you classify they are the vertical tears horizontal tears and radial tears and different combination of these tears are there diagnosis is as i told you made basically on the joint line tenderness but the mcmurray tears the aplas compression tears aplas grinding tears they all are there to just rule out uh, part of which part of meniscus is torn but plain x rays are always important even in the meniscal injury you must see the alignment the angular angulatory defect in the knee if it is there then you be aware of the meniscal surgery go for mri see the morphology of meniscus but along with the morphology of meniscus you must see is there any cartilage degeneration is there any condyle defect is there any bone edema if there is a problem in the bone uh, problem with the bones i think just wait for the meniscal surgery don't embark immediately on the meniscal surgery coming to the treatment majority of these meniscal tears they heal by non operative bracing and uh, aggressive non surgical treatment acute and subacute rehab along with the if something exercises followed by but if it is not responding we can go ahead with the surgical treatment and partial meniscectomy has the lead in this surgical treatment but meniscal repair is taking over on the meniscectomy total meniscectomy is outdated in the early ages the smiley started with the smiley knife the total meniscectomy but that is all the history and outdated the goal of partial meniscectomy is to attain a very well balanced and stable meniscus we need only two porters to tackle majority of the meniscal surgery but sometimes we might need one more portal that can be the central infrapatellar portal gilquist portal you can take and with these three portals you can address any kind of meniscal tears but there are multiple like sometimes you need the root and ram uh, repair you can go from the posterior lateral or posterior medial approaches very rarely they are needed in the meniscal surgery but if you are going to do uh, the root repair ram repair then you need these portals to be there before doing meniscectomy you must do the diagnostic arthroscopy see the knee as a whole because there are many concomitant injuries in the knee so just uh, do the diagnostic arthroscopy see the patellofemoral joint see the intercondylar notch see the status of ligaments and uh, posterior medial and posterior lateral corner then see both the compartments medial compartment go into the medial gutter find out any torn portion of the meniscus or any other loose body whatever it is then go to the lateral gutter and lateral compartment diagnose whatever inside and then finally go to the meniscus see the medial meniscus from all around posterior to anterior and then go to the lateral meniscus see from posterior margin to anterior margin just go whole of the diagnostic round of the knee once you have taken the diagnostic round we must discuss what instruments are required i think only scope probe and 15 degree punch is needed in the majority of the meniscal surgery graspers and in hand instruments sometimes you need for the anterior horn you need the back punch and side punch right and left if you have then it's well and good but if you have very flexible wrist i can you can manage with the 15 degree of the punch then you need motorized instruments radio frequency ablators all these things they help in your surgery but if you don't have then i think uh, i have never seen 
Dr. Anand Joshi to use, uh, using these motorized instruments and uh, all these uh, radio vibrators for the miniseptomy. The simple operating room environment is there. Uh, in any routine theater, you can do the arthroscopy. In contrast to arthroplasty, you need very uh, leg holders are very important. You need the valgus and uh, varus, uh, and uh, it can be ready made with the. Uh, you did not need very costly leg holders. Just, uh, just it is necessary to have the valgus and varus system. Anesthesia, spinal or general. If you are doing going to do the daycare injury, give a short GA and send the patient in the evening. Coming to the special tears, flap tears. Flap tears are very uh, easy to do, but beware in these flap tears. Sometimes you have the anterior flaps, you removed it, but the other part of the flap on the posterior side is uh, hidden behind the condyles. So you must search them out and take it, take them out from the posterior part. Radial tears, if it is going up to the periphery, up to the red red area, then you must repair that. But if it is in the white white area or white red area, you can just do the meniscectomy and uh, balancing of the meniscus and you get away. Oblique tear of paradigm, again, if it is in the white white area, you must remove it, there is no need. But uh, these uh, market industry guys, they say that you repair each and every bit of the meniscus, that is not done because any uh, badly performed repair, the meniscectomy is always better than that. Bucket handle tear, in the last decade, we used to take them out, but today the bucket handle repair, it must be because it is always in the uh, red red area or a red white area it must be repaired here i am uh, going to just get, take the caveat that uh, in the bucket handle all every effort should be made to repair the meniscus but if there is a sports person he wants immediately go into the uh, sports then you can do the message but consent should be taken because uh, there is a bucket handle tears now the things are changed Disquiet meniscus is another area where you need to do the meniscectomy. The central torn portion should be removed and you need the very well balanced peripheral area of the disquiet. Meniscus is another area. You must do the partial meniscectomy, then drain the cyst and then reset the cyst from inside. If there is a big cyst, you can put from outside a small shaver and the reset the cyst. Degenerative tears are very tempting, but we there are definite indications. If there is angular deformity and joint space is more than 50% reduced, you must not embark in the meniscectomy for because it will make the meniscectomy in great disrepute. So there is not the indication of uh, this uh, meniscectomy because in those uh, those patients you need the correction of alignment and. Uh, some other procedure like microfracture technique. So degenerative tear, it should not be done alone. You have to supplement with some other surgeries like microfracture or the some osteotomies. The post op rehab in the meniscectomy, immediately you can allow as the, as soon as patient becomes painless, full range of motion, partial weight bearing is allowed. Then you remove suture in one week and the full weight bearing is allowed and then do the therapeutic exercises, strengthening exercises and sports activities after two to three weeks. There are complications as well. If you put the wrong portal, then you cannot reach to the needed area. So just put the needle, see that you are able to reach that area, then only make your portal. Sometimes they are hidden here, so try to search them out. In the tight uh, MCL, if it is hidden there, you can do the pie crusting and then open the joint. Sometimes in the search of uh, these uh, tight, uh, these uh, tears in the tight knee, you might do the condyle damage. So beware, I, I have seen one video of Dr. Joshi in which somebody has taken out 
eaten out whole of the femoral uh, one third of the femoral condyle and burn out. Uh, he was the ending in Allahabad. Somebody has taken out whole of the medial condyle. So try to avoid the condyle damage. Don't use the local instrument because if it breaks inside, then it creates problems. So have your uh, biters uh, with the good uh, good kind of instruments. Collateral injury, just uh, doing the patient is in anesthesia. If you are abducting just for the MCL, your anesthesia might break the collateral. So be aware there. And uh, sometimes in the posterior, lateral, posterior, medial approaches, you might go for the neurovas uh, neurovascular injuries. And RSG is one of the late complication in these patients. So to conclude, mastectomy is an art. And uh, we have very great artists in this house, Dr. Anand Yossi. Here you must see his uh, mastectomy video, how nicely he is just doing like painting. So it is an art more than science, very delicate procedure, save as much meniscus as possible. And uh, what you need to intend is balanced and smooth meniscus avoid condyle and collateral ligament damage. That is how the minister me is. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your patient hearing. And uh, I must submit that uh, whatever arthroscopy I have learned, I tried uh, for fellowship in my uh, 90s. There was a lot of queue in Dr. Joshi's clinic. So what I thought that uh, it should be a distant learning program. So I think I am his first disciple for the distant learning. I called him six times in Allahabad and uh, he performed many surgeries. I learned all the orthopedic sur surgery from him. I never uh, did any fellowship or anything. But uh, basics uh, I had learned from my institution, Central Institute of Orthopedics and uh, Sports Injury Center. But distant learning center, like uh, Amit has done, if you call him, he will operate, he will show, and that is how his distant learning program is uh, going all over the country. So I'm the first disciple in Allahabad, I think in UP for the distant learning program. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Now the uh, second talk, uh, Dr. Tripathi, thank you very much. Okay. Now the second talk uh, in this session, is from uh, Dr. Sundar Rajan. He is talking online and uh, his talk is on uh, making meniscal repair easy and reproducible. So uh, Dr. Sundar Raj Rajan, Dr. S.R. Sundar Rajan is working as a senior consultant in arthroscopy in Ganga Hospital. Department of Arthroscopy and Sports Medicine. He has won the best paper awards in Indian Arthroscopy Society meetings of 2008 and 2013 and consultant medals in 2013, 14 and 17 of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. He is the past president of Indian Foot and Ankle Society Indian Association of Sports Medicine and currently the Leg, Ankle and Foot Committee member of ISA KOS, General Secretary of Indian Arthroscopy Society and President of Tamil Nadu Arthroscopy Association. So I welcome Dr. S.R. Sundar Rajan and I will ask and I will ask to give his uh, talk. Uh, good morning, sir. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. You thank can you, go sir. ahead. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And I take this opportunity to thank uh, Kanpur Orthopedic Association, UP Arthroscopy Association and the Orthopedic Association. And my talk is on uh, technical pearls, making meniscus repair easy and reproducible. I don't know how to make an easy and reproducible, but I can go through some case series of techniques 
and the legal persons have to do the repair in the Uh, Sundar Rajan sir, we are not able to listen you. You you are not audible clearly. Sorry, there's, there's some technical issue happens towards the Sundar Rajan sir. He's logging again. Because of the technical problem, we are switching over to the third speaker. Let me have the privilege to invite Dr. Anand Joshi, sir, for his lecture. I must introduce him. Um, he is a senior sports medical consultant in BCCCI. He is also a past president of Indian Orthoscopy Society. He, is, he was trained at various centers in the US, Europe, Asia, and Australia. He was uh, labeled as a all-around student of GM Medical College, Mumbai. He was also elected as who is who in American universities and colleges in 1984. He was also given Lifetime Achievement Award in Indian Orthopedic Society in 2012. And uh, most aspiring cyclist at the tour of Lily Grease in 2014. He is also an ex member of the medical committee of the International Cricket Council. Bombay University badminton men's singles winners. He was winner for two consecutive years. And uh, he was also a champion in All India Intern Medical College badminton championship tournament three times in a row. He may not be remembering, I visited his center 25 years back and I was really impressed how meticulously he is doing arthroscopies. And since then I admire him and I'll request him to kindly um, start his speech. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Singh for your kind introduction. At the outset, I must thank the uh, Kanpur Orthopedic Association and the Arthroscopy Club and the UP Orthopedic Association also uh, for having me here uh, for this uh, meeting on arthroscopy. So I uh, have this uh, thing for uh, Sportsmate Mumbai. Uh, we are three partners where I do all the easy stuff and my partners do all the difficult stuff. So, I always find the easy way out. Now, there are some lesions inside the knee, intra-articular lesions, which are often not diagnosed clinically because we do not have tests for them. They go very often unreported on the MRI. And even during arthroscopy, if you are not meticulous during arthroscopy, you can miss these lesions. And these lesions are called the hidden lesions of the knee. And one such lesion, which is a hidden lesion, is called the ramp lesion. The ramp lesion is seen in the ACL deficient knee. It is a menisco capsular separation affecting the posterior one third of the medial meniscus. And basically, the area that we are talking about is one which is 
extremely important when you're treating an ACL uh, deficient knee. The terminology ramp is because it resembles a ramp of the car and therefore the terminology was from Strobel whose first description of the ramp lesion was in 1980 where he described the ramp in the acute as well as the chronic ACL deficient knee. In the acute knee, it very often seems like a hemorrhagic ramp. In, as the chronicity of the ACL tear increases because of repeated anterior translation of the tibia, we find that there are bigger and bigger rents. And as you can see on the image on the top, you can see that there's a big capsulo, uh, menisco capsular rent. And therefore, these lesions need to be addressed. This is the anatomy of the posterior one third of the medial meniscus. You can see that there uh, is a confluence of the menisco capsular and the menisco tibial ligaments, and they are bound to the posterior vascular area of the medial meniscus. Various uh, classifications have been done of this ramp lesion, depending on the morphology of the ramp. So you could have a tear only affecting the superior surface, the inferior surface, or the entire surface of the menisco capsule, uh, menisco capsular junction, or it could also be associated with a double tear, in which case you have a meniscus tear along with a ramp tear. So these are the uh, nice illustrative examples of a classification of a ramp. Now, it is believed that the ramp lesion occurs during an ACL injury because of the sudden pull of the semimembranosis, which pulls the capsule off the meniscus. And therefore, this is a lesion which is something which can lead to uh, problems if not addressed. So it has been noticed that there is an increase in the anterior tribial translation by almost 2.6 millimeters in the presence of a ramp. And also, if you do not address the ramp, it can lead to a gradual failure of the uh, uh, reconstructed anterior cruciate ligament. And therefore, it is very important that you look for and address these ramps. Now, very often people believe that you don't have to repair a ramp because it will heal on its own because it is in the vascular zone. But if you look at this video, you will find that with every flexion and extension, the capsule falls away from the meniscus and therefore, unless you repair it, it is not going to heal spontaneously. So, untreated uh, ramp lesions can lead to subtle anterior translation. It can also lead to rotatory instability of the knee and increase in the forces of the ACL, resulting in a risk of graft failure. So, Increasingly, it is being recognized as a posteromedial instability of the knee, and there are various ways in which you can repair the ramp. The incidence of ramp is quite high. In fact, we have reported a series where we have seen almost 23% ramp tears in all our ACL deficient knees. So it is not at all a small percentage, and one must look for the ramp lesion. The ramp is missed because there are no specific clinical tests. MRI is done with the knee in extension when the capsule is in approximation with the meniscus and therefore it is not picked up on the MRI unless you carefully see for it. During arthroscopy, surgeons do not routinely look at the posteromedial corner of the knee and therefore the ramp can be missed. MRI pictures, if you look at it carefully, you will find that there is some evidence of a ramp when there is bone edema on the posteromedial tibial uh, plato. You can see a fluid tracking into the cleft between the meniscus and the capsule. And on the axial film as well, if you look carefully, you, could, uh, you can find fluid tracking into the gap. During arthroscopy, one must pass the telescope between the PCL and the medial femoral condyle. Uh, only then you can uh, visualize the posteromedial area. So this is the video showing you how to uh, look for the lamp. So between the medial femoral condyle and the PCL, the scope is gently advanced. And as the scope is advanced, the knee is uh, also flexed. You must have adequate joint distension so that you can easily enter the posteromedial compartment. 
I routinely use the 2.9 millimeter scope, which is a small diameter scope. And therefore it is easier to get into these tight spaces. So uh, this is how you approach the ramp area. So these are the technical tips. Ensure that you have adequate joint distension. Advance the scope between the PCL and the medial femoral condyle. Occasionally, you may have an osteophyte which is blocking this area. So you may have to do a, a gentle notch plasty or remove the osteophyte. Smaller diameter scopes make it easier. And probing and looking for the ramp again, even if you're looking from the anteromedial portal, it may still not be easy to uh, look uh, to detect a ramp. So here is an example where when you look inside, you feel that the capsule and the meniscus are all in continuity. It is only when I pass a needle inside and tease the capsule that I realize that this is just a false kind of incomplete healing of the ramp. And if I would have left it alone, this would have separated and the patient after an ACL reconstruction may would, would have probably come back with a failed ACL. So this is one of the ways of assessing the ramp. The next method is to not only depend on the intercondylar view, but also look at the ramp from the posteromedial portal. So I'm now looking from the intercondylar view and you can see that the ramp is not visible. I then make a posteromedial portal. So the needle is coming behind the medial femoral condyle. I then push a, a put a Steinman pin there and introduce my scope inside from the posteromedial portal. And now you can see the medial femoral condyle is on top. That is the meniscus and the capsule which are separated from the meniscus. So the visualization here is not from the front of the knee, but from the back of the knee. And that is why the ramp can be missed. In our own observations, present patients who presented late had a higher incidence of complete ramp lesions and medial femoral condylar changes were higher in patients who had a long-standing ACL along with the ramp. So ramp lesions may be isolated or they may be associated with a meniscus tear and you need to address both these issues and not just address one. So there are various techniques by which you can repair a ramp. You can use the posteromedial portal, use a shoulder uh, device like a, a surgical a lasso or a spectrum, or you can do an all inside using the posteromedial portal, or you can uh, have sutures from inside out. So we have uh, different techniques for specific types of ramps, and I will quickly show you how we do that. So this is an all inside repair. So here, what I'm doing is my shaver comes from the posteromedial portal. I am freshening the edges of the meniscus as well as the capsule. I'm holding the meniscus in uh, the capsule in place with my grasper from the posteromedial portal. And then I'm passing a all inside fixator, like a, uh, any kind of device, like a fast fix. And that repairs the ramp. The other way of repairing a ramp is by again, passing your instruments from the posteromedial portal itself. So again, here I'm looking from the intercondylar view. My instrument has come from the posteromedial. I have freshened the edges. I am now using a spectrum, which is a device which is commonly used in shoulder surgery. It is uh, grabbing the capsule part of the meniscus and then a suture is passed in. Multiple such sutures can be passed and the ramp can be repaired. The problem here is that the, if the quality of the capsule is not good, you do not know how much of the capsule you have captured with the spectrum and therefore your repairs may not be that robust. So we feel that the inside out technique is much easier. It results in a potentially stronger construct and it is implant free. So the only disadvantage is that when you are doing an inside out repair, you need a posteromedial incision. So here is an example again of an inside out repair of the ramp. So I have freshened the edges. So one of the key steps whenever you are doing a meniscus repair is to make sure that the edges of the meniscus tear are adequately freshened and only then you pass these sutures. 
So the incision that you make posteromedially is just behind the MCL and the POL. So that is the uh, POL, the capsule that is held. And this is the interval between the medial MCL and the POL. And that is where you retrieve all your sutures which you have passed from inside out and you tie them out. In, and this is the view from the posteromedial portal of the uh, repaired uh, meniscus. So this is not at all complex. This is very simple. Once you start getting used to the posteromedial portal, I think things become very, very simple. So the protocol is like any meniscus repair. We don't want to uh, have any sudden shearing stress on the knee. So we keep the uh, patients on uh, crutches for a period of three to four weeks. We start knee bending only after three weeks. And then the rehabilitation is like normal, uh, any normal uh, ACL reconstruction. And pivoting and squatting should be restricted for almost six to nine months, like any meniscus repair. So the take home message is that you must look for the ramp and repair it whenever possible. And although there are failure rates, I think uh, with the inside out, with a secure fixation, I think the outcomes are probably uh, going to be better. And in summary, the ramp is a frequently uh, overlooked hidden lesion of the knee, commonly associated with the ACL injuries. Incidence may be as high as 40% in some series. And neglect may lead to continued subtle instability and ACL graft failure. And hence, an important and hidden lesion which needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. And now I request our international speaker, Dr. Amit Joshi, for his talk on Joshi on technical pulse outside in meniscal repair. Uh, thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure and matter of pride to share the podium after Ananta, sir. So what we are going to, to talk today is about outside in meniscal repair. So at the very outset, I'd like to say that I work in resource deprived environment. Uh, so whatever may be ideal, uh, may not be good for our patient. So we have to identify what is good for my patient. I work, uh, before I start, I would like to say that there are two special situations uh, when I decide that outside in technique is suited for my patient. First one is the uh, 
if meniscal repair becomes costlier than ACL, and if you if you see our patient, most of our patient, cost is major factor for differing from ACL reconstruction, then adding more cost for uh, with the meniscal repair becomes a little difficult. And on top of that, 95% of, of our patients do not have medical insurances, so they have to pay it from out of their own pocket. But their requirement, they want best possible treatment and least possible cost. Second situation is, these are some of our papers who are recently published, which says that uh, detection of meniscal tear in MRI in our context is extremely low. Unlike the European papers, the MRI detection of various types of meniscal tear is around 60% only. And this is another, our recent paper which said that probably 40% of difficult meniscus tear, small meniscus tear, they are missed in MRI. So what happens most of the time when we go into the operation theater, these are surprise lesions. So you have not counseled the patient, but at the time of surgery, you find out that there is a good meniscus which should have been repaired or who could be repaired. And if you resect the meniscus at this moment and say that I have removed your meniscus, probably it is it will be taken as a criminal offense because repair has become a fashion for everyone and everyone say that meniscus has to be repaired. So various techniques have been described, uh, uh, but these um, all inside technique uh, are very costly. Uh, most of the time, my patient, they do not afford. Inside out technique is very good technique. Uh, uh, but again, you see the it, it comes with the cost. And when you use this in all inside meniscus, there are a number of suture that is required and it, it increases the cost. And on top of that, most of the patient, they come for arthroscopic surgery and they find an incision on your medial or lateral side, they got offended. So this also had a limited use. So outside in technique, which is very cheap and probably this is what is uh, you know, tempted us to uh, improve on this outside technique and come up with our own technique. So before going to repair, I would like to um, you know emphasize on this ABC of meniscal repair because this has to be uh, achieved so that you have a successful repair of your meniscus. So you have to reduce it anatomically. There has to be biological augmentation. And one and foremost important is the circumferential compression. So your meniscus has to be compressed to the periphery so that healing takes place. So this is a paper which was published in Arthroscopic Technique by Justin Solomon, And he said, he described how this circumferential compression is required. If you use all inside or inside out, it doesn't provide a circumferential compression. That is why it requires a upper border and the lower border suture. I'll show you in this animation. If you see this animation, <clears throat> you'll see that if you use a inside out suture and tie it, then what happens while tying the inferior surface opens up. And to close this inferior surface, you have to apply suture on the inferior surface as well. Same thing applies to the all inside technique. That is why when you tie on the superior surface, you'll see that the meniscus is lifting up. When you tie on the inferior surface, the meniscus is going out. So it has to be balanced so that you can achieve a circumferential compression. So this is outside in technique, uh, which we modified a little bit and named it as a suture shuttle technique, which provides a uh, circumferential compression. In this technique, you pass your epidural needle from outside take a bite through and through from superior surface to the inferior surface and use this proline suture to shuttle the suture with which we are going to tie the uh, meniscus or suture, repair the meniscus. Then you come from the inferior surface, mentioning again that it doesn't purchase any meniscus. This is just through the capsule on the inferior surface. Then take the shuttle, the another limb of the suture and you tie it down. It will provide a circumferential compression. Once circumferential compression is provided, you need a lesser number of sutures and you can space them about five to seven uh, millimeters. So this is the paper the, uh, that we published in Arthroscopy Technique in 2020. I'm going to show you a small video clip of this technique. So this is the patient position, arthroscopic picture, which shows a bucket handle, chronic bucket handle tear. So we have reduced it. <clears throat> After reduction, a good inspection of repairability is very, very important. So what you need to do in all of cases is pie crusting. 
so that you adequately expose the joint and inspect and then decide that it is repairable or not. To get the augmentation A part of this, so you have to do a rasping, especially in the meniscotibial uh, capsule. Once you have prepared the bed, then you use an epidural needle and then pass from the posterior aspect, come from the superior surface of the meniscus, then take a bite into the uh, tone part of the meniscus. Once you have taken the bite, then you pass your proline suture, which has to be retrieved from the anteromedial portal. So this is retrieved from the anteromedial portal. Then take a 11 number knife, which is very important and make a stab incision just next to the needle. And then you widen it up so that you make a soft tissue tunnel, which travels right from the skin to the capsule so that there is no entrapment of the soft tissue. And then use that proline uh, to tie into the loop of the orthocord, num 20 or number zero orthocord and the shuttle it down. Second pass of the needle should be through the same soft tissue tunnel that has been created and you have to come into the inferior surface. So this is the inferior surface. So make sure that it doesn't take any uh, bite on the uh, meniscus. Make a virtual cannula, take both the suture from the same tunnel and then shuttle the second limb using the same proline suture. So it is a simple, so you make a loop of the suture and just tie a simple one knot through the proline and then you pull it out, it will come. So this is going inside, you give a just jerky movement and the, both the limb will come out from the same place and this is how the meniscus gets repaired. So this is, I'm showing you another suture, probably this is the third stitch right at the posterior root and then you can go ahead and repair the posterior root reason as well with the outside in technique. The technique remains the same. It's easy to come from the superior surface because your Taui epineural needle has a curvature. So you can use that curvature of the needle to pierce and negotiate into the joint. So take it out from the inferior surface, take both the suture out from the same virtual cannula system, and then you pull the second one, second limb of the suture. So it gives a circumferential compression to the meniscus. So here again, uh, probably this is the fourth coming to the anterior more easy so that I'll demonstrate how to do it. Sometime it is not able to pass. You can use a atraumatic grasper and use it so that you can pass your needle very easily. Once the needle is being passed, the remaining process is the same. So the proline is passed and it is retrieved outside. This is very important to make a soft tissue tunnel, give a stab incision with the 11 mm blade then use a small mosquito so that you make a, a soft tissue tunnel, which should traverse from the skin to the um, capsule so that there is no interposition of the soft tissue while tying the tunnel. Then you pull it out, one limb is pulled out. Another important is give the needle to your assistant so that the assistant passes that needle through the same soft tissue tunnel. See, I'm giving it to my assistant, he is passing my needle up to the capsule and from the capsule, I'm negotiating it myself. So this is the inferior surface. And then you take both of them out and then put the suture. So why it is called suture shuttle is you use a proline to shuttle the suture that is going to you know, uh, repair your meniscus. So next I would show you that how nicely a circumferential compression can be provided with outside in technique also like in uh, other technique. You can see that the sutures are coming from above and the uh, inferior of the peripheral tier of the meniscus and you, when you pull it out, pull the suture, then you will see that it is providing a good circumferential compression. The third important step is of tying the knot. You see that since the soft tissue tunnel are made for each and every sutures, it has to be tied one by one. So here you go, you start from posterior. It is not necessary always to start from posterior, but posterior uh, suture will give a good reduction to the meniscus. So you start from posterior. We make a, a SMC knot, which is a sliding self-locking knot, which is a smallest of the sliding self-locking knot. Make sure that you pull that pull so that you observe that your knot is going inside, sitting into the capsule and make it very tight. So once it is tight, you observe the tightness from the inside and then you lock the knot, 
and cut the knot inside the soft tissue tunnel. You see that my cutter is going inside so that it cuts inside. And this is the final construct about uh, seven sutures I have applied in this patient. And you can see that very nice circumferential cell compression. The same patient you see in, in a span of 15 months, you can see that the bucket handle displacement discus has been nicely healed. This is another uh, picture of the same patient. So this technique has several disadvantages as well uh, because it cannot be applied on the lateral side, especially on the posterior. We all understand that your, our neurovascular structures are a little bit lateral to the midline. So post, uh, middle meniscus can repair it all around, but for the lateral meniscus, it has to be anterior to the popliteal fossa. Uh, not going into detail of this, you can uh, go into this um, journal and find out the details of this technique. Uh, with this, I'd like to thank organizer, especially Dr. Amit for inviting me and would like to invite you in 2023, November 23, 24, 25th in Pokhara for second SAR conference. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Amit, sir. And... Uh, now there is an online session, online uh, uh, presentation from Dr. Sachin Tapaswi. So he is going to talk on uh, inside out meniscal repair and how to make technique predictable and re reproducible. Yeah. Dr. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hope you can uh, hear me well. And uh, thank you, Dr. A.K. Agarwal and all the organizers and the office bearers of the Arthroscopy Association of Uttar Pradesh for having me on board. I'm going to be speaking on how to perform a good inside out meniscus repairs. And I have no disclosures specific to this talk. So essentially, when you start doing an inside out repair, you need these tools. You need these what are called as swathe needles, and they have to be loaded on a suture which is at least 2O polyester or 2O high strength suture. What is important is that these needles need to be flexible and you need a good cannula to pass these needles through. So previously, the cannulas that we did use were the ones which had a double lumen, which was joined in the center. And what this allowed was that it allowed you to pass both the needles through the cannula and allowed the needle to slip through. This was an important sort of uh, <clears throat> component of our repair because if you had the provision for a suture to slip through without needle actually slipping through, that actually meant that you could then perform a good inside out repair. So you had a variety of these cannulas uh, in various sizes and shapes and these cannulas enabled us to perform a good inside out meniscus repair thereby allowing us to reach zones of the meniscus without causing any harm or any abnormality. These sutures, once they were passed through the cannula, were then retrieved outside the joint. And once they were retrieved outside the joint, what was then required was to go ahead and repair the meniscus by tying knots on its surface. Very frequently, when you make an inside out repair, you require a safety incision which is posteromedial or posterolateral. And this incision will protect the neurovascular structures and allow you to have a good passage of the needles without any injury to any of the important structures and thereby help you in achieving a good meniscus repair. So a safety incision with a protection like a spoon was what we always used. These cannulas, as I did mention, would be available in several sizes and several shapes. And you had double lumen cannulas, which were being used effectively and still get used most often than not. Now, these cannulas, though have they were sort of the gold standard, I have now shifted to a single cannula because this allows me to place the suture, the second suture, where I need it the most. So with this, you can have a direct trajectory. And with this, you are able to repair the so-called mid-third zone of the meniscus very effectively. 
what we have now is that we have now better reach of these inside out cannulas and now we are able to repair a larger zone of the meniscus with these inside out cannulas largely because we have what are called as zone specific cannulas these zone specific cannulas are curved and bent both in their sagittal and coronal plane so as you can see they have a curve along the main shaft and they also have an additional double s curve uh, in the other plane which allows us to negotiate the femoral condyle and reach tight corners of the knee very effectively so with this particular device we are now able to reach the anterior mid as well as posterior third area of the meniscus the yellow arrow which i have drawn is the arrow which i was able to perform with my straight cannula and now with the help of these zone specific cannulas i am able to reach far more posteriorly the safety incision is important and one should understand and learn how to make these safety incisions these safety incisions will allow you to pass sutures as far posterior as you may require which then helps you achieve a good repair so these incisions on the medial and on the lateral side are made in the posterior medial and the posterior lateral recess so on the medial side you make a vertical incision uh, retract the pes and the semi membranosus posteriorly and then you also retract the medial head of the gastroc to reach the recess between the capsule and the gastrocnemius same is on the lateral side but on the lateral side you will make a longitudinal incision instead of a vertical incision so that's an example of how to make an incision on the lateral side you've made the skin incision then you're going to split the uh, biceps femoris in line with its fibers you will retract the biceps femoris posteriorly and then once you retract the biceps femoris posteriorly or if you uh, pull it up uh, superiorly you will then be able to access the zone which is behind the knee retract the lateral head of the gastrocnemius away and then you can put a simple spoon in this particular recess which will then allow you to uh, which will then allows the passage of needles very effectively and then you can tie down the sutures on the capsule itself so here's an example of uh, this girl who has a large bucket handle medial meniscus tear um for the first step is to reduce the tear and once you've reduced the tear then you go ahead and start repairing the meniscus so the first thing that one would do in this instance of course is to augment the meniscus by causing and making some form of mechanical abrasion and uh, it's always very useful to use augmentation techniques whenever you are performing any meniscus repair so now we come in with a straight cannula needle this is my first suture which is always a reduction suture much like when you uh, you know you're doing a fracture fixation you want to temporarily reduce the fracture and hold it with the help of a couple of k wires similarly this is your first suture which is your reduction suture and by performing this reduction suture you will now hold the meniscus in place you can see and observe in the top left corner of your screen that uh, we have two people i am holding the arthroscope i'm holding the cannula and then i have an associate to my right who passes the needles and another associate to my left who retrieves the needles and then ties them off so it's important you should make vertical mattress sutures much like what dr amit joshi did show in his previous talk wherein he stressed the importance of making good vertical mattress sutures because the fibers of the meniscus are circumferential so you start off in the center and then you can proceed both anterior and posterior and the minimum distance for applying these sutures should be at least about 3 mm between both of them so though we still don't have the correct answer as to what should be the exact distance between these two sutures but about 3 to 4 mm is what we require i first place all the inside out sutures on the top surface of the meniscus this will enable the meniscus to flip up and once it flips up you have the under surface of the meniscus which is exposed and now using the same cannula you can pass sutures on the under surface of the meniscus thereby ensuring that you have a good circumferential repair both on the top side and on the bottom side which allows you to have a good compression of the repair 
and thereby prevents any form of um, uh, you know allows you to have a good meniscus healing so biology and mechanics both are extremely important and at the end of your procedure when you are satisfied with the number of sutures and the type of the repair all that you need to do then is to go ahead and tie knots on the external surface of uh, the meniscus so this is how you would perform an inside out meniscus repair how do they compare i mean uh, the ashish bedi published almost about a decade ago looking at inside out and all inside repair comparable results between both of them less amount of uh, breakage of implants but definitely a higher incidence of nerve irritation if you are not careful with the knots again the uh, bernard bach he, uh, his center published a uh, updated systematic review and again no differences between the inside out and the all inside with comparable uh, results between failure rates lisham scores outcomes and complication rate the aaron critches group from mayo they also looked at the outcomes of all inside versus inside out especially looking at bucket handle medial meniscus tears and they were also able to demonstrate a uh, uh, no difference in the results between the inside out and the all inside another meta analysis which looked at the inside out versus all inside they actually favored the inside out repair with respect to failure rates but with the all inside you had lesser complication rate because of less amount of nerve irritation so the inside out suture technique is a safe effective and reproducible technique it is cheaper than the all inside the results and outcomes are comparable and with the help of zone specific cannulas you are able to reach further zones of or further areas of the meniscus than what you could reach previously as the president of the indian arthroscopy society i would like to make a plea to all of you uh, uh, in kanpur to please join our association and please attend in large numbers our marquee event which is the iscon 2022 we've been waiting at waiting for it for quite a while now we have a variety of uh, academic treats in line for you including master classes a lot of awards which consist of cadaveric uh, sessions not only in india but overseas as well a lot of live surgical workshops and we have excellent national and international sub sub specialty faculty all for you so please do register today and help us make this event a big success and thank you so much one more time and uh, uh, thank you dr sachin tapasvi ji and now i will ask uh, if you have any doubts and any question to dr sachin Sachin sir, uh, this yes. uh, is here. Doctor Sachin, yes sir. So uh, there is a question. Do you yes. do uh, pie cresting in all the cases of uh, attempting meniscal repair? Yeah. Thank you for that question. I think um, you know when we want to make meniscus repair easy and reproducible, Doctor Sudarajan will stress upon that how to have good exposure, but yeah. you require very good exposure of the meniscus on the medial and on the lateral side. on the medial side pie crusting of the mcl is a technique that i will practice almost frequent almost in all cases of doing a medial meniscus repair it helps me avoid inadvertent damage to the cartilage and allows me to perform a good repair so yes i would perform a medial pie crusting on the medial side whenever we are doing a repair on the medial side almost in 98% of all patients uh, sachin sir i have a question yes sir on the posterior medial side uh, when placing the spoon between uh, the uh, capsule the uh, uh, medial gastrocnemius and inferiorly the semi membranosus is there sometimes when passing the inferior sutures inferior surface sutures the needle uh, sometimes misses the spoon and comes below that so uh, there is a, there was a paper recently in i think in ajsm which suggested that uh, the spoon should be placed inferior to the semi membranosus rather than superior so what is your take on that so if you look at the incision uh, and if uh, if you look at the incision where you make this uh, meniscus where you make this uh, particular injury uh, sorry where you make this incision then the incision essentially is about 
if this is a joint line then one third of the incision is proximal to the joint line two third of the incision is distal to the joint line and your spoon essentially is more posterior and inferior or distal rather than at the level of the joint line because as you are coming in with your needles these needles are going to the trajectory is going to be more distally directed than proximally or at the same level of the joint line since your portal is at a higher level and the meniscus is at a lower level so your point is absolutely correct that your the incision should be extending more distal to the joint line because the sutures will exit from uh, from the proximal to the distal area from uh, depending upon the trajectory that you choose thank you sir thank you thank you dr sachin and uh, for your very good uh, illustration of it, the technique of uh, inside out and uh, next uh, lecture will be from dr dr s r sundar rajan this is also a online uh, presentation hello still shows a disabled participant screen carry can you make me can you allow me to share the screen yes you are audible sir thank you sir uh, sorry for the glitch before i'm waiting for the host to allow me to share the screen it shows host disabled participant screen sharing can you allow me to can you make me a co host so that i can share the screen by that time uh, may I, may i have some questions from the faculty please start the question answer session by the time so we can have questions for dr kd tripathi and dr anand joshi who are here and dr amit joshi so if there are some questions we we'll utilize the time so that this is the question answer session for dr k d tripathi dr anant joshi and dr amit joshi please come to the pod mic and my question to joshi sir as uh, suture technique has been describe all inside outside and the circumference what the consensus says the exact uh, technique i think uh, basically the all inside uh, fixation of the meniscus is something which we need to use especially when you are dealing with the posterior horn tears and uh, although they are expensive Uh, one has very little option, especially when dealing with the posterior or the lateral meniscus. Whereas when it comes to the anterior and the mid third of the meniscus, I think the options of outside in, like Amit has suggested, or inside out, as Sachin has uh, shown, 
is much more economical from the point of view of the patient. And it is, I think, much more reliable because if you see the uh, perforation made by an all inside device versus the perforation made by a needle in the meniscus, when you are using either the all inside out or the outside in, is much smaller. So I feel that the damage to the meniscus caused by the needle is much less than a fixator. Okay. And uh, cost-wise, of course, we know that uh, effectively you can put probably tens uh, inside out or outside in for the cost of one uh, all inside fixator. Is there any protocol, uh, post-operative protocol of differences in the I don't think the, no, because you cannot uh, circumvent the biological healing process whether you use either of the techniques. It's a three week or it is a six week immobilization. I like to go by the uh, extent of the tear. So if it's a large bucket handle tear of the meniscus which I have repaired, then I like to immobilize the patient a little bit longer uh, than a shorter uh, period of uh, mobilize, immobilization. Uh, because I think the as we all know, the biology of healing of the meniscus is very slow. And therefore, although you have used all kinds, you have done abrasion, you have done uh, uh, all kinds of uh, things like a clot, I think you still have to give time for the meniscus to heal. When to repair the meniscus, the timing of injury is important, I think. So it, uh, it is a six week, after six weeks, it is necessary or it's, it should be say, Dr. Kedi. This is the last question. Our online speaker is there and then we might miss it. We will take questions for Dr. K.D. Tripathi later on. Sir, uh, I request Dr. Sundarajan to continue. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Thank okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so how to get a successful repair in meniscus? Um, I think this is a very important. This is choosing the right patient for a meniscus repair is very, very important. So the indications for a meniscus repair uh, are the most, uh, one of the most important criteria. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Please go we ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead, sir. Hello? Sir, we, you are audible, sir. We, are, we can hear you. Please uh, proceed with your talk. Can you hear me? Dr. Sundar oh, Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but... Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello. Sir, you are very audible and clear. Your picture, your image, you are very audible and clear. Hello. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. So the uh, the to get a successful outcome is to have a proper indications, and the authority of implants and the instruments are the key to get successful uh, uh, repair. So you should have the all the armamentarium before you take up any ACL cases because many isolated meniscus repair cases are very rare, always and isolated with the cruciate injuries. So you should be ready with any armamentarium of the meniscus repair system is the key to get the successful outcome. Of course, you have to learn all the technique to do the repair, uh, like inside out or outside in or the all inside repair. And also you should know all the knotting which we do it in the shoulder, because that is also very key in many kinds of meniscus repairs. At the same time, you should understand that 
not all tears are symptomatic and require treatment. So with the advancement of MRI, the meniscus tears are becoming easier to identify. But we have to understand that the patients aged around 80 to 39 years, the prevalence of asymptomatic meniscal tear were around 5.6%. Especially in the elderly population, the age between 50 to 90, the prevalence of meniscal tear is 31%. So the most important aspect is that clinical radiological correlation is very, very, is the key to get to do uh, any meniscus repair. In, turn, in cases of acute ones, I think the most often associated with the ligament tears, which cruciates, which already discussed about it. It is important to, to assess the young patients and the activity level of these patients are very, very important to, uh, to uh, decide about the meniscus repair. Of course, acute and chronic give you a clue and also the zone of the tear, whether it's the red, red zone or red, white zone, they are amenable to do a repair and what kind of type of tear. So not a single factor is an uh, absolute indication for a surgery meniscus repair. So you have to calculate all these four factors before you decide and do the meniscus repair. Especially when you come to the bucket handle tear, especially in a chronic situation, as uh, already it, uh, shown that the quality of the meniscus is very, very important. So if it, even the patient comes after six months or sometimes eight months, Sometimes the quality of the meniscus is good. If it is in a repairable zones, then it should be repaired. And also the radial tear, you can have an asymptomatic tear, you can have a symptomatic tear. So you have to decide whether it is a degenerative incomplete tear or it is a complete tear. So in, incomplete tear doesn't require a surgery, but complete radial tear requires surgery. At the same time, when you come to see the root tear, it's a double-edged sweat. So you should not think that all the root tears should be repaired because you see the root tears in all the osteoarthritic patients. So it doesn't mean that they all need a repair. So you have to see the proper indications like a grade two osteo up to grade two or maximum grade three with a good cartilage with the root tear. Previously asymptomatic patients are amenable to do a root repair. At the same time in horizontal tear, there are mostly degenerative horizontal tears so you can treat conservatively, but sometimes you can have a horizontal tear along with the cyst in a younger patients, or sometimes even with the older patient with the good cartilage condition, sometimes you may need to do a meniscectomy or also do a repair. I will come with some series of cases which we can have a good indications and when to do a meniscus repair. The most important is that as already shown by uh, uh, the question answer and such an answer that the pie casting is one of the important technique where you take a 16 dodge needle, you can use in the tibial side or the femoral side, you can see the tight posteromedial compartment, carefully watch it, how does it open by just inserting a needle and uh, breaking the uh, MCL, superficial MCL opens up the joint space. See, this is one of the key factors. So previously we were afraid of doing that, but now we know that by doing this, you are not damaging the cartilage and you, it allows you to do the uh, meniscus repair uh, with, the, with the ease. When you come to, come to the cases, this is a, one of the uh, case where the patient presented with the pain and instability of the knee for seven years. That means he has got an ACL tear for a seven years duration, but he had a recent fall four months before and presented with again pain. If you see carefully these patients, we should not think that these patients have a meniscus tear but even though the ACL was seven years old, they can have a fresh menstrual tear. So anybody presents with you with the younger patients with the menstrual tear, even though there is a old history of ACL injury, they can have a fresh MCL tear, sorry, a meniscus tear. So it is important that you should preserve this, uh, uh, this meniscus and you should be ready to uh, do the repair. So we should not think that because it's seven years old, we do a meniscectomy because this is a, almost in the red red zone. So this needs a, a repair. The technique wise, as already it is shown by uh, Dr. Sachin with the, how to do an inside out repair, like, like you can alternate both vertical and horizontal inside out stitches. So make it more robust repair. Once you've done the superior surface medical and uh, mattress and vertical stitches, you make an another stitches on the inferior surface. So it is very important that you balance the meniscus on both superior and inferior surface. And uh, finally, it is complemented with your all inside stitches for the posterior round where you are not able to do that inside out stitch. That is very, very important. So the all inside stitch, how does it work? I think most of you know. So these are all commercially available implants, even though it is costlier, sometimes we may need to use in the junction, at least in the posterior and posteromedial junction, because we cannot use that inside out or outside in technique. So the inside out is works by, uh, uh, by getting the uh, implant that is the peak implant goes to the out of the capsule and flipped over there. 
and by just pulling the knots it gets tightened down so this is a very easy and reproducible technique which is available with uh, all the companies uh, but it, it may require in a few situations like this so to get a successful repair you may need to all those things you should add a mattress and vertical stitches you had to go to the both superior and inferior surface of the meniscus at the same time you had to include the all inside to get a comprehensive repair to get the stability so suspect new meniscal injuries even in the old acl tears it's very very important there's another patient of uh, 29 years old male patient pain and giving way sensation for a three months duration this patient is presented with a sudden popping sound uh, that is the x-ray is normal you can see the double pcl sign that is the in, that shows that this patient has got a bucket handle tear so you can see when you see these patients after three months or six months you can see that by that by the time the the dis, uh, displaced meniscus the locked meniscus already uh, um, is uh, joined with the remnant fibers of your acl so so you had to release that uh, remnant fibers we may think that it's a very chronic because it's a dislocated a long time and it is locked and uh, fused with the uh, remnant fibers but by carefully by doing a, a pie crusting you can reduce the meniscus inside you may think that it's very tough but we do a pie crusting you get an enough space over there then you reduce the meniscus once you've done the meniscus then reassess it so you can see the considering age is only 26 years old it's not a very uh, chronic but see the quality of the meniscus is still very good so in these cases you should try to preserve the meniscus even though it is a three months or a six months old you have to do the uh, repair so you can see that as already it was shown in the previous uh, uh, talk that you do the inside out uh, uh, two or three inside out uh, stitches to stabilize it and uh, we can do a posterior medial incision or the posterior little safety incision and if you are careful enough sometimes you can come with the small uh, incisions like this and do a repair of course it should be complemented with your outside in technique so any bucket handle repair you required to learn the technique of outside in technique because in the anterior horn it is uh, difficult to achieve by inside out even though there are now few companies have come with the curved uh, cannulas for even for anterior horn of the meniscus so still to learn that outside in technique is very very important to uh, learn a, uh, to do any successful bucket handle repair so and uh, you can see that, that is the repair still but uh, the posterior horn still it's open here you cannot do an inside out or outside in technique so here you may need to do a one superior and one inferior um, all inside uh, suture device. So it's very, very, very important to stabilize that posterior horn to get the overall stability. So that once the, that is the complete repair of the meniscus, you can see that we thought it cannot be repaired, but you see that at the end of the procedure, that is a complete repair. We can add a micro fracture. You can add a fibrin glue, PRP and bone marrow aspiration. Uh, that that may help add a biology for this uh, meniscus to heal very well especially when they have an uh, isolated meniscal tear they are very it is very important to add this biology that that is the final outcome of this uh, meniscus repair you can see that near uh, normal look of that uh, meniscus repair with all these techniques this is a 37 years old female patient presented with the uh, instability of the right knee three weeks old twisting injury and you can see the meniscus lateral meniscal tear in the uh, sagittal view so this is the common scenario which you see whenever they have an ACL tear. The lateral meniscus tear is the most commonly associated with an ACL tear. When you see this kind of complex tear, you see that's completely separated from your posterior horn. The body is completely separated. What you are seeing in the behind is the popliteus. You may think that <coughs> we, should, we cannot do anything over there, but there are techniques which we can do now. We can do a side-to-side -side repair. You can see that here the viewing portal is an anteromedial portal. I'm working on anterolateral portal, take bites on the uh, posterior uh, uh, at the level of the root to take a bite. Then again, you shift the you shift your scope to the anterolateral portal and work on the anteromedial portal to take a bites on the body of the meniscus. Then you do the side-to-side -side stitches it will approximate the lateral meniscus is, has got a very high potential for healing so it is important that you preserve the meniscus to make uh, two or three side to side stitches it can be complemented with the, even with the all inside technique also so you can see this is after two or three stitches you can trim that inner edge which is a, a, a white white zone so after making a two or three uh, side to side stitches you trim that inner edge then make it that uh, remaining meniscus is stable 
so it's important that uh, you should know that side side stitches you should have the armatorium of this kind of instruments and the knotting technique for this this is a 38 years old female pain presented with uh, uh, six months duration right knee slip and fall six months before that is that x-ray you can see that the mri shows the complex tear when you see these kind of patients even though they young the cartilage looks very good they are not arthritic patients even though 36 years old so we know that the complex portion of the flap tear is the symptomatic one so this patient again the pie crusting helps you to open the joint bit the remove that meniscus portion which is flat which is flipped and locked in the posterior medial junction once you've done that partial meniscectomy it is not get over along with that yes you see there is a big horizontal tear of the whole body which is extending almost to the uh, uh, body body of the meniscus here you may end up in extending the uh, sorry accessing the flap in, in the normal situations but if because they are very very unstable but when, with the help of the new instruments you will be able to restore that normal anatomy of the meniscus to making a multiple stitches you can do in both way you can take it this kind of uh, knee scorpion instruments take bites from the superior and the inferior surface and making a knot like this or you can make a use an inside out technique which Sachin showed beautifully you can take it both superior and inferior surface you can stitch it outside if you don't want the knot inside so this is how you make the uh, knotting technique uh, for this kind of horizontal tear with the multiple stitches you can see that there are three or four stitches which will help you to help that both superior and inferior play flaps to come into the place this can be added with because the posterior horn was very unstable it was stabilized with again with an uh, all inside a device so that that helps to stabilize with the posterior capsule for the meniscus more stable uh, uh, along with your uh, multiple stitches we can see that at the end of the uh, procedure you can see that it is completely stable near normal looking meniscus so here we are we are done the meniscectomy at the same time meniscus repair so it is not the question that whether do a repair or a meniscus sometimes you may need to combine both meniscectomy partial meniscectomy and also do the meniscus repair this is the last case is a 44 years old male patient presented with the pain and uh, following twisting of the right knee this is just a one week duration the same you can see that meniscus tear which already showed one more case before just i want to show again the complete radial tear why it is very important to stitch it back you can see a gap over there normally when you think that the gap we cannot do a repair just making a simple side to side stitches like which i showed in the previous video that uh, by knotting technique this can be uh, nicely approximated and it can get the anatomy back by adding an uh, inside out or all inside uh, uh, suture devices so you can see the completely stable meniscus to conclude you know that meniscus repair has got a lot of techniques a lot of learning curve but it is worth is it very expensive it was expensive before but now with the new instruments with the new canvas you are uh, you are uh, your uh, indications to all inside is very very few because in the posterior one alone but in the remaining space you can uh, manage with the uh, cheap uh, fiber wires with uh, 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 with the can loss so but saving the meniscus and knee is most important than this cost thank you very much with this permission of chair i also with uh, uh, as Sachin showed that i welcome you all to the coimbra tour where iscon 2022 happening in september 15 to 16 17 we have a 16 international faculty we have array of life surgeries of 25 plus life surgeries and we have a master classes especially uh, specifically for the beginners and uh, symposiums and panel discussions uh, thank you very much uh, thank you dr sundarajan if any no, questions any, i will take up thank you very questions? much any questions from the audience sundar so, the master class is for dancing or for uh, arthroscopic surgery Dr. Anand Joshi is asking something. Dr. Sundar, can you hear us? No, he can't. He is not. <laughs> okay, so, so, so my, my humble request to all the delegates so, please be seated. So please do not visit any pharma stall during thank this you, session. Dr. Sundar. There's a lot of nuisance from the uh, behind, a lot of noise is from the behind. It's my humble request to all the delegates please be seated. Do not visit any pharma stall during the session. And I request to the, all the pharma stall guys, please make silence.
प्लीज दिस लॉट ऑफ नॉइज फ्रॉम बिहाइंड Dr. Sundarajan. Yes, sir. Thank you so very much uh, for a wonderful talk. There is a question, Dr. Anand Joshi is wanting to. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, he he will call you later. He says. Now we yes, move on to the next lecture by Dr. Anand Joshi. It is on evolving concepts why and how not to miss meniscal root tear, which is very important. Sachin, uh, again, <laughs> oh, uh, okay. I will talk to him later. <laughs> every every few years, uh, a procedure caught, uh, catches the fancy of uh, orthopedic surgeons, and one such uh, procedure which has suddenly caught the fancy is meniscus root repair, and uh, I'll quickly go through the logic behind. Uh, repairing the root so you if you go on view medi or on pubmed you will find a number of articles saying that if you see a root tear fix it it is the new silent epidemic of the knee some people feel that the root is the root cause of all osteoarthritis and some people even go to the extent of believing that if you repair the root you may not require a tkr so let me give you my take on this root repairs so this is the pubmed search and you will realize that the amount of papers on root have suddenly gone up exponentially from 2010 till 2019 so what is this root we are talking about we all know that both the menisci are firmly anchored to the tibia by the anterior and posterior roots the anterior roots are very strong and even during the normal kinematics of the knee they are not under too much of stress and therefore we do not see commonly anterior horn root tears what we commonly see in practice is lesions of the posterior horn of the root both on the lateral side as well as the medial side the definition of a root tear is not just an avulsion of the root of the meniscus but also extended to a radial tear which is within a centimeter of the root the incidence of these root tears are believed to be anywhere between 10 to 21% of all meniscal lesions now why this sudden interest in the root a biomechanical study done on nine cadavers out of which six cadavers only were appropriate three were gone the study showed that if there is a root tear there is loss of hoop stresses the meniscus starts extruding out in uh, leading to increase loading on the uh, of the articular cartilage and leading to progression of arthritis and this is one seminal paper which is quoted in all papers as the reason why every root should be treated the other paper which basically enforced this impression was this paper which said that if you repair the root it restores the joint mechanics and therefore in effect it can restore the knee to its normal function now the etiology of posterior horn root repairs is extremely distinct there is a traumatic episode which can lead to a root tear and we know that traumatic lesions of the menisci should be addressed but a more common and debatable or controversial one is the relatively atraumatic root tear that we commonly deal with so the traumatic version is seen with an acl deficient knee it is commonly seen on the lateral meniscus but you can also see it on the medial side the relatively atraumatic which is seen in the 50 plus age group 
is more common on the medial side than the lateral side. And this is the one which is the debatable and the controversial one. So very often we had these 50 year old females commonly coming to us with a sudden pop in the knee while not doing any really exertion, but just walking on the street. And that causes some kind of a catching or locking of the knee. And in uh, years before we even understood about the root, we used to diagnose these as exacerbation of osteoarthritis, treat them with rest and NSAIDs, and most of them used to be better. But now when people come to us with a pop and a click, we immediately go for an MRI to see that there is a root tear of the meniscus. So the diagnosis of this root tear can be on clinical, a high degree of clinical suspicion. So if you have a middle-aged lady coming to you with a pop in the knee and the symptoms are very vague, the pain may not be necessarily on the medial side of the knee. Very often it is posterior and posterolateral. So they are not able to pinpoint the area from where the pain is coming. On the MRI, if you have a trained musculoskeletal radiologist, but unfortunately most of them are not even trained in reading the MRI, you will find that there is a ghost sign, which means you don't see the root on the sagittal section. There is a cleft in the meniscus on the coronal section. So as you can see, the meniscus on the lateral side is coming right up to the center, but on the medial side, you see a vertical cleft. You also see the cleft in the axial plane, and this shows you the root tear. And on the coronal side, what is very important when you're dealing with a root tear is the degree of extrusion of the meniscus. So as soon as you get a root tear, the meniscus starts being pushed out of the joint. And if so, the as if the extrusion is more than three millimeters, then it is a significant amount of extrusion. You also see some amount of bone contusion, which may be associated with a uh, root tear. So this is the amount of extrusion more than three millimeters is something which is uh, needs to be looked at. Lateral meniscus root tears are commonly diagnosed during arthroscopic evaluation of an ACL deficient knee. They are frequently missed on the MRI and go unreported. There are various classifications of these root tears uh, depending on the MRI as well as arthroscopy. But the most common classification is based on tear morphology, which tells you that a type one is when there is a partial root tear, when the root is in C2 and you may not have to really repair it. The commonest one is the type two, where there's a complete radial tear in the root. The type three is a root tear with a bucket handle tear. The type four is an oblique tear into the root attachment and type five, which is commonly seen in the adolescent population is a bony avulsion of the root. So indications for repair are always when you are dealing with a traumatic meniscal root tear, which is commonly seen in the young patient who does not have significant osteoarthritis. In degenerative knees, the indications are still evolving. But the definitive contraindications for a root repair are when there is a complete subchondral collapse, if there is severe joint space narrowing, and if the patient has a significant virus, and when you observe that when they are walking, there is a severe lateral thrust of the TB on the femur. The dilemma in treating the medial meniscus root tear, posterior horn root tear, is that all these patients will have varying degrees of chondral changes. So if the outer bridge classification has grade three or four, then there is a definitive contraindication. There are also associated problems like uh, bone edema. Many of them have insufficiency fractures. So you see almost like a stress fracture on in the tibia and you can see extensive bone edema like a song. Now, some authors have uh, said that this song and the root are related. But for me, the song is a completely different entity than the root. When patients have what is called spontaneous osteonecrosis, 
these patients come to you not with pain in the knee but they come to you with restlessness they cannot sleep at night there is a throbbing pain in the knee almost as if it is an abscess and therefore this is a completely different uh, entity that you are dealing it i think it is more vascular in origin and it is unrelated to the root so various repair techniques have now been described for repair of the root the commonest one is taking a suture in the root delivering it through the trans tibial tunnel and then tying these sutures over the tibia the second is for an in situ tear where the tear has occurred but the uh, root has not really got displaced you can use an all inside fixator and you can also use a instrument from the posteromedial portal and use it using an uh, fix it using an anchor so we prefer the uh, a technique where we take sutures in the root and deliver it through the uh, trans tibial tunnel and this is these are our steps when we repair the root one is approaching the repair area second is checking the tissue quality and the extent of reduction of the root drilling the tunnel at the anatomic location using an appropriate jig suture passage and retrieval of the sutures so let me quickly go through these steps so we have already seen about medial pie crusting which has been adv advocated for easier access to the root uh, and we take a spinal needle and make multiple perforations in the medial collateral ligament or slightly below it, uh, the joint line and then the joint opens up so that you can approach the root area better so these are some of the steps in the repair you try to mobilize the root make sure that it is mobile because any repair that you do under tension it is not going to function the next step is to decorticate the area where you are going to repair the root the third thing is to pass a k wire and you can pass one or two k wires depending on whether you are going to use a single or a double tunnel then pass the sutures and then tie them on the tibia so these are the steps that we do in the repair there are various suture passing devices one such device is the scorpion uh which allows you to pass the suture in the uh, uh, meniscus and retrieve it at the same time so this is a me medial meniscus root tear you can see that the patient does not have any extensive degeneration on the medial femoral condyle and therefore this is an ideal case i like to pass a needle or a steinman pin to make sure that i have easy access to the posterior medial area and i am my instrumentation is not going to damage the articular cartilage when the instrument is going in i next pass my uh, jig which is uh, this is a uh, industry made jig through the anteromedial portal we pass a k wire and this k wire for me was not appropriately placed placed so we kept the same k wire in place we repositioned the jig and we uh, drilled again with a k wire which was now at an acceptable location so you want this k wire to exit out at the so called anatomic uh, attachment site of the root once that has been done we pass a suture through the uh, meniscal root retrieve it tie a cinch knot a shuttle relay is then passed through the 4.5 cannulated drill which is over the k wire the shuttle is then uh, the suture is then relayed with the shuttle relay one must make sure that you don't do not have any soft tissue entrapment when you are passing the sutures and you can have one two or even three sutures depending on the quality of the uh, root you can have multiple sutures and the uh, it is then tied on the tibia over a uh, endo button if you are doing a root tear with the acl you need to be careful so that the tunnels do not uh, collide or there is no coalition of tunnels and fixation is usually done at 30 degrees now like i said if you have a root which is not displaced like in this case you have a medial meniscus root which is in almost in c2 you can use a device like a pass fix to repair the root
so this is the final picture of a repaired route in in an with an all inside fixator the lateral meniscus roots which are commonly seen with the acl can similarly be repaired you can uh, use a suture passing device and the similar steps are repeated uh, now we do not need to really uh, use the ethylon and replace it with suture tape because now there is what is known as a mini suture tape which can be directly passed and you don't you can avoid one or two steps of this procedure so since we have already seen uh, on the medial side i won't repeat it so for uh, paucity of time on the lateral side you can also use the all inside fixators similar to what you saw on the medial side the thing whenever you are doing meniscus repairs is to make sure that you have the right angle of approach and whenever you are going to pass your instruments you want to make sure that you not you do not damage the articular cartilage because of your instrumentation because whenever you do meniscus repairs or a root repair the main idea is chondro protection so if you destroy the articular cartilage during your procedure the entire purpose of the procedure is lost and therefore you will see in this case this is a bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus type 3 uh, according to laprad of a root with a bucket and here we have uh, we could not approach uh, this area from the uh, regular anteromedial uh, portal so i shifted my scope to the anteromedial portal brought in my instruments from the anterolateral portal so that there was no damage to the articular cartilage and i have i had proper access to the area and here we have repaired the bucket handle of the lateral meniscus and we have passed one more suture in the root here you have to be careful you must have uh, you should not keep the length of the needle too long because of the proximity of the neurovascular structures and this is the uh, second suture for the root of the posterior horn so this is how you the final appearance of a repair uh, of the root now post op protocol is almost like any other meniscus repair you don't want knee flexion uh, at least for 3 to 4 weeks now very often you find that you have promised somebody that i'll repair your root but when you go inside you find that the quality of the root is not great so in this case you find that as soon as you grab the root and you start pulling it it just comes out and therefore you have to be uh, i always tell my patients that i will look inside your knee i will check the quality and the mobility of your root and only when i am satisfied will i go ahead with the root repair because an mri cannot tell you the quality of the tissue that we are going to repair so it is mechanics versus biology so if your root is completely extruded and degenerated and if you are trying to uh, bring it back with a uh, single stitch or multiple stitches it's not going to work in the long run the meniscus is going to continue to extrude and various studies have shown that despite doing a root repair meniscus extrusion and progression of arthritis has not really stopped after a root repair so one must be extremely selective in selecting these patients of root repair it is not something that is going to definitely prevent osteoarthritis this is a 62 year old female who went to a surgeon who did a, an excellent root repair she had persistent symptoms she was then uh, given an injection of a steroid and finally uh, a visco supplementation like a synvis then she was told to undergo stem cell therapy because her knee pain was not going away when she came to us and uh, we asked her for uh, x rays and she said my x rays were never done and this is what her x ray showed so she was a candidate for either a itbl osteotomy or a, maybe a uni but she underwent a root repair because the arthroscopic surgeon had just attended a course on root repairs of the meniscus so our approach is basically to look at the patient analyze the symptoms of the patient find out if the root is severely extruded so the varus with a thrust is something that we are very careful about if the patient is walking with a varus that is not important but if there is a significant lateral thrust i think the root cannot really 
uh, prevent the uh, from being extruded when patients have a lateral thrust so our approach is always to first take x rays find out the extent of joint space and also in all cases of a root repair do a scanogram to find out the extent of the varus and the uh, alignment issues because there are quite a few studies from korea which show that if you have a significant varus and a root tear if you do a proper high tibial osteotomy the root repairs by itself so you can see in this patient before and after hto which has been uh, compared so are we pushing this repair of the root too far some surgeons are saying that we should release the capsule that means in effect create a ramp to mobilize the root so you create one pathology to create uh, repair another pathology which i think is not logical some patients say that if you cannot prevent meniscus extrusion then you drill a tunnel in the tibia and anchor the meniscus down to the tibia through a tunnel now this also is completely illogical because the meniscus is supposed to be a mobile structure it is supposed to move during flexion and extension of the knee so if your meniscus is tethered down it's definitely not going to work and some have gone to the extent of taking the gracilis and reconstructing a degenerative root in fact we have got such fascination for the root that here is a surgeon who has drawn this algorithm for a patient he says that if you if i don't do any surgery and i give you pain medication and brace and an injection your tkr will be postponed by 5 to 10 years but if i repair your root you will be pain free and your tkr will be postponed by 20 years so i don't know whether we are surgeons or astrologers so in summary i think root repairs work well in selected patients however anatomical repair of degenerated tissue should be taken with a pinch of salt and alignment i think is should be given top priority when you are tre uh, treating the medial meniscus posterior on the root thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Anand Joshi. Uh, we are running late, so the question answers could be taken later on. Now, the organizers have some announcement to uh, make. Sorry, what's uh, up? UPA Thatter GV five three two four. UPA Thatter GV five three two four. Gadi, sir, what difficulty is there? And DQ four five four three जिनकी भी गाड़ी हो please security carry वहाँ से हटा लीजिए four five four three GQ so uh, with this we have come to the end of uh, the session on meniscus so uh, I would just summarize the session uh, Dr K D Tripathi sir discussed about the meniscectomy and he told us that meniscectomy partial meniscectomy is going to stay uh, we fully agree with that because uh, in uh, in the complex tears and in failed cases of meniscus repair we will have to uh, do partial meniscectomy then uh, uh, dr sachin tapasvi illustrated on inside out repair technique which is uh, considered the gold standard meniscal repair technique dr uh, sundar rajan spoke about the combination of techniques including inside out all inside techniques and even uh, outside in technique and uh, dr amit joshi spoke about his innovative outside in technique for the bucket handle tear of medial meniscus and uh, it was uh, it's it's really a very cost effective technique and uh, we thank him for this presentation uh so we are coming to the end of this session so i will call upon dr vishal agarwal to uh, proceed further sir uh, before that i would like to call dr pankaj tandon sir to felicitate our chairperson to felicitate dr sanjay rastogi sir dr pankaj tandon sir okay he is not there so i'll call dr vs sharma sir vs sharma sir please come on the dais and felicitate Dr. Sanjay Rastogi, sir. Uh, 
I'll call Dr. Sant Santosh Rajpal, sir, sir. Please come on the dais and felicitate Dr. Rajiv Agrawal, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now we will start the second session. I will call Dr. Vishal Agrawal, sir, to uh, start the proceeding. Uh, now to start the proceedings of the second session, I call upon the stage as chairperson, Dr. G.K. Sengar, sir. Sir, please share the session. Dr. A.K. Agrawal, sir. Please share the session. Dr. Govind Sethi, sir. Now the stage is all yours, sir, for the second session. Please start the proceedings. Now, we are again requesting Dr. Anand Joshi to come onto the dais to deliver his lecture on technical pearls step by step of ACLR. Thank you very much. Uh, at the end of the day, I think you're all going to be fed up of listening to me so many times can my ha can i have my slides on please slides uh, so uh, i've i've been asked to speak on the technique of acl reconstruction and how i switch from 120 minutes to 20 minutes so i just asked my fellow to keep on time lapse and captured the procedure of ACL reconstruction and made sure that the tourniquet time was only 20 minutes. So that is how we change the timing of ACL reconstruction. So <laughs> this is trick photography and not really in practice. So ACL reconstruction is a fairly well established procedure. It is done for patients who have unstable knees following an ACL injury. The aim is to provide a strong graft which is anatomically placed, avoiding impingement of the graft during flexion and extension so patients have full range of motion. You want to preserve biology and Amit will be speaking on how to preserve biology of, during ACL and it should be securely fixed. As things have evolved over the past 20 years in ACL reconstruction, we have shifted from isometric placement to anatomic placement of the ACL, which means that we are trying to recreate the footprint of the native ACL during surgery. To cre create this anatomic placement, we had to change our uh, technique of ACL reconstruction. So we shifted from drilling the femoral tunnel transtibially, and we shifted drilling to the transportal technique. So that gave us freedom to select the femoral uh, footprint uh, during the surgical procedure. 
when we started going into the transporter technique we realized that the femoral tunnel was very short and therefore to adjust to this there was a technology uh, technical uh, technological change or instrumentation change and we had to shift from the fixed loop to the adjustable loop so these were some of the changes that we have seen in the acl surgery besides this we also found that as surgeons in order to be accurate uh, during surgery we were removing a lot of soft tissue from the intercondylar notch because of some of the ridges that were described for anatomic placement of the graft but we soon realized that we were destroying biology to a great extent by burning out tissues in the intercondylar notch and therefore today we rely more on soft tissue landmarks during our surgical procedures both on the tibial side and the femoral side so that we are uh, biologically on the right side of biology when we are doing an acl reconstruction some surgeons have shifted from the bone patella tendon bone to the hamstrings for their own reasons and i was uh, one of them i started doing bone patella tendon bone in 1989 and in 1996 i shifted to the hamstrings and the reason for that was that juhi chawla had come to me with an acl which was done elsewhere and when i saw the scar on the knee i said what would have happened if she would have come to me i would have given her a big scar in front of the knee and would have destroyed her uh, acting career so that is the time i decided that i should shift to the hamstrings so i shifted to the hamstrings in 1996 but the patella tendon continues to be in my armament area a new graft which have which we have started using recently is the central quad tendon so this we are using extensively now in particularly in females who are hyperlax who have absolutely no remnant of the acl and we feel that they need a robust graft uh, for stability so we have shifted that uh, the to the central quad tendon in these patients and in all revision cases where you have a failed hamstring or a failed bone patella tendon bone so if you want to keep your surgery very simple straight forward and reproducible i think these are the steps that you need to follow follow the kiss principle start with a diagnostic round of the knee go to graft harvesting after your diagnostic round graft preparation femoral tunnel drilling tibial tunnel drilling graft passage and fixation so every surgery that i do seems to be very boring when people come to observe surgery because i am following the same steps each and every uh, time now i have seen surgeons miss this step of diagnostic round because they say clinically i know that the acl is gone and mri tells me that the acl is gone so why what is the need for a diagnostic scopy and why not harvest the graft straight away so the logic behind doing this diagnostic round is that it tells you whether any additional grafts may be required for example if the patient has a posterior lateral opening and you need the gracilis for that graft uh, for doing the larsen's procedure on that side then you know that you need to have adequate graft for your acl the second reason is you also know what is the type of remnant of the acl is the acl completely shattered or am i uh, going to preserve a great uh, deal of the native acl so that is why this is extremely important so first the diagnostic round and next probing to find out what all are the additional injuries along with the acl so if the acl as in this case is completely shattered and you have to remove the entire acl then you know that you need a robust graft like maybe the cqt or you need a quadruple semity maybe the gracilis in addition to that or maybe you need a bone patella tendon bone but if you find that the acl is only avulsed from say the femoral side which we see in a large percentage of patients where we are able to preserve a majority of the stump then you know that you just need probably the semi tendinosis and you can probably double it triple it or maybe quadruple it so then your approach to the problem becomes simpler if you find in the at this stage that the notch is extremely narrowed in pre, pre, uh, 
patients who have neglected acl then you may do a notch plasty but it is not really required in all patients routinely i harvest only the semi tendinosus and quadruple it because i find that i get adequate length and uh, diameter of the uh, semi t only in about 5% of the patients do i harvest both the semi t and the gracilis because we know that the hamstrings are antagonistic to the acl so the minimum donor site morbidity that one can cause the better it is for the patient so we harvest the semi t and then we quadruple it if we find that the uh, remnant is adequate then we also do not hesitate to triple the semi tendinosus graft and this is the technique by which you can triple the semi tendinosus so you don't tie knots at either end and this is the way you can then triple it pass it over your uh, loop which you are going to use for fixation and then securely tie it to the loop and you can use this as a triple graft so you can triple quadruple double the semi t as and when required according to uh, the graft the uh, remnant preservation that you are going to do now one thing which has again caught the fancy of surgeons is uh, augmentation of the hamstring graft so if you find that the graft is not adequate uh, even i was guilty of this i used to say that we should augment it with a polyester tape but recently we found that uh, almost five patients in our last series of almost maybe 200 where we have used Uh, the uh, polyester tape we found that they had developed extensive reaction to the tape and this was not immediate after surgery this sometimes has happened even 2 years following use of this tape we have found that there is reaction both on the tibial and the femoral sides and this is one such example which we operated where you find that the entire button and the tape had to be removed so one must use this with extreme caution whenever you try because there are some people who are now saying that if i use the fiber tape you can jump on the knee on day 1 or you can go back to sports within 3 months but i think there are some uh, side effects of which we should be aware of and we should be careful whenever we are using any kind of foreign material inside the joint i think these polyester tapes are excellent for extra articular augmentation procedures but should be used with great care during intra operative procedures so the cqt is now our preferred uh, choice and we tried both the minimally invasive central quad tendon as well as the open central quad tendon and we find that this is much easier and gives you a more reliable uh, graft when you do uh, use the central quad tendon why did we change uh, after so many years when central quad tendon has been talked about for all these years it took quite a while for us to change to the central quad because initially we were hesitant as to the kind of fixation of the quadriceps tendon on the femoral side but now we have what is known as a fiber tag uh, which uh, ensures that the fixation on the femoral side is very uh, strong and the suture material because we know that the quad tendon is a lamellated tendon so if you pass regular sutures through this there is a possibility that it might cut out and with this fiber tag it ensures that you have a good grip on the tendon and that is why we shifted to the quad tendon notch plasty should ideally be done after you have harvested the graft because then you know what is the space that you require in the notch and it should be done with great care and you do not want to encroach on the articular cartilage on the lateral side now coming to tunneling maximum number of mistakes are made on the femoral side as we all know and you can use uh, drill the femoral uh, tunnel either using a rigid transportal jig which we routinely do when we are doing adolescent knees because you don't want to go, go too far laterally and damage the uh, epiphysis but 
in our practice now we use the uh, flexible reamers so the flexible reamer allows you to go right up to the back of the knee inferiorly without really damaging uh, any uh, native or remnant acl we use uh, the remnant the fibers of the remnant acl as uh, soft tissue landmarks for the femoral tunnel and that is how we uh, use the flexible reamer so it prevents hyper extend uh, flexion of the knee which is often required when you are doing the femoral tunnel drilling when you hyper flex the knee during femoral tunnel drilling the fat pad comes in your way and it obstructs your vision whereas with the flexible reamers you don't have to hyper flex the knee the tbl tunnel has not require uh, received due attention but you can see that you can make mistakes even on the tbl side here the tunnel is uh, tbl tunnel is too far anterior and you can land up with impingement the tunnel can be too far posterior and you may end up with a vertical graft or it may be too far medial as you can see here the patient, the femoral tbl tunnel is on the articular cartilage and so the patient con had constant pain during surgery amit i think will be speaking more on biological augmentation so i will not touch on this on the tbl tunnel i always like to do serial dilatation of the tbl tunnel because the subchondral bone in this area especially in athletes can be very uh, strong or robust and if you suddenly drill this with a 10 mm uh, cannulated drill or a 9 mm drill you may shatter the articular cartilage so we like to initially start off with a 6 or a 7 mm cannulated drill and progress progressively increase the diameter of the tunnel if you do not position your k wire correctly in the first uh, the first time like here i felt that the tbl tunnel was too far anterior i kept the k wire in uh, place if you remove that k wire it probably keeps on going in the same track so keep the k wire in place and then drill your second tunnel and uh, wire with the k wire so that you do not end up doing uh, in the same tunnel the endo button should be flipped under vision most of the time so that you are sure that it has flipped on the lateral cortex so this is one of the tips and when you pass the graft make sure that it is a smooth passage of the graft so usually if i have to do an isolated acl reconstruction because of the team that i have around me and the instrumentation that we have it is truly a 20 minute procedure so it is not something which is not practically possible but you need to have the whole team uh, the proper equipment around you after passage of the graft we have seen that some of the bone debris may be pushed inside the joint during graft passage and this needs to be looked at otherwise the patient can land up with a cyclops lesion and uh, block to extension so this is biological internal bracing i'll not touch on this because uh, amit's uh, topic is basically this so basically we take from what abc of meniscus repair to abcd of acl reconstruction so anatomy that is uh, footprint reconstruction stump preservation robust graft with the secure fixation and address all the associated deficiencies like a ramp or a posterolateral or a lateral corner injury when you are doing an acl reconstruction for optimal outcome of a acl surgery thank you very much thank you dr joshi for a nice talk the next uh, next may i call upon dr amit joshi ach nahi nahi dusra technical pulse reminiscence of the preservation of acl wo to uska ho gaya yaar चक्र थैंक यू वेरी मच सर सो लेट एस टॉक अबाउट समथिंग व्हिच इज अपकमिंग कॉन्सेप्ट ऑन बायोलॉजी ऑफ एसीएल रिकंस्ट्रक्शन सो आई हैव नथिंग टू डिस्क्लोज इफ यू सी दैट कॉमन अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ एन ऑर्थोपेडिक सर्जन 
to replace a tissue, same kind of tissue are the best. So if you are replacing the nerve, probably nerve is the best one. And if you are replacing the bone, you have to have a bone. But when we uh, talk about ACL reconstruction, this is the ligament which has been replaced by tendon. Say it is a BPTB or hamstring or even quadriceps. Uh, if you understand why, this is because of the inavailability of the ACL. ACL is not available, ligament is not available. That is why we are replacing the ligament with the tendon. <clears throat> but uh, what we are doing, as Sir also said that from a isometric, we have come to an anatomic ACL reconstruction. So in attempt to recreate the anatomy, we have completely replaced the biology, biological ligament with the tendon. And we all know that all this tendon which has been put inside has to undergo a process of ligamentization, uh, which will take about 12 to 18 months. So the concept is, if we cannot replace, then why not to preserve some of these uh, remnants? And the preservation can be in the form of remnant preservation or the re remaining part of the uh, ligament can be preserved or the extreme of preservation is the ACL repair, which is coming up um, very heavily. So there are various advantages of all this remnant. Number one is it is a ligament. It is not a tendon. So it will preserve all the property of the ligament. And as Sir showed, the vascularity that comes from the remnant is tremendous. If you see this remnant and some of the picture, this all have vascular channel, which will enhance the ligamentization of the process. Uh, it, the remnant also provides some stability because it has Golgi and the Pacinian's corpuscle in its footprint. So that will provide certain feedback mechanism and will act as a you know, protective mechanism for the reconstructed ACL. The, re, uh, the remnant will have a preserved its bundle anatomy. Various cellular components are there various mesenchymal cells are there remained in the ligament, which will, you know, uh, seed into the ACL graft and it will enhance the healing. In Nepal's perspective, you'll see that in Nepal, uh, we recently published a paper which says that probably most common cause of ACL reconstruction in our country is road traffic accident. And in road traffic accident, the pattern of injury is completely different. Most of the time, these are around 60% road traffic accident will have a proximal avulsion of the ACL. So how to deal with uh, remnants? It's a you know, burning topic recently. There are several classification of the remnant. Uh, the Sherman classification is the most commonly you know, talked about classification. But this disadvantage of Sherman classification is this does not give us a guideline how to treat with the, or how to deal with the remnant. Grigory Diffelis classification, who is a very advocate of ACL repair. This is his detailed classification. Probably this classification is good enough because it provides, uh, it covers the MRI reporting as well as the arthroscopic picture and then gives certain indications for repair. But if you understand our context that, you know, uh, the MRI classification of the level of injury where the ACL has torn, it's in the proximal one third, 90%. It's very difficult to use this class classification in our practice. So we have come up, uh, we have worked out and submitted this paper for publication. This is our own classification as a simple modification of the classification in which we divide them into the proximal, which is type one, uh, then mid substance, which is type two, and the distal one is type three. Both proximal and distal can have a bony evulsion. So if it is a bony evulsion, it is type 1A. And if it is soft tissue evulsion, it is type 1, uh, sorry, bony evulsion is 1B and soft tissue is A. So based upon that classification, we have suggested certain treatment. And then this is about 170 cases prospective study, uh, which is going to be published very soon, hopefully. So based upon this classification, we have given four um, treatment modalities. One is proper ACL reconstruction. If it is a chronic remnant, probably remnant preservation or even a footprint preservation, some part of the footprint has to be preserved. If there is an acute condition, soft tissue injury, the remnant strengthening and the biological augmentation. And finally, if it is a bony avulsion, either it is from the femoral side or from the tibial side, 
we have to do repair. So some of these example, this is example of footprint preservation. This is a chronic empty sign. And you can see the, uh, the, the vascularity on the remnants. That is what we are trying to preserve, thinking that it will enhance our ligament. So all the remnant uh, footprint has been preserved and the ACL has been reconstructed. You can see that down the footprint has been reserved. So there is no need of removing all the footprint as Sir said, we don't need to look at the bony anatomy to place our tunnel. We have to look into the soft tissue anatomy to place our tunnel. This is another case in which we have done a remnant preservation. So if your remnant is attached to some structures, either into the femoral condyle or into the PCL, you can let it attach, let it be attached and put your ACL graft. That becomes your remnant uh, preservation. So here you can see that the remnant has been preserved a new ACL has been reconstructed uh, uh, by the arthroscopic technique. So remnant has been preserved. The third one is the remnant tensioning. So this technique is applied when, when you have a remnant acute tear and your remnant is not attached to anyone, but it is floating. So this was a 24 year old female presented to us about two weeks after injury. And this is in arthroscopy view, you can see that a remnant is not attached to anyone. So what we do is we take bites on the stump of the remnant and shuttle that and put a fiber tape. Then we make a proper anatomic femoral tunnel of the ACL, harvest the graft, prepare the graft, make femoral tunnel and the TBL tunnel. So this is the bite taken and then the suture are shuttled through the same tunnel, uh, same femoral tunnel. Now the graft is passed inside and the uh, suture in the remnant is pulled and then you can pass your interference screw to fix both the remnant and the graft with the same suture. You can see the vascularity on the remnant which has been preserved and your ACL which has been augmented biologically. Uh, this technique has recently been published in 2021 October in arthroscopy technique. Uh, finally, ACL repair, which I said that this is extreme of remnant preservation. This was a 40 year old gentleman, 40 year old gentleman uh, with ACL tear presented to us after two weeks of injury, his knee was silent. And if you see this remnant, look at the vascularity of the remnant and the peculiarity of this one, it had some bone specule on its ace. So it was a bony avulsion from the femoral attachment. In these cases, we do repair uh, so you pass few sutures through the remnant, come out from the edge of the remnant, do a biological enhancement by doing a microfracture crimson duvet into the condyle, and then do a all inside fixation using a, a various all inside anchors, which is used in shoulder arthroscopy. So this is what all the sutures has been passed and it has been fixed into the femoral condyle. So if I do a repair, my rehab is little slower compared to the remnant preservation. So this is ACL has been repaired, which is probably when we talk about the preservation, this is the highest grade of preservation in which all the remnants or all the ACL has been preserved. So to conclude my short presentation, I'd like to say that ACL graft has to undergo a process of ligamentization. So for this ligamentization, we need a good biological support. And nowadays, if you remove the technical issues, the most commonest cause of ACL failure is lack of biology provided to the ACL graft. And the remnant, they put biology to our construct, as I have shown, lots of soft tissue. And then if you go to literature, you will find out that various mesenchymal cells that is present in the remnant, they traverses all the way into the you know, graft and they enhance the biology. There are mixed results coming out of the both repair and preservation. There is no clear cut winner um, on the clinical outcome uh, aspect, but there are a lot of research is going on. And the improvement in arthroscopy technique and instrumentation in near future will improve the outcome of remnant preservation and the repair. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amit Joshi, for such a wonderful talk. And can I now invite our speaker who is online giving the talk, Dr. Sundar Rajan. He will be talking on technical pearls, reinvesting lost art of ACLR 
using PTB. Dr. Sundar uh, Rajan, sir, are you there? Thank, yeah, I'm, I'm here, sir. Thank you, sir. I request uh, RBC to make me co-host to share my screen. Yeah, I could see that. Thank you. Thank you. Please proceed. Just a minute, sir. Thank you very much. So my topic on the uh, PTP graph for uh, ACL reconstruction. So from 2003 to 2009, uh, when we so when we started arthroscopy, we thought that PTP graft was the gold standard. Again, the, from the next decade, that is from 2010, then hamstring graft became gold standard. From 2018 onwards, again, the PTP graft is an emerging graft and there is a fight is always happening between the hamstring and PTP graft. So the major concern in the ACL reconstruction in a common people and also as a surgeon, we are worried about the residual laxity. We are worried about the retear of ACL reconstruction. And also patients are worried that when they, when do they can go back to the sports as early as possible. Of course, is there any possibility of osteoarthritis by doing these uh, uh, reconstructions? When you, get, when you take the graft healing in the tunnels in PPT graft, we know that PPT graft has the advantage of rigid fixation in the bone tunnel. Bone block healing in the tunnel resembles the fracture healing. And also incorporation has been reported as early as 16 weeks postoperatively. So when you compare the PPT graft versus hamstring graft, the tear resistance is better in hamstring grafts. However, the forces encountered in ACL reconstruction are well within tolerance of PPT graft, even with the accelerated rehabilitation. So a BPT bone plex can provide digit fixation and quicker graft osteointegration. It also gives you the strong initial, uh, initial resistance, early embolization because of early mobilization because of the rigid fixation, normal bone tendon, uh, bone tendon junction resistance, and uh, generally recommended for high demand young patients. The major concern is the donor site morbidity. Even though the anterior knee pain has been reported around 17 to 40 percent in the literature, how to avoid that is the most important question. Even though we cannot completely avoid, there are make, you can make some technical uh, 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 makeovers to reduce that anterior knee pain. The other important complication which was mentioned about the patellar fracture, that is very, very rare uh, because if you are not using the proper instrumentation, then the chances of patellar fracture is there. But otherwise, the patellar tendon ruptures and patellar fractures are very, very rare in a patellar tendon harvest. The five degrees of extension deficit, which is reported in the literature, if you do a proper rehabilitation, again, there is no change. The osteoarthritis has not been proved. Is there any difference between the PPT graft or any other grafts? Can you come to the other concerns in the ACL reconstruction? What we are talking about the residual laxity. By, by using the PTP graft, results in more stable knee and negative lackments and pivot shift compared to the hamstring graft. So PPT graft scores over in cases of residual laxity. This is a paper of long-term outcome in ACL in a systemic review patients, PTP versus autograft. This was published in 2017, where patients with hamstring graft had a twice the risk of revision compared to the patients with the PTP graft. So in, graft, in relation to the graft retard and revision, PTP scores better than hamstring graft. The same thing in another paper, even though this paper has shown that there is no significant difference between these two groups, uh, still PTP uh, has got returned to sports in 87% and patient satisfaction higher after ACL reconstruction and active athletes. So the use of PTP graft increases the likelihood of returning to play, whereas pre-injury participation soccer and uh, lacrosse degrees the lot rods. When it comes to the technique, I will go to the some video about the PTP graph. Is it possible to do an anatomical ACL reconstruction? Is an, another concern uh, among the surgeons when they are using the hamstring graph. Absolutely, it is possible. We don't need to use a, just a transtibial technique. You can use the medial portal technique. You can make an anatomical technique, anatomical uh, reconstruction by making the technical adjustment by making the graft bit smaller. Don't use the two to two point five graft inside the femoral side. Make sure that you are taking 1.5 to 2 centimeter graft in the patellar side that will go into the femoral side. So I will show you in the technical uh, video next uh, slide. And also it's important that you should have a proper armamentarium. We cannot just use the only osteotomes to harvest PTP graft. 
you require a proper saw so that you don't uh, damage the patella so you don't do the patella tendon rupture you don't do the patella tendon fractures by using just the osteotome and hammering especially in osteoporotic patients it's very important that you should have a proper armamentarium of uh, uh, instrument instruments when you come to the technique the make sure that if you are you don't make the midline incision you can make a curvy linear incision so that patients will not get the um, uh, patient will not get that anterior knee pain which you are talking about the scar pain so you can go slightly away from the medial side and you no need to make a 10 cm incision you require a just 4 cm incision for your ptp harvest and make sure that after incising you can take from the usually i take the central third of the patella tendon graft then he incise the patella tendon fascia slowly then spread that uh, uh, fascia on the either side with the help of the scissor and you are ask your assistants on the both the sides to retract the patella tendon sheath on the medial and the lateral side so that will expose and show you the medial and lateral border of entire patella tendon so that you can choose the central slip of the patella tendon which normally we require 8 or 9 or 10 mm depending upon the patient's BMI. So you can take the 9 mm graft in the, from the center of the tip. You can use the scale like this and mark it so that you can make the exact uh, measurement of the graft which you wanted. So that is the uh, mark which was made for the 9 mm graft. Once you have done that marking, then you make that vertical incision starting from proximal to distal. Once you incise that both the sides, ask your assistant to retract the remaining patella tendon on the either side. So that will give you more uh, exposure. Then take out that retractor on the lower ones. Just you mobilize the skin. You can see the skin is very highly mobile. So you don't need to make an extra incision. Then you extend the incision from the patella tendon to the tibial side around 2.5 to 3 centimeter. You don't require more than that. So that is the incision which you require for your tibial harvest. Then use the T-shirt or the 10 mm width of the small blades for your harvesting of the TBL side. Using it to angle around 60 degrees to 45 degrees of angle. Don't make two vertical, it will take a big graft. Use around 45 degrees of uh, angle or 60 degrees of angle on the either side. Ask your assistants to hold that performance in the slightly uh, sleeping mode so that you can use the saw very easily on either side like that. After making the medial and the lateral cut, then you make the distal cut, just changing the uh, side of your saw. So that is the distal cut which you require. And again, it's a saw. So you can see the, see the angle of the saw. It's around 45 degrees so that you don't go the entire depth of the blade. Then you use the osteotome on the entire side, either side, gently tap it on, on both the sides, so that will take away the remaining attachment of your PC graft. Just you can lever it after making a general taping on the both the sides. You start from the distal to proximal like this, and you can use the same uh, 10 mm osteotome on the distal side, then use it, deliver it. Once you deliver the graft on the tibial side, you can re remove the remaining attachment by using a scissor. Hold it with the towel holding forceps. Releases the remaining attachment from the fat pad. So keep the possible, keep the tongue of the bone, which above the attachment of your petla tendon. So that will give you the more length of the bone so for the entire tibial tunnel. So one once you are done that release, then you do the knee extension. So that will help you for the skin to mobile proximally. So you again, you don't need to make an, any extra incision for your petal harvest. You can see the space, how much space left here between the petal and the skin incision. Once you do the extension, then take the uh, proximal retractors, you retract the skin that will expose the, your petal. So again, you can see here, we don't make any extra incisions, just moving this retractor just over the skin that will allow you to uh, go up up to two centimeter in the patellar side once you have done that use again 10 mm knife extend the incision which you had made it for your graft on the patellar side both the medial and the lateral side go up to the bone 
and mark in the petlar side around 1.5 to 2 cm don't go more than that because it will be difficult to negotiate in the femoral tunnel especially when you are going through the medial portal technique so usually i take for between 1.5 to 2 cm so that is the incision you mark it for your petlar side uh, harvest on the both the sides once you are done that then you can use the same saw which was used for the tibial side harvest ask your assistant to support the knee keep it around 30 to 40 degrees of flexion so that your saw doesn't touch your retractor again you see that angle around we are using around 45 to 60 degrees of angle so that you don't go too deep and your entire depth of the saw no need to go into the patellar side that possibility of the patellar tendon patellar bone fracture can happen so go up to only 9 mm or 8 mm depends upon the graft because you want 8 to 9 mm of graft whole circumferentially so once you made it medial and lateral then you make the proximal cut again you use the same uh, 45 to 60 degrees make sure that your assistant is holding it in a proper uh, uh, flexion around 30 to 40 degrees so that will facilitate for your proximal cut so you make that proximal cut around 8 to 9 mm you can see that by the entire blade is not going inside they just am angling the blade around 45 degree to 50 degrees so that helps you to make the distal cut once you've done that medial lateral and proximal cut then i make the deep osteotome because you don't want the osteotome use the osteotome again you clear the fat pad now turn the saw on the upside down you can see that again i had come to the foot and that's foot inside I'm using the saw to make a deep cut so that I don't need to hammer that remaining petla tendon. So around eight to nine mm down the tendon, you just make the another deep cut. So that will facilitate for your easy uh, harvesting of the petlar side. Once you have done that, again, you use the osteotome. Again, you see that I don't hammer at all in the petlar side. Just using it, lever it, and your petlar tendon graft is uh, has come out completely. You can see that length of the both the sides grafts. Then you trim it according to the size, usually comes around 8, 9 mm. You make a two uh, holes on the both proximally and the distally for the use your fiber wires to negotiate. One hole is not sufficient because it will flip inside the tunnel. Make sure that you make at least two, um, two tunnels making with 1.8 mm K wires. So that will facilitate for your uh, threads to go inside. You can see this is how you put the threads inside, then you negotiate inside and go and do the remaining fixation. So your PTP graft is very, is, uh, very identical, very, uh, uh, is indicated in young patients involved in the contact sports, in patients with the generalized ligament complexity can be used, or ACL tear with the grade 3 MCL where you are worried about the hamstring and the medial side and the posterior side weaknesses. Again, PTP graft is the ideal choice. Of course, in the revision situations where you use the primary hamstring graft in the uh, correctly positioned tunnels can be used as a single stage revision AC reconstruction if the tunnel diameter is not too wide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sundar Rajan, sir. Uh, please go ahead. And next talk is from Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, evolving concept ACL femoral avulsion to repair. When and how I do it? Dr. Sachin Tapasvi from Pune. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, again, thank you for having me over here and allowing me to come and speak about some of the concepts about uh, ACL repair. So I'll be presenting today on ACL repair. Why should we be doing it? And uh, when should we be doing it? So essentially, we're talking, going to be speaking about the science of ACL repair. So almost about 70% of your ACL injuries will be non-contact. And if you have an additional neuromuscular deficit, you will get a primary as well as a secondary uh, type of an ACL injury. So the <clears throat> amount of interest that has been there in non-contact ACL injuries is quite significant. 
And if you look at all these papers that have been published, which show that definitely there is a higher incidence of uh, these non-contact ACL injuries that occur. The interest in ACL repair has grown definitely. And uh, this has been because of understanding of more concepts, which allow us or enable us to understand which are the correct people for which an ACL repair may be looked into. So essentially, you had a lot of ACL repairs that were being done maybe about 50 years ago, but they were for the wrong indications. And over the last decade or two, we have a recurrence of interest in these type of uh, ACL repair surgeries. <clears throat> a lot of interest has been into the basic science of healing of the ACL. The ACL is definitely a richly vascularly supplied organ. And late Professor Freddie Fu, whom, to whom we owe a lot of our understanding of the ACL, spoke a lot upon how the ACL was a living structure and the ACL had to be preserved throughout its lifespan. So essentially, whenever you have a tear of the ACL, the same extrapolation to that of the MCL cannot be done. So Martha Murray, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, won the uh, Kappa Delta Award for this, uh, this specific research pattern of hers. They looked at healing patterns both in the ACL and the MCL. And in the ACL, you do not have healing in all the four phases because essentially you cannot have a blood clot that forms. As against the MCL, wherein once the blood clot forms, you have collagen production, which then leads to a healing response. Again, if you have an enhanced histologic repair in a central wound with a collagen a plasma, a collagen PRP scaffold, you can extrapolate and find that you do get healing. So what we have here on top are the various uh, staining patterns, right from uh, fibronectin and all the growth factors. And looking at the three extrapolations of the patellar ligament, the ACL intraarticular, and the ACL with a collagen PRP scaffold, one can observe that you can get some form of healing response, which is pretty similar to that of the extraarticular structure. It also allows us to improve neovascularization and increase the amount of type 3 collagen. So essentially, there are three different techniques by which you can repair the ACL. You have the direct suture repair, or you have what is called as the dynamic intraligamentary stabilization technique, or you have the bare technique. So as Dr. Amit Joshi did mention, all the proximal tears are amenable to doing a ACL repair, as are the tears which are present on the distal most aspect. So type one and type two ACL tears are probably the ones that we should be using. And um, these tear patterns should be picked up both preoperatively and intraoperatively before you go ahead and start your ACL surgery. So type one and type two are the ones that you want to pick up. So how do we do this? And we wrote about it almost about four years ago. Essentially, you once you choose the correct type of tear, you want to use some form of suture passage device. And then you want to create a small hole on the femoral side using a knotless anchor and then reattach your torn ACL back to exactly where it should be. These may at that time be supplemented with some form of a protective internal brace. And this is probably one of the very few indications where I would recommend that an internal brace may be used. The same technique is used on the tibial side as well. And uh, again, we wrote about the same almost about six years ago and published our technique in which you use a technique which is similar to what you will use when you repair an ACL avulsion. So in these techniques, essentially what you want to do is to debride the stump of your uh, torn uh, ligament. Once you debride the stump, you want to make sure that it sits properly. And once you're confident that it is going to sit properly and it can heal, then you go ahead, pass sutures within your stump of the ACL. And then you have either pull out sutures 
or you can use a direct knotless fixation. The fixation modality needs to be secure. It is not essential that you need to use either of uh, these two. The type of the the type of the fixation will not greatly change the outcome, but essentially you have to use your suture passing techniques, which will then allow you to get a good firm repair. It's always important to have good visibility, and very frequently in these type of surgeries, you will need more than one portal, which may be required for you to get um, a good firm repair. So here we are passing sutures in a crisscross fashion. This one is for the tibial side. The previous one was for the femoral side. And once you have these sutures that are passed, you will then retrieve them through the portals, make tunnels in the tibia, and then go ahead and repair the same. Standard instruments which are available from the uh, knee as well as the shoulder kit are very extremely useful here. And a bit of practice of doing indirect and direct knot passing techniques can be extremely useful to achieve and gain confidence in going one step ahead. So in this particular instance now, we are now drilling and dilating the tunnels in the tibia, <clears throat> both on the medial as well as on the lateral side. We are looking at it through a central transpatellar tendon view. and. Um, in order to gain good mobility and in order to have a good suture passage, you may use a cannula at times or ensure that there is no formation of a soft tissue bridge and thereby achieve a good stable repair. So uh, this is pulling down both the sutures one after the other. And this is at the end of your surgical procedure where you are now able to achieve a good crisscross configuration of your ACL fixation and you have restored the tension um, in your ACL. So this is uh, in short how you do the technique. The other technique is the bare technique, which is uh, now still in the phase of trials. And in this, a mid-substance tear can be repaired using a scaffold, which is infused with the patient's own platelet-rich plasma. And this scaffold is used as an intermediate bridge between the torn ends of the ACL, which are then approximated to each other and a suture is helped, is used to try and get um, a good firm repair. These results are still in their final stages. We now have the five-year results of um, the bare technique and definitely they still have shown that there are no failures uh, with this particular technique and they are quite confident that this probably will be the treatment of the future. So this still not is in vogue completely and we still need more data on the same. The dynamic interligamentary stabilization consists of using of two special implants to which are tensioned on both sides on the femur and on the tibia. And to be very honest, I have absolutely no experience of using this particular technique, which is more popular in Germany as of now. If you look at uh, updated systematic review of all the literature that we have, uh, a total of 28 studies which were randomized to sutures and to the uh, DIS technique. And however, you can see that um, the re-rupture rate for all tear types is somewhere around 25 to 30%. But when you look at the proximal tears only, only about 12% of them will have a re-rupture, which again is closely approximating to the ACL re-rupture rates that we have in our clinical practice. I looked at my own data. Uh, I have about 42 patients uh, who have had an ACL repair till date. The mean age was 21, 36 males and six females, and I have a mean follow-up of 29 months. If I look at the various uh, tear patterns that we see of the MRI scan, the patients that I normally would always select are the type one tears, and they approximately constitute about 16% of my clinical practice. So results, uh, I've had re-ruptures in three of my 42 patients. Two of them were following playing soccer, and one was a road traffic accident. Uh, which was unrelated to the index surgery that was being that had been performed, 
and all three of them were revised with a BTB ACL reconstruction. The results also showed that the IKDC scores improved from 57 to 88 at the time of the last follow-up, and the Tegner activity index rose from 4.9 to 7.2. The range of motion uh, with the ACL repair, I find that though the ACL reconstructions may have a faster return to range for the first one month, at the end of three months, I found that both my patient groups were doing exactly the same. And when you add an internal brace, probably it becomes a lot more easier to mobilize them earlier with a lot more of confidence. Um, looking at the MR evidence of healing in my subgroup of patients, it was MR scans were done for 28 of the 42 patients, 18 months following the repair. Uh, 19 of uh, those 28 showed full healing of the femoral footprint. About six out of 28 showed more than 50, but less than 75%. And three out of those 28 had an ACL rupture, which was a group three, and that is what it is. So she's one of my own classmates. Uh, she's about 52 years old. And this is four months following an uh, ACL repair on her knee. Uh, she's one of the outliers whom I would choose. And um, you know she's trying to get back to return to sport, which can be done a lot more earlier in these patients. We recently wrote up a narrative on the same as well, whether we can use it for athletes. Yes, you can. You can use it, especially if you are looking at younger patients who understand what the whole surgical procedure involves. And these should have type one tears which present early. It is useful because you can preserve native tissue and the results are comparable when you compare them with the other techniques of ACL reconstruction in that same type one tear. You can use internal brace or augmentation to definitely improve and increase your rehabilitation and allow them to mobilize early. So thank you so much for allowing me to present virtually and uh, hope to meet all of you in person very soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's been an excellent talk. I think it's a growing trend for people trying to preserve ACL along with the reconstruction. I think that's the way to look forward. Uh, well, I'm here just to introduce Dr. Ashish Kumar, uh, somebody who I didn't know much I, for the face-to-face. -face. Recently been seeing him, uh, before that in the COVID, been a number of times being with him uh, on a virtual platform. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ashish. So the bit of uh, is uh, a lot of things I've seen with him growing up. Uh, he's been a professor of KGMU, been trained in Australia, France, and Germany, established arthroscopies, has published a number of papers, and uh, he's been a UP Orthocon president. The other thing which you're not aware of is his passion for animals, mainly dogs, and his gardening. You've got a free time, you can talk about him in later. Welcome, Dr. Ashish. Go ahead, please. Hello. So thanks for the nice introduction, uh, respected chairpersons, dear friends. So uh, I'm thankful to my previous speakers who have talked a lot about the different techniques of ACL reconstruction. So I need not to repeat uh, all those things. So what we are going to talk about the revision ACL. So where? If you are doing so many primaries, then revisions are likely to take place. So if you talk about the technique, technique remains the same. You have to recreate the ACL like you have done for the primary. The same thing we are going to do for the failed ACL, but in a, a little bit of different manner. So I will be just talking about what you have to be careful while doing it. So 75 to 90 percent success rate varies when you do a primary ACL. So it's likely to uh, re-rupture or you have a failed ACL despite without rupture, there is stretching of the graft or there can be a wrong technique that has been done in the very initial phase as you undergo for stresses, then it is likely to fail. So in such case, how you are going to proceed, this is uh, important. What is a failed ACL? For all practical purposes, it is the recurrent instability. So if somebody is having a still a Lachman sign uh, positive or a uh, anterior draw test positive, then it is a failed ACL or he is not satisfied. It's a, there are a lot of patient variation, 
somebody might be happy with that laxity somebody may not be we are very thankful to our patients who are not a sports person most of the times so they live with with it and uh, with that minimal laxity or they they are happily doing their job unless there is a pivoting so if the pivoting comes again then they come for you uh, for the revision acl or something you have to do for that so pain is the other thing which may be there may be pre existing arthritis or because of your deeds you have developed the arthritis and the stiffness and the loss of range of movement despite of physiotherapy this is a important thing where the you can have uh, orthofibrosis or uh, that has led to or poor uh, tunnel placement where isometry has not been respected and you can have this kind of problems infection is something which is very different so that has got a very different place if we talk about so you have to evaluate the cause of failure this is the major crux what has happened and you are not going to repeat that and you have to correct that this is the basic uh, talk that we are going to uh, have here for 8 9 minutes now so recurrent instability because of the graft failure that is that will fail if you have done done it uh, technically wrong so a structural or functional if it's a failure it's a failure overlooked comorbidities is very important you find out acl reconstruction is very easy i will do that whereas
So it has advantage of strength, but it has got certain disadvantages as well. So please uh, be careful. He also focused on stem preservation. By the time the speakers are here, I would request the delegates, if any question, please come on the mic. A doctor, Amit Joshi, he told about the preservation of the remnants. He put a lot of stress uh, that you please preserve the soft tissue and whatever remnants are there, you please take care of that, uh, those remnants. Dr. Sundar Razan, probably many athletes and professional players are, is, are going to him. He told about BPTB and said that it is the most strong fixation and bring back the people to the back to the professional sports life. So it should be used in younger people. Dr. Sachin Tapaswi, he gave the concept of uh, what are the innovation, biological repair techniques, beer technique he told about, and how can you preserve without replacement, can you do the repair work also. Dr. Ashish Kumar uh, very intelligently put the, through the light on those things which we often miss and uh, how, where are the, uh, you can miss the train and where can be uh, difficulties and the fixation can fail. So very rightly, he put the light on those things which we often miss. I would invite if any question from the, yes, Dr. Nirvay, please, faculty is there on this session of ACL. My question is to Dr. Amit sir. Sir, in stem preservation, what should be the actual length of the stump which should be kept? Please speak loudly. What should be the actual size of the stump to avoid overstuffing and to get the exact uh, entry and exit points for the ACL? So size of the stump does it determine. You see what is the size of the stump remain and according to that, you adjust your graft. So if you have a big size stump, probably a 7 mm graft will suffice. And if your stump size is smaller, then you increase your size of the graft. It is just a, you know, observational and your uh, skill that will determine what is the size. But at the end of the surgery, if you are doing a remnant preservation, it is very, very essential to hyperextend the knee and see that it is not overstuffing. If you are overstuffing, then you have to do a little bit of debridement or um, of the notch. So increase the size of the notch so that overstuffing is not there. Just one more point. Actually, the stump is not actually acting like ACL. It has loose end at one or the other end. So if we use a graft of 7 mm, actually we are putting a graft of 7 mm. It does not actually of the size of say more than 8 mm or 9 mm because the remnant is loose on one side. So what I think is that we should preserve only the root part and we should take our uh, ACL tunnel through that root so that we get the proprioception rather than having and believing in that weak stem. You, you are right in the sense that if your remnant is loose, it is not attached. If you see, if you saw my video, if the remnant is loose and not attached, it has to be tightened. It has to be pulled out and tightened. Then only it will act as an ACL. Either it is attached to the PCL or it is attached to the femoral condyle. If you read one study by Samuels, they have what they have done is they have cut the remnant which is attached to the femoral condyle and which is attached to the femur. And then they have checked the translation. So if you cut the remnant which is attached to the femoral uh, uh, PCL and the femoral condyle, there is increased anterior translation. So they say that even the remnants which is attached to the femur femoral condyle or the PCL have some stability properties. That is why you can preserve them and make your ACL graft, uh, put your ACL graft. If it is not attached to anywhere, then you have to reattach this to the femoral condyle by some methods. There are various methods so that they act as a um, uh, ACL. And you are absolutely right. If you are not able to preserve, do any of these, probably you have to remove the remnant and make a footprint preservation of the same thing. Yeah, delegates, uh, Dr. Sachin Tapaswi is also joined as a speaker for this Q&A session. You can ask a question to him as well. So uh, my question is for all the panelists. 
so there is no ambiguity about fixation on the femoral side on the tibial side either there is direct fixation or a partial fixation or there is a cortical fixation or dual fixation like ashish sir does dual fixation so what is the take on uh, either dual fixation on tibial side aperture versus cortical fixation I have never done dual fixation. I have done either distant fixation or aperture fixation as per the requirement, but I have never combined the two. So, how do you decide about which fixation, like aperture or cortical? So, in majority of my patients, I always do a distant fixation. So, endo button on one side, a suture disc on the tibial side, whenever I am using the hamstrings. If the quad tendon is used, I use the endo button on the femoral side. And usually an interference screw on the TBL side because the quad tendon is quite long. And uh, when it comes to fixation with screws, I have always used titanium uh, uh, screws and have not gone for the biodegradable ones. Uh, so if the graft is coming to the TBL aperture, then I'll use uh, the aperture fixation like a screw. But uh, if it is not, then I use a suture disc. So for me, it is the feel while I drill through the bone. If it's a bad one, it just goes like the reamer goes like this, then I have to be safe. That's mandatory that I will tie downwards also. So that initial days when it is taking care of uh, incorporation, at the same time I put the screw so that will take care of all those ill effects that have been explained for the graph movement and the tunnel widening. That will take care of that and my, it's a second security because in a government setup, you never know how patients is going to behave. You say use the brace, they don't use it. So these are the two reasons why I do uh, dual fixation. Dr. Sachet, your view, please. Yeah, thank you. So I've always used an aperture fixation. I uh, don't do a suspensory fixation on the tibia because uh, the tibial fixation has been rightly pointed out to be the weakest link and of all the fixation modalities on the tibia, a suspensory type of fixation is the weakest fixation where your ACL may sort of, you know, that could be one point of the ACL failing. I like to use an aperture type of fixation depending upon the quality of bone. I would prefer a titanium or a biodegradable screw. And uh, the way to use the screw or way to select the screw is to use your screwdriver, push it up in the tibial tunnel by the side of the graft. If it goes in very difficult, with a lot of difficulty, then the same size screw. If it goes in with some resistance, then one size up. If it goes in very easily, then two or even three sizes up. Thank you. I, I always use uh, interference fixation in the tibial side. Uh, only in some instances when you feel that that squeaking sound that has to come while passing your interference screw doesn't come then in very few cases very rarely i use a uh, another additional fixation but most of the time it is a pressure fixation my question to all the panelists that uh, uh, particularly dr anand joshi that initially you use bone petal bone then you shifted to the cmt hamstring and uh, apart from the size of uh, this uh, incision you have a massive follow-up of both the groups. Uh, what is the difference in the short term and long term in the both the tendons? BPTB and semitic. I think the, uh, the greatest advantage of shifting to the hamstrings was stump preservation, which uh, I think was not possible with the bone patella tendon bone. And so I think st we started appreciating the role of biology in the healing of the ACL graft. As far as strength was concerned, I am sure that the bone patellar tendon bone was far superior to the hamstrings. The problem is that uh, you can have a length, a tunnel length and a graft length mismatch uh, in a bone patellar tendon bone graft where you will have a bone plug which is projecting into uh, on the intra-articularly and that can lead to a uh, block to extension. So the uh, complication rates of patellar tendon were definitely higher, uh, like restricted range of motion, anterior knee pain, uh, as compared to the hamstrings. The hamstrings is a relatively uh, complication-free graft. And uh, the results, I think, are uh, 
not as the bone patella tendon bone was definitely superior uh, but the complications are higher what do you opinion know about the cinder quads and the peroneal tendons i have no experience with the peroneals because i don't think i have to touch the foot of someone when there are enough grafts around the knee dr ambi joshi uh, in nepal uh, you know females are very short stretcher their hamstrings are extremely small uh, over last two years uh, for females peroneus longus is the choice of graft for acl reconstruction in my practice sir uh, how do you compare between the peroneus longus versus quadricep tendon choice uh, compare in the sense you see the fixation device if you if you the fixation device no, if no. you take cqt probably most of the time as sir so there are you know uh, indo button devices for fixation of the femoral side but if i take take cqt it's both both side interferon screw but if it is peroneus i am comfortable it's just like a bigger hamstring you know i am comfortable with the uh, suspensory fixation no, no, my device. question was if you take the graft from peroneus or the quadriceps above the patella so how do you compare both the like what graft is better and what are the plus minuses of both the things as dr joshi showed in one presentation uh, you can take the quadriceps above the patella so that your incision mark is also not hindering and uh, you get good size also of the graft absolutely at this moment if you see the literature there are a lot of literature pouring in in favor of uh, quadriceps tendon uh, but there are uh, you know some studies coming up for the peroneus as well so as far as the strength of the any ligament is concerned it, it directly proportional to the diameter you get so even in quadriceps you get uh, 10 mm diameter and even in the peroneus longus you take 10 mm diameter the strength remains the same question to dr sachin tapasvi say something on this sir there was i think these are the peroneus for uh, me are important tendons uh, which uh, play yeah. a role in stabilization of the foot and i don't think unless we have long some studies to show whether the, it has deleterious effects on the uh, the arches maintenance of the arches or the weakness i would not i would hesitate to touch it you would go for quadric quadricep yeah so dr sachin question to dr sachin uh, there was a lot of debate in the last debate, uh, last decade about the double bundle versus single bundle what do you see the future of the double bundle whether it is going to stay or we are shifting towards the single bundle so i double think uh, uh, yeah. yeah so i think that about the double bundle i am aware of only a few centers in japan who practice it now besides that i don't think anybody else is doing double bundles anymore now because the outcomes of a well properly done anatomic single bundle are comparable and better to a double bundle also with a double bundle if it fails then you have a bigger problem for doing revisions which is why i think in those patients or those indications where rotatory instability was considered a problem to correct with a single bundle we now have the extra articular tenodesis technique which is either by the modified ellison the modified lamer or by the all type of reconstruction which uh, is extremely useful and takes care of that problem the last question to the all the panel is that uh, what is the real indication of notch plasty whether we can decide pre operatively or on the table notch plasty for me it's an intra operative decision most often it is required in chronically neglected acl deficient knees where the notch has become stenotic in these situations you do a conservative notch plasty enough for you to see the posterior margin of the uh femoral notch and then depending on the graft size then you would either uh, keep it at that or you would want to increase the size depending on the size of the graft but i think the require for a requirement for a notch plasty has reduced substantially uh since we shifted from the bone patella tendon bone to the hamstrings in uh, earlier days i think notch plasty was done as a routine part of all acl reconstructive procedures but today it is very very selectively done thank you uh
my question to all the panelists so uh, this is regarding uh, the uh, position of the anterior medial and posterior lateral bundle for a single bundle anatomic reconstruction where exactly uh, do you make the pilot hole to start with whether right at the bifurcate ridge or towards slightly towards the am side what is the current consensus where do you make the pilot femoral, hole where should you start in the femoral side on the femoral side where you should start on the femoral fem femur side on the femoral side uh, considering the bundle positions am and pl and position of the bifurcate ridge where exactly uh, do we start the pilot hole this starting guide personally i have never used the bifurcate ridge uh, as a reference point uh, when i have been doing my acls i always look at the native footprint of the native acl and i use that footprint that footprint basically i look at it in uh, relation with the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus so if you read a couple of articles they say that the distance from the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus uh, and the posterior margin of the intercondylar notch so i want the femoral tunnel to be as low and as posterior as possible uh, when i am drilling it and i really don't look at the uh, eminences so if you want the to look at the eminences you will have to remove all the soft tissue uh, in the intercondylar notch and then look at that so you try to uh, the uh, footprint on the femoral side is big so you try to be in the center of the the, in the center footprint. of the footprint so, ashish sir the most important thing you must peep from the medial portal for that reason then only you can see the footprint and its center don't just try to peep in from the lateral portal and just uh, thinking that you are seeing the exact footprint and the center that's the one thing so i just try to from the medial portal you can find the center and of course you have to remain posterior and inferior this is the basic crux and i never hesitate in using my jig and it's very comfortable if you use a jig at least you are not going to make any major mistake so, so this is what i do and i must go posteriorly i have to clean everything 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 till my jig sits into it so most of the times i am happy with that and uh, there is no problem with that so you you need to you have to leave that sleeve of a few millimeter posteriorly <laughs> of the bone how much is that sleeve it's a big knee than 7 millimeter it's a smaller or your graft size also decides how much you can use it so accordingly 7 millimeter or 6 millimeter these are the standard things that you have to do if it's a, smaller then you have to use your brain for that reason amit joshi sir uh mo most of the time right at the center of the footprint that is visible uh, you see if you understand the you know history of how the tunnel position on the femoral side has changed earlier in transportal it was right up then people started saying that it has to be right just above the cartilage and posterior now they are saying that probably somewhere between the superior and the inferior at the middle but the good indicator or good uh, you know indicator of where your tunnel should be is the footprint try to find out the footprint do a little bit of debridement and find out the footprint right at the center of the footprint will be fine some studies have suggested that uh, staying little bit on the anterior medial side uh, reduces the tension on the graft because uh, that is a uh, more of an isometric position for the acl so sachin sachin sir what is your take on that i'm sorry on what take on the footprint position little little bit towards the am bundle side so you have to be uh, i would prefer to be more deep and uh, at the site uh, as dr joshi has mentioned so i would not go to the center of the footprint because doing a center to center has demonstrated a slightly higher failure rate especially in athletes not so many in north and non athletes so more towards the am so go more deep rather than shallow is the preferred location also in terms of high and low previously we were more low and now we are slightly higher towards the resident's ridge or the lateral intercondylar ridge where we can gain access to the direct insertion fibers of the acl so on the ridge and more deep 
so more towards little bit towards the am bundle side correct absolutely correct dr vinay uh, joshi sir you highlighted that uh, posterior horn uh, posterior root tier of middle meniscus is somehow over treated so we don't need to sometimes we do a repair but that centralization doesn't happen on extension the meniscus still extrudes out so what do you do about it so you just leave it like this or do a centralization stage or something like that when i select the patient for a root repair i basically want to uh, select patients with minimal extrusion those who are already extruded i don't believe that the root repair is ever going to bring the meniscus back into place because i think by that time the coronary ligaments and the capsule which are also holding the meniscus in position are already stretched out so hoping that my couple of stitches in the root are going to uh, correct the plastic deformation of my capsule is uh, too much of uh, expectation from my repairs although i also i don't believe in people who say that you can uh, tether the root by drilling a tunnel in the tibia which is now being extensively uh, pro propagated uh, and i have seen disastrous results of that where we have seen that the articular cartilage on the tibia has been extensively eroded just to fix the root to the mid midpoint of its body by passing multiple sutures and we have seen uh, destruction of articular cartilage not only on the tibial side but also on the femoral side because the high tensile suture material so i think the meniscus no doubt is important but i think at a point when the articular cartilage is completely destroyed the root is not going to restore the articular cartilage so any any time limit for that that after this much time i will not think about the root something like that my question to all the panelists the sawal pucha no timeline I think, timeline i think i don't uh, have a timeline i want to basically take into account all factors that are associated with the degeneration of the knee i want to look at the state of the articular cartilage the alignment uh, and uh, whether the patient's uh, patient is able to tolerate the extensive immobilization and the non weight bearing that is involved after a root repair because very often we have patients with bilateral significant varus deformity and very often you have repaired the root on one side and they start complaining of complaints on the other side which was normal so you need to consider that these patients have to be on crutches for 4 to 6 weeks and if they have a varus you you are going to uh, treat one side and create problem on the other side so i think all these things have to be factored in when you are thinking of a root repair people are going overboard trying to repair these roots so uh, would you uh, mind because uh, we have another session meet the master we can have more questions in that session we are running little late so please excuse i will take your all questions just after 10 minutes maybe thank you so much and thank you all the panelists for being here for the quick q and r answer question session i would request dr anand joshi please stay back because dr anand joshi has to go early so i have requested dr vinay pandey thank you very much for uh, shifting your talk later and uh, we are taking talk of dr anand joshi before your talk and uh, dr anand joshi he will be taking talk on uh, current concepts medial side in knee injuries my treatment algorithm this is wonderful uh, subject because those who are not doing orthoscopic surgery it may interest them so please be very attentive thank you and please welcome dr anand joshi Thank you.
As I mentioned earlier in my talk, that at Sportsmate we work as a team. So I do only the simple stuff. And the complex stuff is done by all my by my colleagues. So if you have any complex questions, then maybe we'll ask them on the phone line. I'll have to like Amitabh Bachchan, I'll have to ask for a call somebody uh, to <laughs> answer your queries. So <laughs> When it comes to uh, basically a combination of arthroscopic and open surgery, I think teamwork is extremely essential. And uh, that is what we have achieved at Sportsmed. We have got a wonderful team which works together so that our operating time is uh, well under control. Now, one of the commonest uh, ligaments which is injured around the knee is, of course, the medial collateral ligament. But when we talk about medial sided injuries of the knee, we should not be confining our attention only to the MCL because the MCL, the superficial and the deep are just components of the entire medial side, which also entails involvement of the capsule right from the midline, uh, starting from the superior uh, uh, superficial MCL, going right up to the anterior margin of the PCL. So the semimembranosus with, the, with its expansions and the capsular thickenings around the posteromedial corner of the knee are also uh, to be considered when we are talking about medial sided injuries of the knee. Now the occurrence of these injuries are anywhere between 3 to 8 percent and these may occur in isolation or in combination with cruciate injuries, the most common being a combined ACL and an MCL injury which we commonly see in practice. So when there is a direct blow on the outside of the knee, where the foot is planted and there is a direct valgus stress on the knee, it is commonly the superficial and the deep MCL which are affected. However, if there is a valgus strain which is coupled with tibial rotation, then it is the posterior oblique ligament, the POL, which is more affected, commonly affected than just the MCL. Or, so the mechanism of injury is quite important to understand and combined injuries can have a variety of patterns which may be contact or non-contact. So why are these injuries important uh, for diagnosis and management? If we ignore these injuries, uh, we realize that there could be subtle, the patient may come to you with subtle instability. And if it is just an isolated MCL uh, or a, a POL, they will come to you with an instability which is not really anteroposterior, but they may feel that the leg is moving sideways. Secondly, if you have done an ACL reconstruction, then this is one of the factors which may lead to early failure of the ACL graft. So the evaluation should be done by using all uh, your uh, usual uh, methods of examination, clinical, radiographic, and arthroscopic. Now, this is a classical uh, case where this uh, patient came to us and said that while he was walking on the street, uh, something hit him from outside and uh, he almost fell on the road and he has uh, pain on the inner aspect of the knee. So that is the diagnosis and usually these people will point specifically to the medial side of the knee and uh, show you where the injury is. Now, this patient is also telling us something else that whenever he is lying on the side and trying to lift his leg up, he feels that the uh, tibia is sliding down. So, this again tells you that this is a classic medial sided injury. This patient was very expressive and he could uh, tell you all uh, the uh, symptoms that he was experiencing. And with the leg unsupported, again, he felt that the leg was uh, almost uh, shifting uh, laterally. So after you have listened to the history of the patient, when you start examining the patient, one thing to remember is again the alignment. And patients who have a valgus uh, knee uh, alignment, you need to be more aggressive in them when treating the MCL than people who have a varus knee, which are better protected against the MCL uh, instability or laxity. Then we come to palpation, one must do uh, palpation, uh, making sure that you palpate the tibial side, the femoral side and the mid substance of the MCL. 
and also palpate the uh, pol uh, posteriorly as well as the tendons of the semi membranosus because injuries have been known to uh, affect the pol in quite a few cases uh, for me the tap sign is very important and this tells me the severity of the injury so very often i will uh, tap the femoral and the tibial sides of the uh, mcl and the way the patient reacts to your tapping can tell you how much the injury could be severe so this is you go by history taking then com coming to palpation you palpate the various uh, points on the knee and then when you talk about laxity te testing you uh, can uh, we normally use the feto and marshall grading where grade 1 is there no valgus laxity grade 2 is valgus at 30 degrees of flexion and grade 3 is uh, which so shows that the injury is more severe is in extension so if there is a valgus opening in extension you know that it is not just the mcl it is the mcl and the pol and in some cases uh, it is also the cruciate ligaments that may be involved in a grade 3 opening of the knee so opening in, in extension is mcl plus or minus uh, pol opening in uh, 30 degrees of flexion is just an isolated mcl injury so sometimes when you are examining the patient it is difficult to differentiate whether the opening is occurring on the medial side or is it a lateral opening and therefore one of the things to do is hang the uh, leg by the side of the table and feel the joint line while you are doing varus and valgus testing and this helps you differentiate between whether the opening is on the medial side or the lateral side the drawer test of course should be done whenever you are wanting to check the cruciates you will do a drawer test but this should not only be done in neutral but also in external rotation because if there is increase in translation with external rotation you know that the posterior medial corner of the knee is affected and if it tightens up in uh, internal rotation then you uh, that ascertains your confirms your diagnosis that the injury is on the posterior medial side plain x rays uh, can show you if there are any avulsions or bony avulsions or if there is uh, any pellegrina stridas uh, which is commonly associated with uh, heterotopic ossification which is associated with mcl injuries stress x rays we normally uh, don't tend uh, don't do stress x rays but uh, wherever we feel that uh, there is a doubt uh, in confirming the extent of opening i think you can do stress x rays but they should ideally be done under anesthesia and we can do this under cm guidance so you can dynamically assess the amount of uh, stress that opens up the joint so the gradation of the injury can be done by stress testing but ideally done under anesthesia and hence it is not routinely done mri of course is extremely useful it not only it shows you the extent of the injury to the uh, uh, mcl but also if there are associated injuries a lot of bone contusion patterns are associated with uh, a lot of these uh, collateral and cruciate injuries and one can almost identify the injuries looking at the uh, pattern of the bone contusion on an mri uh, so the mri is useful in uh, lo locating the size and the extent of the tear now this is the normal algorithm which we follow at our clinic if a patient comes to us with an acute mcl injury and it is an isolated injury if it is a grade 1 and 2 it is conservative treatment it is grade 3 in a valgus knee or there is a bony avulsion or mcl entrapment then we would go for a immediate uh, intervention and a repair with augmentation and in the chronic so what should raise the red flag when you are looking at the medial sided injuries so severe valgus bone avulsions and mcl entrapments these are places where you would like to do early intervention combined mcl and acl is a bit controversial our take on this is we always conserve the mcl in ma majority of the places and do a delayed acl reconstruction after the patient has got full range of motion and this may take anywhere between 6 uh, to 8 weeks or even 12 weeks 
for the patient to get full range of motion. This is very important because we have seen that patients who have been uh, operated in a hurry when the MCL has not healed has landed have landed up with severe joint stiffness and it is extremely difficult to then rectify it and get back their range of motion. So in very selected patients where the MCL injury does not seem to be uh, that hot, if you can call it, and the ACL has gone from the femoral side, we have done uh, an ACL repair along with an MCL repair or a reattachment. But these instances are very uh, low. I think in majority of the patients, we do a conservative MCL in most patients. Now, unfortunately, what we have seen amongst our orthopedic colleagues is that conservative treatment means either do nothing or put the patient in a plaster cast for six weeks and then see what happens to the knee. But that is not what conservative treatment is all about. I think conservative treatment is making sure that you aid and do not disrupt the healing of the MCL. We offer, uh, if the patient has a lot of swelling and he has instability on weight bearing, you may have to put him on crutches for a couple of days or weeks. So we uh, put a padding under the knee to relax the MCL and the posterior medial capsule. And this may be there for about uh, 10 days to two weeks. Once that has happened, then we give them a hinge knee brace to prevent any valgus strain on the knee. And we emphasize on range of motion, which is not forcible. You make sure that your physiotherapist colleagues do not do any kind of massage or ultrasonic therapy because we have seen that this aggravates uh, the symptoms on the uh, medial side. Because these people very often will land up with severe quad weakness by the end of your treatment, we emphasize on paradigm stimulation of the quadriceps as soon as we are putting them on uh, non-operative treatment. And the most important thing is if you find that the patient has grade 3 laxity on day 1, keep on doing serial evaluation of these patients after a week or 10 days because very often you will be surprised that most of them will come up and they uh, may sorry not for interruption. At all. Sorry, sorry for interruption. May I request the, uh, there is a lot of noise from the back. This is very important talk and this is for everyone. Those who are doing orthoscopy and those who are not. This is very important. Kindly be li little quiet for some time. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Uh, so uh, most of us wonder where grade 3 MCLs can really heal and give us the desired results. Now here is an example of a patient. He is a mixed martial arts uh, patient who had this MCL injury. It was a, uh, like a contact injury and this was his MRI uh, picture. And somebody would have uh, thought that this should be operated immediately. However, on serial evaluation of this patient, we found that the knee was gumming up and we, it was not opening up to that extent. And surprisingly, this is the result at the end of three months following conservative treatment of MCL. So I think one need not rush into surgery of the MCL because one of the other problems that you could have is heterotopic ossification after operating on the MCL. So some of these results can be very good. The tap sign is, I think, very important because it tells me how much of bone edema is likely to be there when I'm tapping on the MCL. Now, this lady had a valgus external rotation injury with an MCL and an ACL. When I tapped, she was in a lot of pain. This was what her uh, MRI was showing that there was significant amount of edema of the MCL. Now, these patients you should never touch uh, early because they will end up with severe heterotopic ossification because this is what we have seen happening in patients. And these patients can never get back their range of motion and probably have to undergo multiple surgeries to get uh, to restore range of motion. So I think clinical radiological is extremely important and serial evaluation in the MCL injury. Intervention will be required in certain situations like this tibial sided so-called Steiner's lesion where the tibial side MCL is completely curled up and this is not going to heal. So in these patients, you may have to do a refixation along with maybe augmentation of the uh, tibial MCL and this is what we have done here. So this is the stability on the table after uh, fixation of a tibial uh, uh, injury of the MCL. This is a medial sided repair which we have done in a farmer 
who had a MCL, posteromedial capsular injury, ACL and PCL. After repairing everything, especially on the medial side, along with the capsule, which very often is ruptured right from the anterior to the posterior, this is the kind of stability this farmer got and he did not consider undergoing any further surgeries and he was perfectly normal just by repairing these extra articular tissues. So I think these injuries are very important if you treat them in the right fashion on in the acute stage, you can get excellent results. Another case of an entrapped MCL and a medial meniscus bucket. Now here you could not reduce the uh, knee because the MCL, the medial meniscus was entrapped and so also the, so this is uh, a test which has been uh, described as the sucking test uh, for the MCL where you fe feel that the MCL is entrapped inside. And you can see here on the abnormal side that there is something like a dimple on the medial side. And this is a sucking test which is uh, for this kind of a condition. During arthroscopic evaluation, we found that there was an entrapped ACL and a medial meniscus bucket. We reduced the bucket handle and then we uh, did an open uh, repair of all the structures. Uh, so you start from the deeper structures, repair the meniscus back into place, then the deep MCL followed by the superficial MCL. And very often you have to augment this either uh, with uh, some polyester tapes uh, rather than sacrificing any of the hamstring grafts on the medial side. So these are the primary repair and augmentation methods that we follow in our clinic. We use the standards procedure where the semitendinosis can be kept attached at the TBL side, looped along the medial epicondyle and reattached, uh, rerouted back and can be fixed back. And this can be done in the acute stage as a part of a repair and augmentation procedure. Coming to the chronic injuries, I think these again can be isolated or combined in the isolated valgus instability, if it is grade two, we prefer what is known as a POL zone specific advancement technique. And this is commonly done in people with low demand. And I'll show you what we mean by this. In grade three, of course, you will uh, need to do some kind of a reconstruction. And this could be both anatomic or non-anatomic. So I will uh, quickly show you what are the differences between the two. So when you have combined uh, instabilities because of the cruciate and the uh, collateral and the capsule, I think one needs to go mainly for anatomic kind of reconstruction, uh, especially in the high demand individual. So what do we mean by zone specific advancement of the POL? If you look arthroscopically in the knee and you find that the distance between the meniscus and the femur is more, then you have to do advancement more from the on the femoral side of the POL. And if the uh, opening is more on the inferior side of the uh, meniscus, then you have to do a tibial sided uh, advancement. So here you can see that zone one and two are the places you will advance when there is a femoral side detachment or uh, opening and grade three, four and five. Uh, are the zones where you would do a tibial sided advancement of the POL. The various kind of reconstructions that we see are the single bundle anatomical reconstruction, the double bundle non-anatomical, the double bundle anatomical. We feel that the double bundle anatomical, although an excellent procedure, uh, may result in too many uh, myriad of tunnels in a tibia leading to a lot of tunnel coalition and hence once need to be adequately trained uh, to do these kind of anatomic reconstructions uh, for the combined instabilities. Now, this is, these are examples of non-anatomic reconstructions where basically you are reconstructing the superficial and deep MCL and the POL using the semitendinosis uh, graft. And this is an example of the non-anatomic reconstruction. Our experience, uh, you can do minimally non-anatomic also by taking uh, just skin incisions. But I think if you want to do a proper job, it is better to do a proper open uh, procedure than, than going for minimally invasive procedures. We have limited experience with uh, the Laprade technique. Uh, 
uh, where you have to use multiple graphs and use uh, uh, drill multiple tunnels to create uh, both the pol and the superficial and uh, deep mcl uh, this requires a lot of graphs uh, not just a lot of graphs but also a lot of tunneling and if you have something like a bicruciate injury along with a medial sided injuries uh, we prefer to do uh, the acl and pcl the regular way and uh, do a non anatomic uh, reconstruction on the medial side to avoid the uh, tunneling and the implants uh, that are involved in the anatomic uh, procedure so this is our uh, anatomic uh, laprad uh, reconstruction anatomic mcl uh, reconstruction medial sided reconstruction so i think these are injuries which should not be neglected uh, as they may lead to symptomatic instability or early failure and comprehensive evaluation of these injuries involves uh, both clinical uh, radiologic and arthroscopic uh, modalities to be used thank you very much thank thank you sir uh, please stay back on the dais because you will be later on addressing the meet the master and may i request the, the organizers please honor the chairperson thank Hello, you sir Hello, sir Hello. please wait here okay can i call uh, dr rajin nath sir sir please come on the dais and felicitate uh, professor gyanan singh sir and i'll call dr rp johri sir so please come on the dais and felicitate uh, gobin sethi sir Uh, now can i quickly uh, meet the master because we are running short of time can i request all the speakers to be on the dais once again dr vinay dr kd dr amit joshi dr ashish kumar sir please be on the dais and quickly i can request all the delegates to be uh, come with the questions dr rajiv agrawal please and dr anupam please Ajay, Ajay, please, please come. Because we are running short of time. So this question is a new, new introduction to our schedule. This is meet the master. You can ask from any session any question, and can rather this is rapid fire type of session. Please come with the all questions. So there are fifteen minutes for this session. Please be ready with the questions. Thank you, sir. So my question is uh, to Dr. Anand Joshi. Dr. Joshi, sir. My question is uh, whether we have to do uh, reconstructions of ACL in all the cases, or we can uh, conserve and uh, we can do conservative treatment without reconstructions. And what is the timing of doing ACL reconstruction in patients? with acute injury so i really don't operate on the acutely injured acl in uh, any of the situations because i feel that along with the acl you have extensive uh, bruising on the lateral femoral condyle the lateral tpl plateau you can have in associated injuries like uh, to the mcl 
So for me, a safe time to operate on an acutely injured ACL is when the knee is not swollen, when the patient has full range of motion, his gait is normal and his muscle control is good. Now, this depends on the severity of the initial injury and may take anywhere between three weeks to even 12 weeks for me to decide on whether the patient needs surgery or not. So, the minimum time that the patient waits before he undergoes surgery is three weeks. The next thing is, I don't believe that everyone needs an ACL reconstruction because we see that the pattern of ACL tears vary significantly. In some patients, the ACL on the MRI looks edematous and it is not completely uh, detached from either end or it's not a mid-substance rupture. And therefore, in these patients, I feel that there is a possibility, just as we knew that in PCL, there can be restoration of PCL fibers. We have seen this similarly happening in ACL. And therefore, we do serial examination of the knee, even in the ACL cases. And if we feel that the lacman is reducing and the patient's symptoms do not uh, show any sign of instability, then we just keep them under observation and tell them to restrict their sporting activities, go on with their regular day-to-day uh, -day activities. Because very often people are sitting at home because their ACL is injured, but that doesn't have to be done. And with a protective bracing, uh, and then serial examination is what helped me decide whether this patient definitely needs an ACL reconstruction or not. What you must also remember is that in a young patient, if the patient has, in addition to the ACL and a, 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 crucial, a, a meniscal injury, then in those patients, I would definitely be more aggressive than patients who have just isolated ACLs. Because the meniscal stare is likely to uh, increase and I don't want a repairable meniscus to be an irreparable meniscus just because of my uh, being uh, uh, slow in decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Dr. Nirve, Dr. Anupam, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question to all the panelists, we are so much confused about the using the implant at the tibial side. It is it should be the bio screw or the metal titanium screw. What the consensus says? Dr. Asis. Bio screw or metal screw. So, a lot of peer pressure, a lot of company pressure, a lot of patient pressure. So, we all have suffered with the allergic reaction and the complication that we observe, cyst formation, so many things with the bio screw. Now, people have come up with the peak screw, somewhere in between, neither metal nor uh, bio. So it is not seen on the x-ray. Your wrong deeds are not seen on the x-rays. So, but for all practical purposes, titanium screws have got excellent results. There's no confusion. It is because of all these reasons we are using these bio screws. This is a rare thing that you have to drill through the screw and such case, titanium screw you can very well remove also and can go ahead with the things. Dr. So, Sachin, what is your view, sir? So I think, uh, you know, the newer generation bio screws are as good as your peak or your titanium screws. The least amount of osteolysis will be with a titanium screw followed by a peak screw. Bio screws are apparently supposed to slowly disintegrate and bone is supposed to reform, which usually does not happen. The HA and the TCP, which is provided within the bio screw, is uh, okay. They say it is for bio osteo induction and uh, uh, osteo induction and uh, osteogenesis. But the real reason why there is HA and uh, TCP in the screw is to neutralize the acid, which is the PGA or the PGLA. So, if you ask me, uh, what type of screw should you use? I think if it is very strong bone, then always use a titanium screw. Otherwise, a bio screw is good enough and there is no difference technically between the uh, outcomes if you use either a titanium or a bio screw. But if you're using a bio screw, 
make sure that there is either HA or TCP. It is a third generation screw so that there is no uh, osteolysis. So a small bone, he says, uh, the use titanium Soft. and the normal bone use bio screw. Sir, Dr. Anand Joshi, sir, what is your view, sir? Final, final say on it. No experience with bio screw. So <laughs> the story is very the clear. Is... The master says <laughs> he has not and used the bio screw. So nothing, no further second, discussion on this topic. My second question is the position in fixation of the screw. Uh, the flexion position is we used to do is 15 to 20 degree of the flexion at knee while fixing the TVL screw. Uh, or it is once it is a suspensory fixation, it's needed to be fixed in a flexion position or it should be in a uh, neutral position. Is the question clear to you, sir? Is the question clear to you, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what is the position of the knee question when you fix the fixation, TVL screw? Yeah. Position, uh, ideal position. So it is, uh, you know, you can do it 15 to 20 degree of knee flexion. That is the ideal position of fixation of the TBL. Yeah. It, it is not important that you are using which device. Yeah. It is the isometry and the length of the graft and the position while you are tightening. So you have to follow that 10 to 15 degree. So that you are going, either you fix with the suture disc or you are fixing with the bio screw that heart or any screw. Right. It hardly matters. It's the length of the graft in what position you are having the shortest length with the isometry. That's why you are doing a 10 to 15 degree of flexion. Sometimes it is a 7 mm graft. Then we are very apprehensive that we have to take the grassless also to make it more in a big thicker size. But it uh, does say 7 mm is enough to fix it. Reconstruct the ACL. Maximum size of the graft. He says so, uh, for me, yeah. for me, the minimum size of the graft is um, eight, eight mm. Eight mm. I do not consider. Eight, mm. eight is the standard one. Eight is if it is less than that, then augmentation with the fiber tape, something like if, that. If if you could uh, fetch only seven mm graft, will you delay the physical walking or weight bearing? There's so many things. What is the BMI of the patient? For which patient you are having a, a, a fat lady with a 7 mm graft, lot of weight, lot of fat, then you most have to of, be slow. Most often the fat persons have got thinner grafts. Yes, it so, happens. And oh, weight, weight is more, graft is less. You have, you have peroneus longus for them. So, so that is why you use various techniques to increase the size of the graft, you know, like surfboard, so, triplication, quadruple, pentuple, even hexaple, so that you get an adequate size of the so graph. So in those cases, would you prefer to use for one fiber tape if the graft I, is thin? I, I personally do not use fiber tape. I'll rather harvest another one graft so that I can increase the size. Will you take the graft from the other side also? Not necessarily. I can use quartz in addition to the from the same string, side. use gracilis. But most of the time, you know, if you have semi T and hamstring, if you hexaple them, and do all inside ACL reconstruction or use a suspensory fixation in the TVL side as well, you'll, you'll be able to get more than 8 millimeter graft most of the time. So same side, but he'll not go less than 8 millimeter. So this is the final verdict for this question, I think. Is Anand it sir, okay? Or Dr. Vina, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, uh, Anand sir, uh, uh, quite a few videos were showing you using fiber tape. Today, a uh, lot of videos had this fiber tape alongside ACL. So have you shifted towards this fiber tape along with the ACL fixation or, but you showed video also of complications with that. So what's your take? Either you're using fiber tapes or you're not using. Dr. Anand Joshi, sir. So I think it, in the recent times, in the past six months or so, I think we have gone away from using the fiber tape. We were using it, uh, I think more freely earlier, but after seeing these reactions uh, to the fiber tape, I think I've become a little bit more cautious. He says he found a lot of uh, reactions for fiber tape. So, uh, so the problem uh, is, uh, unfortunately, in uh, the scientific community, when you report something which is negative, it can never be published. And therefore, you will see only positive results of all these augmentation devices. You will not see negative. But uh, from your own personal experiences, I think you need to change your course of the procedure that you're doing, depending on your experiences and not wait for the rest of the world to, 
to tell you that this was not the right way. Ashish sir, I think you uh, are a proponent of using fiber tape. Huh? Sachin sir, what's your take on that? Uh, using fiber tape alongside ACL? Not at all. Absolutely not. So, so the verdict is please avoid using fiber tape. Is that okay? Thank you. Intra-articular, of course, because it can then, give then some how, reaction. Uh, like if it is 7 or 6 mm, then how you do you take the glycylis along with that and uh, supplement it? So he says, Dr. Amit Joshi says, do not compromise for the thickness of the graft, but do not use artificial things to make it thick. Next question, please. Sir, what is the ideal time to get MRI after an acute injury? After an acute injury, what is the ideal ideal time to get an MRI? Anytime. Anytime. No. I think uh, you are asking because there were some in some paper, some literature, it is said that if you do early MRI, then you will see the vivid picture of the knee and then exaggerated injury label. So, but you see understanding of what you are looking at it, uh, the presence of hematoma acts as an enhancer of your injury, you know, like in shoulder. So, probably if there is indication for surgery, I'm not hesitant to do MRI on the same day or next day. But if there are no indication for doing early MRI, I'll let the patient be quiet because it is painful process, you know, doing 45 minutes of MRI. So let it be quiet for one or two days, three days, 72 hours, the need goes down and get an MRI done. Quality of machines has also changed now. It is not the old saying that you should wait till everything subsides, edema subsides. You may miss certain things which you are going for the immediate repair. So it's not very pertinent to the today's MRI and everything that you delay it till edema subsides. So would you like to wait for ACLR to be done after the injury because you find a lot of blood inside and your vision is hampered? What is your view, sir? Or you will go immediately after the injury? Blood, blood is getting washed off. That's not the issue. What Dr. Joshi has said that when your knee is quiet, you can start with the exercises so on the day So what is that two. quiet That's period? It. When do you think it is quiet, sir? Variable. Sir, how do you decide that now the knee is quiet, sir? Dr. Anand Joshi, sir? I think, uh, as I mentioned before, that the patient should not have a swollen knee. Uh, so no swelling. Uh, so patient should not be limping. There should not be any extensive bone bruising on the MRI. Bony? bone bruising on the MRI, patient uh, should have full range of motion and muscle control should be good. Excellent, sir. This is great help to all of us uh, how to decide the quiet knee. This is very, very important basic knowledge which Dr. Anandosi has given. Next question, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, a young soldier who's just 31 years old, he's actively involved in all hilly terrains and his straight job is the same. Sustained uh, injury with ACL and bucket handle lateral meniscus. I went inside. First, I uh, thought of doing the lateral meniscus. I tried to do, but while putting all inside technique with the fast tricks, uh, after doing the first fire, I could not. Be, I was not able to take the complete loop. But still, I tried to retrieve it and made a second fire. While doing the second fire, most of the fibers were torn, sir. Eventually, I tied it, but could not achieve that bump of meniscus. And then uh, made us entry with second pass fix. Please, please make the question short, sir. sir. sir we are I running short of time. If I am unable to repair lateral meniscus completely and some fiber has to be sacrificed, what do we done in this young soldier? I think uh, you have repairable and irreparable tears. So, unfortunately, in this case, it has become iatrogenically non-repairable. Yes, sir. So, you have to trim it because there is no point in uh, leaving a deformed meniscus inside the knee. Yes, sir. So, basically, you can trim a part of the meniscus which has, has been deformed and retain the remaining, the rim. Uh, of course, it's very important in a young soldier to have the lateral meniscus and lateral meniscus tears do heal very well. Yes. But these are some technical issues where you can have problems and one needs uh, to do something which is a bit more drastic. Sir, Anand, sir. Sir, sir, only... Anand, sir. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think uh, let me let should we should have only two questions more, sir, and then we have to. No, Doctor Sethi from sir. London and uh, Doctor Chandan, our secretary, please. Uh, regarding the ramp repair, so what uh, angle of uh, suture lasso do you recommend? Suture hook use. This is forty-five degree. Forty-five degree right and left. So you take the bite from uh, both the sides, posterior, anterior, simultaneously, or you have to shuttle because taking the bite uh, with both the uh, side of the tear, it's different. So one by one is good, I think. It, it is technical issue. It depends. If you can take bite with one single go, it's better to take bite with one single go because this That's reduces the time of surgery. Because along with the ramp, you have to do ACL reconstruction as well. So if you are not able to take a bite with a single go, then you, you can take it in two goes. What is harm in that? So use two posterior medial portals or? Posterior. I, two, I two use transeptal. Yes, I use posterior medial and the um, anterior lateral portal. So anybody taking posterior lateral as well to visualize? Yeah. You can use the transportal technique if you find that you are you have to take uh, you know, shuttling of the sutures, etc. If you want to make it easy and not take two portals on the posteromedial side, you can do two portals also with two cannulas, one superior, one inferior. Or if you don't want to have suture entanglement, you can do a transportal technique, take out uh, sutures from the lateral side as well, and then retrieve all of them on the medial side. Dr. Sethi, please. Uh, the things could be loud and clear. I think I'll talk to you. I Please be loud. Please. There should not be any rush in doing uh, ACL reconstruction. We don't even start seeing patients or managing it within the first three weeks. Let it quieten up. No need even to do an MRI. We never know. He may not need an MRI. It may be another injury, probably hematosis of secondary cause rather than ACL. And as rightly said, one should not have a flexion deformity before he gets to an ACL. Get them into a physio. The problem only comes in when there's a bucket handle tear middle meniscus with an ACL. What will you there? You can't leave him. You can't do that. We tend to do it. Go ahead and reduce it if we can. If not, surgically reduce it and uh, uh, rather repair it. Don't go for ACL. Go back again in six weeks time. What's your thought about that, sir? In a bucket handle tear, middle meniscus, ACL injury, we can't wait for bucket handle six weeks. We need to do that. So what we tend to do it, I want to make sure, are we doing right or wrong? We try to reduce it if we can in ED or repair it, but go back and do ACL after six weeks. But we don't let them mobilize because we don't want the repair to be undone. Put them into a brace, wait for six weeks. What are your thoughts about that? I think majority of the stuff uh, being done at NHS is wrong. So I just wanted to know that. What's your experience? <laughs> I think uh, what we are doing is much better. If we have a uh, bucket handle with an ACL, we would tackle both together at the same time. Okay. Because if you repair the meniscus and if the instability continues, the bucket is likely to fail and it might come in before you do the ACL. Yeah. So we don't allow them movement. So we put them into a brace. Six weeks, we, go. we don't allow them, unlike ACL, where you want to mobilize, but we don't allow them. We put them in six weeks. Is there anything different you do? You would probably do. We'll, we'll do everything at the same time. One shot. Okay. Thank you. I can understand. There's a lot of uh, hunger for the questions because the faculty is so learned, so auspicious. But we cannot go on the session. We'll ask the questions in the maybe the lunch time. Thank you very much, and thank you very much the faculty uh, for answering all the meet the master. Uh, thank you so very much. Please. And may I request organizers to be uh, ready for the uh, inauguration function? Thank you, sir. Please take your seat. Thank you, sir. इनवोकेशन शुरू करो अजीत
Good afternoon, everyone. So I'd request everyone, please be seated on the chairs. We are going to start uh, inauguration function very soon. Humble request to all the delegates, please be seated and please make a silence. I'll request our Honorable President, Uttar Pradesh Arthropodic Association, Dr. Asis Kumar, sir, please come on the dais. Please give a big clap. I'll request our chief guest, Dr. Anand Joshi, sir. Dr. Anand Joshi, sir, please come on the dais. So please come on the desk. I'll request guest of honor, Professor A.K. Gupta, sir. So please come on the desk. Now I'll request our organizing chairperson of Kanpur Arthropodic, or Kanpur Arthroscopy course, Dr. R.K. Singh, sir, please come on the desk. Now I'll request our organizing secretary of uh, Kanpur Arthroscopy course, 
डॉक्टर ए के अग्रवाल सर प्लीज कम एड्रेस नाइ रिक्वेस्ट सेक्रेटरी कानपुर आर्थोपेडिक एसोसिएशन डॉक्टर चंदन कुमार so i i request dr chandan kumar sir please uh, uh, give a caller to the president presidential caller to ak agrawal sir i request professor rajendra nath sir our senior sir sir please come and uh, do the saraswati vandana you wish to invoke uh, goddess saraswati on this occasion because we have been listening to the learned talks since morning and we need to assimilate that may god goddess saraswati give us power to assimilate the knowledge that you have provided to us since morning we also invoke uh, goddess saraswati to get if to give a feeling of nationality which is lacking in in us which is lacking recently so much so we want to be involved with love to our motherland ai vimal vasne alula it kuntale श्री शारदे राष्ट्रीय वीनातनिक कृपया हे जननी झनकार दे अनुनाद हा हृत तंत्रियों में ध्वनित हो जावे तथा प्रतिरोम में चैतन्य पूरित हो जगे हम सर्वदा तो ये मातृभूमि वंदना अब मैं कहने चाहता हूं अपनी तरफ से हिम कुधर किरीटे जान विहार शुभ्रे परिकर शुचि विंध्या लंकृते रत्न गर्भे और डिस्क्राइबिंग और मदर डे describing our bharat mata him kudhar kirite jan vihar shubhre parikar suti vindhya lankrute ratn garbhe salil nidhi susaivye dhaut pada divye vasumati survande मातृभूमि नमस्ते थैंक यू सर आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल द डिग्निटीज एंड डायस प्लीज कम फॉरवर्ड फॉर द लैम्प लाइटिंग जय गणेश जय गणेश जय गणेश देवा माता जाती पार्वती पिता
से की सवारी पान चढ़े फूल चढ़े और चढ़े मेवा लड्डूअन का भोग लगे संत करे सेवा गणेश जय गणेश जय गणेश Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So now, now we will have a small felicitation program. Now, I'll, I'll now I'll request Dr. Uh, A. K. Agrawal sir to uh, felicitate Dr. Uh, Asis Agrawal sir or uh, Asis Kumar sir, our UPOA president, by a memento and a small token of appreciation. I'll request Dr. Ashish Kumar sir to uh, felicitate our chief guest, Dr. Anand Joshi sir. Anand Joshi sir. I'll request Dr. R.K. Singh, sir, to give a uh, fellow state to uh, Professor A.K. Gupta, sir. I'll request Dr. Chandan. Uh, to felicitate A.K. Grawal, sir, KOA president. I'll request Dr. K.D. Tripathi, sir, please come on the dais. And Dr. A.K. Grawal, sir, please felicitate K.D. Tripathi, sir. I'll request Dr. Amit Joshi, sir, please come on the dais. Dr. Senga, sir, Prof. Senga, sir, please come on the dais and felicitate Amit Joshi, sir. Uh, Dr. Amit Joshi, ka special thanks, sir, because he has drove from a very, very long distance. I'll request Dr. Binay Pandey, sir, please come on the desk. Binay Pandey, sir. And Dr. Govind Sethi, sir, please come on the desk and felicitate Dr. Binay Pandey. I request Dr. Pankas Tendon, sir, please come on the desk and felicitate our dynamic secretary, Chandan Kumar, sir.
just last one. So I'll, I'll request uh, Dr. R.K. Singh, sir, uh, Dr. Nirvay Kumar, sir, Dr. Nirvay Kumar, sir, please come and address and felicitate our organizing chairperson, R.K. Singh, sir. So I'll request our organizing chairperson, Dr. R.K. Singh, sir, please give welcome address. We are already short of time and uh, Dr. Joshi is requesting don't welcome, just simply say thanks. Uh, he will be leaving very soon for the airport. And we, uh, on behalf of uh, Kanpur Orthopedic Association, I'm very much thankful to all the uh, delegates as well as all the senior speakers. Uh, I don't need, need to uh, repeat the names, but uh, I, I'm very much privileged to honor especially Dr. Anand Joshi. Uh, I've been his admirer for the last 25 years. 25 years back, I visited his uh, clinic and I was really impressed the way he was working. And uh, he's the person who has uh, uh, make orthoscopy at his super specialty. And uh, I appreciate that. And uh, we should learn from him. And uh, similarly, I'm also thankful to our president of uh, UP Orthopedic Association and all other senior speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll request our UPO president, Asis Kumar, sir, for the presidential address. Thanks, Dr. Ajit. And the dignitaries over the dais. So, uh, as a UPO president, I'm supposed to speak a little bit. So, uh, it's a wonderful program. When uh, Dr. Amit is senior to me, he asked uh, for organizing such kind of things. So I was uh, not expecting this much good arrangements. It's a wonderful arrangement and the stalwarts of arthroscopy have been uh, invited and they have uh, joined online as well. And it's a wonderful thing to have this kind of uh, program here. All aspects have been covered regarding the knee and uh, I have contributed a little bit to it. So uh, I must congratulate Dr. Amit and his uh, whole team. As far as uh, Dr. Joshi is concerned, he to arthroscopy ke pitama hai. So we all have learned seeing him. And now I believe ki everybody, every in every college we are having, like in my department, we have 21 residents now every year who are getting trained in arthroscopy. So arthroscopy has to increase leaps and bounds. This we all know. And that's why this kind of meetings are very, very important. Uh, so I have, uh, once again, I congratulate him and the best wishes for forthcoming time when he will keep on organizing such things. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So uh, I think this is a pride for Kanpur, not only the Kanpur, it's a whole UP and all the Kanpur Orthopedic Association members are blessed to have Anand Joshi sir in between us. So if uh, we would love to listen to you, if you want to say something, how, how was the hospitality? How was this place? Uh. Dr. Agarwal, the Dr. Singh, our friend Ashish, my old friend Dr. Gupta, and all uh, the committee members of the uh, Kanpur Orthopedic Association who have taken uh, great pains to organize this meeting. Uh, I'm extremely delighted to be back in Kanpur almost, after almost a gap of all, 30 years. I remember having uh, come here for uh, delivering an oration for the uh, Kanpur IMA. Uh, 
and then I've been uh, waiting to get an invitation from Kanpur, which finally came when <laughs> Dr. <laughs> called me. Uh, Dr. Amit uh, called me. And uh, so I have been uh, coming uh, quite frequently to this great state of Uttar Pradesh. And I have friends, I have uh, people planted in all the different areas like Lucknow, Varanasi, Allahabad. But unfortunately, I didn't have anyone in Kanpur. And finally, I got a friend now who will keep on inviting me, hopefully, for his next meeting. <laughs> it's always a pleasure and uh, proud for Kanpur people to invite you and to host you. So I'm extremely grateful uh, to the organizers for uh, hosting me here. Uh, we also had something uh, different than just the academics. We had a cycle ride in the morning to promote health. And that was a good step forward, a uh, different way of thinking of how to promote uh, not just arthroscopy, but also sports science. Uh, I'm also delighted to see so many younger as well as uh, colleagues, other colleagues who have come here for uh, uh, this uh, interaction between uh, the orthopedic surgeons, I think it helps uh, all of us in uh, bettering our understanding of the subject that we are dealing with. Uh, as always, uh, the hospitality has been really outstanding and I'm extremely grateful. And thank you once again for having me here. Thank you so much, sir. Your simple presence is quite igniting for the brain of our young young colleagues. So I'll request all the faculties, please come on the desk. We have a group photograph followed by the closing of the ceremony. So, so we have we have the national anthem. I'll request everyone, please rise. Sir, sir, nikah diya. Thanks. We don't have time. Sorry, sir. It's a thanks to everyone. Vote of thanks, Dena tha. Lekin because we are running short of time, let us stand for the gentleman. Sir, I I give extended thanks to everyone. Detailed thanks I'll give post lunch. Thank you, sir. Sir, his flight may we may miss his flight actually, sir. Sir, please be aware with the timing, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll give, uh, and I understand there are a lot of faults and the police and which must be just serving you. And we team KOA apologize for all those police. And I thank you all of you, including Parma, including media person, our faculty, of course, and delegates for this wonderful presence and making the program successful. Thank you so very much. So we'll start national anthem. Janagana mana adhina yak jaya he bharat. Janagana mana bharat bhagya vidhata. Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha. Dravida Uttal Vanga. Vindya Himachal Yamuna Ganga. चल जगति तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मांगे गाहे तब जय गाथा 
जन जन मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू थैंक यू ऑल सो नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट एवरीवन फॉर द लंच प्लीज कम एंड जॉइन अस फॉर लंच
thank you very much respected Adam chair uh, <coughs> so if you see uh, the evolution of a reconstruction of acl pcl lcl and the meniscal repair most of these are nowadays tackled with the surgical approach the one structure which is called mcl is mostly they are treated conservatively and surgical indications are very few. I am waiting here, boss. So grade one and grade two can be treated as conservative and grade three has to be treated operatively. This is the standard learning. But there are expansion of indication of these MCL reconstruction. Suppose a patient who has, you know, Stanner's lesion, that is the avulsion of MCL from the, from the tibial side, this is indication of surgery because these patients are not going to heal because the MCL has evolved and come out of its place. So it will not heal. Bony evolution are another indication for surgery because we utilize the presence of bony piece for a perfect healing. Incarceration of MCL into the joint, usually this happens in the multi-ligament setting is an indication for emergency surgery. And even if it is grade two or grade three, MCL reconstruction are indicated when they are on contemplated with the multi-ligament. This was a 23 year old professional footballer uh, who came to us. Uh, we examined and then she had actually a grade three injury. So I'll show you the MRI, which has been reported as a grade three injury. So we actually offered her uh, since she being a professional footballer, we offered her a surgery, but she refused to undergo surgery. Because of her refusal, we managed conservatively to her uh, immobilization in a knee brace for three weeks and then physiotherapy. You see that even that type of tear has completely healed in three weeks time. So this patient uh, was a national football player, uh, a female, and she went to uh, her uh, active career even with the conservative management. So we were excited with this um, conservative management. Another patient, 24 year male, a professional footballer again, he came to us had an isolated MCL injury. We thought that this was reported as a grade two injury. So you could see that opening a little bit. And this was reported as a grade two injury. We thought that if grade three can go back to sports, why not grade two? So we treated that patient conservatively and he comes to us after three months and you see that what he was demonstrating. This was, this was demonstrating active opening of his medial side, which is similar to the case which was shown by um, Dr. Uh, Ananta Joshi, sir. So, uh, so the difference between these two cases are the valgoid knee. So the first case was a lady, she had a varus knee, this gentleman has a little bit of valgoid knee. So valgoid knee are very poorly tolerated. The MCL tier, even grade two, grade three are very poorly tolerated. So what does this two case explains us that you have to have an individualized approach rather than saying that grade one, you will grade one and grade two heal grade three requires surgery rather, rather than that, probably you have to look into the various other aspect of MCL injury as well. Uh, as far as the early intervention versus delayed, um, uh, most of the time it is delayed until unless it is associated with multi-ligament injury. So MCL is delayed for three weeks. But if MCL doesn't heal in three weeks, then we lose an option of repairing or augmenting. So any MCL injury which you treat after three weeks, probably you are going ahead with reconstruction. But there is a chance of repair and augmentation. Here I very often use a tape uh, or internal bracing system to augment the MCL repair that is possible within three weeks time. Uh, surgical options, uh, there are various surgical options based upon the time the patient present to us. What we are talking about the reconstruction, <clears throat> reconstruction of MCL provides the best predictive score, uh, outcome. There are various methods that is described in literature. Here, the picture shows uh, the single bundle, the double bundle, which is basically 
the other technique that I'm going to talk about and the Laprade's technique, which is we are going to discuss. The Laprade has described the anatomic reconstruction uh, and then they have reported a various biomechanical advantages. But remember, Laprade's technique requires four tunnels, two in the femur, two in the tibia, four implants. So that means it will add to the cost. And if you are talking about in association with multi-ligament, especially PCL, there is a chances of tunnel coalition. And while fixing into the distal part, this with the interference screw, there is a chance of, uh, you know, the graft cut out. Uh, the tunnel coalition was a real problem and it has been acknowledged by the same group of people who developed this anatomical and they have given an extended, you know, chapter on how to avoid the tunnel coalition. So tunnel coalition is, is a real problem. Now we are talking about tunnel coalition in the American people who are very big. Their size of condyle is also big. But if you go to the literature, which talk about the size of the femoral condyle, so this is one of the study which was published in 2016 says that probably the femoral condyle of our people or the shorter people are smaller in size. So if the femoral condyle is so smaller inside, you know, having so much of tunnel and two separate tunnel from MCL is not very reasonable. This is another paper who say that probably in Asian population, the size of the femoral condyle is smaller. So one size doesn't fit. So if if uh, femoral condyle of very big person will not be same. Uh, sorry, sir. I request that the lunch should be now wound up. Please wind up the lunch and please do not all the people who are having a lunch, please do it quietly. Don't disturb. There's a lot of song. And I request the hotel authorities to wind up the lunch now. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. So one size doesn't fit. So what, whatever, whatever surgical technique is described in probably on bigger size people may not be feasible to the size of people which are smaller. So my uh, initial technique was Kim's technique. So which is essentially using the semi tendinosus graft, looped it, uh, fixed into the uh, femoral side and brought it down to reconstruct the uh, POL. But the problem with this graph, this type of technique is it is non-anatomical. So I'll show you in, um, in my next slide, which shows that probably your starting of the superficial MCL is too much anterior because semi-tendinosis, uh, sorry, semi-T is anterior to the attachment of the MCL. So that is uh, how we came with a modification of Kim's technique and developed our weave technique so that to replicate the superficial MCL as well as the POL. So what we do in our technique, it has four different steps. In step one, we harvest the graft with an open tendon stripper, keeping the tibial attachment intact. If you see in picture one, the red shows that the graft is harvested and it is, um, um, so tibial attachment is intact. Then you make an incision into the remnant of the superficial MCL. So this is a subperiosteal tunnel. So make a subperiosteal tunnel and pass your graft through that subperiosteal tunnel. Put some stitches into that split of the remnant of superficial MCL. Then you take it up, find out the isometric point, fix into the femur into the isometric point. Then your remaining graft has to come down and just behind the semimembranosus, there is attachment of the POL, you fix that and the PUL. So what this technique does is it uses only hamstring graft, one hamstring graft, which is sufficient to do anatomic reconstruction. Unlike Laprade's technique in which you need two grafts, a bigger size graft, probably you have to use an allograft for that one. And with just one tunnel in the femur, this can be done and one tunnel in the tibia for the PUL fixation. So this was a 30, 34 year old gentleman. I'll not go into detail of this technique because this is freely available in arthroscopy technique journal. So this is a 34 year old gentleman had ACL with MCL 10 weeks after injury. You could see that his Lachman test was positive. His valgus was positive. 
So I'll not go into the details of ACL. So this was his MCL and without even pie crusting, it was opening a big opening. So we decided to do a MCL weave technique. So this is harvest and then pass it on. I'll not go into detail of this technique because again, it is freely available. But what I wanted to show you that intraoperatively, even with the valgus applied with so much of anesthesia and relaxation, you can see that the joint is completely restored and the opening is completely restored. This is another case in which you can see both the sides. One is pre-op uh, and the other one is post-op. To your left is pre-op and this one is post-op. You could see that the joint opening is completely restored after doing the weave technique. Another case, similarly, you can see the joint opening has been nicely restored after the weave technique. So to conclude, um, probably when we talk about MCL and the current literature is saying that on those days when we used to, you know, blanketly say that MCL can be managed conservatively, it has to be individualized, associated injury has to be taken into consideration, the alignment of the joint has to be taken into consideration. If someone who is having a valgus knee, even grade two tear is very poorly tolerated by these patients. Early, uh, if you can identify this tear um, early, probably repair is a possibility and then you have to augment so that you can start early range of motion. One of the commonest complication of MCL repair or reconstruction is stiffness. So early range of motion has to be given to this patient. <clears throat> delayed, if you get a delayed MCL, medial collateral ligament injury, reconstruction is the only option. There are various techniques in literature the choice has to be, you know, made considering many factors. Where, where are you working? What is the size of the femur and how you are going to fix it? With this, I'd like to thank everyone, uh, the people from Kanpur for excellent hospitality and having me here and request you to be in Nepal anytime and whenever you want. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Amit Joshi for a wonderful uh, presentation of MCL repair. Uh, this next lecture will be an online uh, lecture by Dr. Sachin Tabaswi, who will be speaking Check. on all about MCL repair. Again, uh, when and how. So we will have various aspects of the same uh, problem. Uh, one by Dr. Anand Joshi, second by Dr. Amit uh, Joshi, and third by Dr. Sachin Tabaswi. So we'll wait for the uh, online lecture by Dr. Sachin Tabaswi. Next. Yeah. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll be presenting on MCL repair. So it's going to be a repetition of uh, topics uh, since all of them were concentrating on the medial side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know. I can hear you very well. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Hello. Dr. Yes, are you? Am I audible? Uh, Abari. Abari. Yes, sir. Okay. So yes. there's going to be a repetition essentially because we had three topics uh, talking about the same problem, which is the MCL. And um, the MCL, as you as we all are aware, is a structure on the medial side. We have the superficial, we have the deep MCL and the POL, and they're all present between layers one, two, and three on the medial side. What is also interesting to understand is that these structures, which are uh, extremely important, play a very important role in stabilization of both the ACL and the PCL. So what I'm showing here from green to green is the superficial MCL, that's the insertion six uh, centimeters below the joint line as you can see there and then the insertion is posterior and proximal to that of uh, the medial epicondyle the white is the adaptive tubercle and the insertion of the superficial mcl is in between the medial epicondyle and the adaptive tubercle the structure that i'm picking up now is the middle head of the gastrocnemius which attaches to the gastrocubercle and the condensation of the deep fascia and the semimembranosus is the POL ligament which inserts in around where the semimembranosus inserts 
and to the area which is just near the gastrocnemius tubercle. So this is your POL which is extremely important. It tightens as your knee goes into extension. It becomes lax as your knee goes into flexion. And uh, it is important to understand the, this structure that needs to be repaired or reconstructed whenever we do surgery for medial instability. So what we have here is a complex uh, two ligament structure. You have the MCL, the superficial MCL, as well as the POL, both of them which are essentially important. The third structure on the medial side is the MPFL, which inserts in the crater between the adductor tubercle, which is right here, and the medial epicondyle, and then courses medially to the superior medial aspect of the patella, thereby allowing stability for the patella in the first 30 degrees of knee flexion. So your superficial MCL is your medial restraint in flexion and your secondary restraint to anterior tibial translation. Your POL is the medial restraint at extension which needs to be kept in mind at all times. And these are the structures that you need to look out for and you need to reconstruct or repair when you have an injury. The mechanism is a valgus overload type of an injury, usually with the foot rotated externally and firmly planted on the ground, which is why you have a concomitant ACL injury at the same time as well. MCL injuries are quite common. So Andy Williams published last year, uh, they took 100 patients who underwent ACL surgery and almost two thirds of them had some form of injury to the medial complex. Of these, two-thirds were injuries to the superficial MCL, 30% were to the deep MCL and 10% were to the posterior oblique ligament, thereby suggesting that we tend to overlook a lot of these problems. Deep MCL lesions like these should not be taken lightly because they are associated with a lot of ramp lesions and they may also indicate subclinical superficial MCL injury. If you fail to treat them or repair them, there is a high chance that that patient may land up with anteromedial rotatory instability and then that may lead to failure of your ACL reconstruction. Another very good uh, publication that came from Alberto Grassi's group, which was published this year, looked at almost about 20,000 patients who underwent ACL revision uh, in the Swedish National Knee Ligament Registry. So what is important to understand is that the risk of revision of your ACL reconstruction is the same if you have had a concomitant ACL and MCL reconstructed. But if your MCL is treated non-operatively, then you have a significantly higher risk of getting your ACL revised. So which means that don't overlook an MCL injury that requires surgical treatment. So MCL injuries essentially can be classified into five different types depending upon the location, the clinical findings, as well as the MRI findings. And I find this classification to be very useful because it allows us to understand what sort of treatment plan should be followed in all these patients. All grade one and most grade two can be treated non-surgically, but some grade two and all grade three probably should require surgical management. Stress X-rays and MR scans are really important because non-operative treatment will consist of giving restricted progressive range of motion for six weeks. If you have a varus aligned knee, then you can allow them full weight bearing. If it is a valgus aligned knee, then you should allow them partial weight bearing and you should brace them for three to six weeks. An acute medial repair is offered when there is extensive medial disruption, when you have a displaced medial meniscus tear, you have a stenar lesion or when you have a bony abulsion. So an irreducible knee in which the whole medial side is pulled inside the intraarticular aspect is usually pathognomic of a lateral or an anterolateral rotatory dislocation. In this, the medial femoral condyle perforates the capsule and in these patients, urgent open reduction is extremely important. The Stenner lesion was described by Christian Hoser and Christian Fink along with Johann Bellinens and they observed that a Stenner lesion needs to be picked up very quickly and efficiently because if the superficial MCL goes superficial to the PES, unlike where it should be underneath the PES, it will never stick back as you see in this MR scan image and these are the ones that need to be treated 
rapidly and correctly with surgical reconstruction or surgical repair depending upon the time when you get these lesions how do you repair them pretty simple you dissect pull up the pes feed the torn superficial mcl underneath the pes and reattach it with whatever sutures that you may feel to do so this is one such example of a standard lesion repair so we have here this lady who has a one day old kd 3m she's got an acl a pcl and a grade 3 mcl looking at the status of the knee and the extensive bruising we decided to do a two stage approach for her in which stage 1 was planned to fix uh, the mcl side and stage 2 was to reconstruct the acl and the pcl these are our stress x rays showing gapping which is more than 4.8 mm compared to the opposite side and you can see that there is complete disruption and the injury is predominantly tibial based so a large exposure very important you should not uh, you should try and have a, a flap which is thick and deep do not raise small flaps of skin and soft tissue uh, the incision should be large enough to expose from the medial epicondyle to the distal most uh, in insertion onto the proximal tibia and then you go ahead and repair and dissect layer wise so you first start with layer 3 which is the menisco femoral and the menisco tibial ligaments as you see here this is a <coughs> tibial sided injury with the deep mcl pulled off from the tibial side you can see the medial meniscus which is there the medial meniscus is then reduced couple of uh, this is how the medial meniscus which was torn that's a superficial mcl flap and you can see the under surface of the medial meniscus right there so couple of 2.5 uh, mm anchors um, on the rim of the tibia and then the first step is to repair layer 3 after you finish layer 3 and the meniscus you then go to layer 2 which consists of the superficial mcl and the capsule so these are whip stitches taken in the superficial mcl we have a 5 mm anchor at the insertion site of the smcl ready to take the uh, superficial mcl uh, and get it repaired exactly in its bed so this is that is step 2 and then we close the capsule which is layer 1 and the mpfl which is between layer 2 and 3 and that completes our medial sided repair standard way back about 10 years ago did publish that if you do not augment your repair with some form of a reconstruction then you have a higher risk of failure which is why it's always a very good idea to back up your repair with an augmentation this can either be in the form of using artificial tapes or by using some form of autograft again laprat published this year in the ajsm where he looked at a prospective multicentric randomized trial where they had <coughs> superficial mcl with or minus acl with a pol intact and they found no differences in any form of the objective outcomes what do we need to look at here is to understand that we need to repair and which is why i use a modification where i harvest the semity i do a <coughs> staple tenodesis to the medial side and then bring it down to the pol it's always important to get the pol also sorted out because failure to do so may result in your whole repair failing which is why we need to have this again looking at the structures on the medial side here is an acute mcl tear large decent exposure you go right in this is what you want to expose put in couple of sutures harvest and keep the semity ready and once you're done with your repair you want to use your semity and bring it back on itself in this particular fashion to get it repaired to the pol area and thereby create a modified lint type of uh, augmentation to your mcl repair which is also very extremely important if you have bony avulsions that makes your life simple this is one example of a medial bony avulsion which was fixed with uh, bark staples and the whole thing did not require any further treatment it's important to understand that you should repair your ligaments properly this is one example who came to me for a redo surgery where the surgeon attempted to take some sutures and used some screw and some staple 
but of course this failed and this required a conventional replace uh, reconstruction type of procedure so early operative treatment will always have better outcomes when you compare them with non operative or delayed surgery reconstruction is important we published this year in the esca journal our uh, series of 34 patients which were followed up for a minimum of uh, 50 months or so and we showed that when we do a proper reconstruction along with the same you have improvement in the valgus stress x rays as well as the ikdc scores so i think is that all that you need to know no there's a lot more that we all need to understand and i'm going to invite you to come and join us in 2 weeks from now for our pune ne course we are already about uh, we have 900 registered delegates with us it's going to be a big event going over 3 days and we have uh, professor david dijor who will demonstrate things like trochleoplasties will show meniscus transplants and i look forward to welcome you then thank you so much for your attention thank you very much uh, dr sachin tabassi for an excellent lecture on uh, repair of medial collateral ligament and the posterior oblique ligament uh i am uh, really uh, afraid we have uh, not much of time left because we are already running late uh, dr amit any questions eh? you can have one or two questions dr amit agarwal has been uh, very kind enough to permit two two or two to three like two to three questions from the audience if there are no questions if there are no questions we will close the session thank you thank you so much for your kind attention and thank you patience. dr sachin thank you thank you sir uh, now uh, i request dr amit agarwal sir please come on the dais and felicitate our chairpersons dr santosh rajpal sir जिनको नहीं पता है सर फ्रॉम द सेम स्टेज डॉक्टर राजपाल सर हु इज द मोस्ट सीनियर पर्सन ऑफ कानपुर ऑर्थोपेडिक एसोसिएशन वाज अवार्डेड द लाइफ टाइम अचीवमेंट अवार्ड ओनली फ्यू मंथ्स बिफोर सो पवन अगेन कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन सर ही इज 80 प्लस यंग ऑर्थोपेडिक सर्जन ऑफ द टाउन थैंक यू सर फॉर योर स्पिरिट डॉक्टर राजेंद्र नाथ सर प्रोफेसर राजेंद्र नाथ साहब हैव गॉट वेरी स्वीट इतना अच्छा गाते हैं इतना अच्छा उनका गला है एंड एवरी ऑल ऑर्थोपेडिक मीटिंग्स इट प्रीसीडेड बाय हिज राइम्स तो और उनकी संस्कृत की नॉलेज बहुत अच्छी है सर अदर देन द सब्जेक्ट नॉलेज सो इज ऑलवेज अ कंट्रीब्यूटर आइदर मे बी द पोएम्स राइम्स और द सब्जेक्ट नॉलेज एंड ही हैज बीन माई टीचर इट इज माई प्राउड प्रोफेस सर थैंक यू सो मच सर डॉक्टर पंकज टंडन सर डॉक्टर जो भी सर हम लोगों ने नाश्ता खाना खाया है सब डॉक्टर पंकज की वजह से खाया है थैंक यू सर फॉर टेकिंग केयर ऑफ अस थ्री चीयर्स टू डॉक्टर पंकज टंडन हेपे फोर रे थैंक यू सर thank you thank you so we have the workshop now before that we have a, a small session of uh, felicitation of all the actually the honorable president and the organizing secretary and the whole organizing team has decided to felicitate our organizing team for this uh, kanpur arthroscopic course so for that i would like request dr uh, our honorable president dr ashish kumar sir please come on the dais i'll request Dr. Binay Pandey, sir, please come on the dais. I request Dr. Amit Joshi, sir, please come on the dais. Ah.
अमित जोशी सर प्लीज कमांड द डैश डॉक्टर राम जी खन्ना सर प्लीज डॉक्टर राम जी खन्ना डॉक्टर पुष्कर आनंद सर I request to please come forward fast Dr V S Sharma sir please come under us डॉक्टर अनिल शुक्ला सर डॉक्टर दक्ष गड़ी दक्ष डॉक्टर पवन गुप्ता सर डॉक्टर मानव लूथरा सर डॉक्टर गौरव गुप्ता डॉक्टर रोहित नाथ सर डॉक्टर रोहित नाथ डॉक्टर रोहित नाथ डॉक्टर निर्भय सक्सेना सर डॉक्टर निर्भय सक्सेना डॉक्टर टीपीएस लांबा सर डॉक्टर लांबा सर डॉक्टर विनय गुप्ता डॉक्टर विशाल अग्रवाल सर डॉक्टर अजीत तिवारी Sir, I want extra like some special claps for these two guys, Doctor Ajit and Doctor Vishal. <laughs> Sir, Doctor Dax also. Where is Doctor Dax? And Doctor Vinay. <laughs> Sir, आ जाइए चारों लोग आ जाइए आगे. Please आइए. इन लोगों के लिए जरा जबरदस्त ताली. Doctor Vinay. आइए. Please आइए. And I request everyone to please join for a photograph. With faculty, sir, faculty, doctor, me, doctor, we need doctor Ashish sir. Agya, please.
तो कहीं भी फिट हो जाएगा यार उनको थैंक यू कांधे से कांधा मिला के चलने वाली टीम और इनको देख के बस वही याद आता है कि हेलो मैं अकेला ही चला था जान वे मंजिल मगर लोग आ मिलते गए और कारवा बन गया थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सर एंड एंड प्लीज डू नॉट गो बिकॉज वी आर स्टार्टिंग द वर्कशॉप दिस इज गोइंग टू टेक सम टाइम बिकॉज एवरी थिंग इज टू बी अरेज ऑन द टेबल but this is the most important part of the course so please do not go and take participation in the workshop as we have already said one demonstration will be done over here focused by the camera delivered on the screen we all will see that demonstration and then we'll follow the same you have number on your best 1 2 3 4 you can go to the corresponding table every table has got number you see the number on the table 1 2 3 4 5 5 so you join your table seeing your card number please go to your table 1 2 3 4 please join your table and i'll request dr vinay pande to please take over to the central table and organizers to please arrange the central table here dr chandan ye kya table lagwao bada ke ek wali se
uh, and another request is on the central travel where the demonstration will occur please do not gather only the table instructor dr vinay pandey will be there and one of his helper rest we all will remain away from that table हेलो 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 आई रहे होगी आ रही है ना हेलो 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 आवाज आ रही है वहीं आएगा and by the time the tables are being arranged there are three lucky draw so i would request our uh, ji faculty dr amit mishra and president dr ashish if he here please draw the those lucky draw and find who is the most lucky person mr anoop hart singh team please bring that box magic box with the gifts okay aise aawaz aa rahi hai I request Mrs. Mrs. Josie. Josie Josie. No, no, no. This is Mrs. Josie's job because she has also to contribute something. आइए, Mrs. Josie, please. आइए ऊपर ले आइए ऊपर ले. अभी focus चल रहा है. Mrs. Josie, hello. I request for. Hello. Now we are going to start with this demonstration. Everybody ready? Uh, before you start, Doctor Vene, I would request once again to all delegates to be on their tables, not okay. here. So everybody has to sit from there. What we do here, Doctor Vene? Yes. Sir. A lucky draw. Keep tak tak tak. Log wahan pounche. Tab tak a lucky draw ho jayega so that if the crowd is here, then chalega. Chalega. No fun. Aye, Mrs. Joshi. UP seventy eight. GF three four zero nine. GF three four zero nine. Jinki gadiyo, please hata de. So the first lucky draw goes to Doctor Ajit Rawat. Doctor Ajit Rawat. Rawat from Regency Hospital. Is he here? 
otherwise this will go to the second person if person is not here the prize will go to the next draw kisne ajit rawat chaliye kya baat hai aaiye clapping for our very dear ajit aaiye 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 are bas bas मैच फिक्सिंग हो चुकी है आप ही गए 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 सिंह टीम प्लीज टू बी ऑन द फोटोग्राफ नाउ द सेकंड लकी ड्रॉ लेट्स सी आफ्टर द सेक नंबर एट्टी एट डॉक्टर विनय गुप्ता डॉक्टर विनय गुप्ता वो अरे अब तो पक्का फिक्सिंग है एंड वन मोर शिवम चौहान डॉक्टर शिवम चौहान इज ही हियर ओ ग्रेट अभी इसका मतलब फिक्सिंग थी नहीं वाकई में नाइस थैंक यू डॉक्टर शिवम कॉन्ग्रेचुलेट थैंक यू मिसेस जोशी सो वंस अगेन द मोमेंट अवर डेलीगेट्स विल गो टू देयर करस्पॉन्डिंग टेबल वील स्टार्ट हियर आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल द डेलीगेट्स प्लीज गो टू देयर करस्पॉन्डिंग टेबल योर नंबर इज देयर इन द नंबर नहीं सर इसमें चलिए करिए फिर जैसे कुछ तो यूपी का सर रहना चाहिए सो फर्स्ट इज टू ग्राफ का संजीवन सो सो दिस इज ग्रेसिलिस हैमस्ट्रिंग So suppose there are two graphs like this. Show this one. So one is gracilis and one is hamstring. So we we take both the graphs out and we hold it with LS like this. So you have to hold it both. Both tendons are there. Correct. Now you start tying with the bond. So end has to be tied. So this is called a whip stitching of the tendons together. So you take a bite like this. उन ओके दिख रहा है हाफ कर दिया करेक्ट अगर वो रहे हाफ कर दिया एसी बॉन्ड ये कितने कितने नंबर है नंबर 2 एंड नंबर 5 यू कैन टाई आइदर नंबर 2 और दिस इज नंबर 2 अच्छा कैन एनीबॉडी शो दिस नंबर 2 एसी बॉन्ड नंबर 2 अभी नंबर 1 ही आनी पड़ा वो नंबर नंबर 2 एंड नंबर 5 टू आर देयर सो वी आर ट्राइंग विद नंबर 2 एसी बॉन्ड दिस नंबर 2 एसी बॉन्ड दिस इज लाइक दिस नंबर 2 एसी बॉन्ड Correct. So we start start tying the knot. So we go like this, and then we come up like this, and then again we go from down to up like this. इसको आप ऐसे कर लेंगे तो वहाँ दिखेगा like this. Can you show? This is the configuration that we are getting. So show this. Again we go from there and like this. This is rib stitching. Isko pakar sakte hain aur hold it. And can I request all the demonstrators, so Doctor Chandan, Doctor Gorav, Doctor Dash, to be on their demonstration table. So that Dr. is how we are rib stitching the Dr. ends Gaurav, of the tendon. Doctor Gorav, Doctor Nirbhay, please be on your demonstration table. Correct. Doctor Gorav. So now we have taken four to five rib stitches. Come from that side, and then you go down again from up to down like this.
it is always good to take symmetrical bites so that to damage the tendon less and less can you see this configuration which is coming there like this ye aap hi ka dikha rahe correct ball ko idhar na bol what you are doing is okay so that is how we are whip stitching the tendon ends so at the end of whip stitching this is how the tendon looks like correct we have stitched the tendon of end of tendons together similarly on this side isko kar lete hai na we are isko pakad lete pakad isko then i go rathi bond dena again we will do the same maneuver here also hold again focus there focus so again we go like this top to bottom that's how you get maximum tensile strength in the suture configuration so both ends we are tying together so this is how you prepare your so again four bites you can go to fifth bite as well but four bite is good enough so you want to make this configuration symmetrical so symmetrical configuration will have maximum cut out strength ho gaya there so we are at the end of the tendon preparation so now because four strand acl has similar strength or more more or less more strength as compared to native acl so it is always 4 5 6 and the other thing is we have to make this the strand minimum size 8 size 8 means what i'll tell, let you know so not less than size 8 is is required chuba na so again this is how we have maintained so can you can you see so once this is done needle cut lo needle cut idhar se bhi cut lo idhar se chhod diye so now this is done and this is how our tendon looks like can you show and once this is done you can pull tendon so that you can take out the shrinks in the tendon so once this is done you will size the tendon the sizing is done ek dhaga le le pass in a thread like this ne pull the graph pass karna hi padega this is how you going to size the tendon so you make it four fold now this is one strand two strand three strand and four strand and that is how you size your tendon there is a sizer which is which comes with implant companies like this this sizer so you put in a sizer and try to pass the tendon through this size 8 it is written 8 8.5 9 9.5 9 correct so if it goes through this this is 8 suppose you want to take it kitna uh, minimum weight hai kitna suppose you want to take it from this is 4 5 so it is going from get a five okay suppose you want to go take it from 3 for example 3.5 it is not going so minimum you want this tendon to be 8 currently we can say it is 6 pe leke jao dekhte hai na 6 6 so you can say 6 so you have to make this tendon minimum 8 so right now this is 6 because this is this is like this otherwise it is you have to make it 8 make it 5 tail 6 tail there are different methods of making it so size you should get minimum 8 not less than 8 so uh, initially we used to uh, use size 7 also but now studies have come up we show that less than size 8 the graft failure rate is very high so this should this thickness of the graft should be minimum 8 correct so once this is made up to keep the graft and then you will start with preparation of the tunnel of the femur and the tibia 
first is graft harvest and graft preparation preparation of graft is like this if you are trying to make a four tail graft like this and four tail acl reconstruction has a more strength grafted acl has more strength than the native acl that is how so once you start with this first is we will remove this so that we can see the notch isko aapko idhar se lana padega aise then only you will need to see isko hata dena so that is how we are going to see this is femur tibia this is left side correct dikh raha hai yahan pe yahan pe yahan focus karna yahan focus karo and zoom in little bit ye aur upar jayega kya aapka it has come like this aise aana hai isko aise aana padega tab dikhega yahan pe make it go up focus like this so first is preparation of femoral tunnel okay great so acl goes from the tibial footprint to the acl footprint this is lateral side of femur that is the medial side of femur this is lateral this is medial so the medial wall of lateral femoral condyle this is the lateral femoral condyle and that's the medial wall this wall is the medial wall so somewhere on the medial wall is the attachment of this is the medial wall see there that's the lateral femoral condyle that's the medial femoral condyle so on the lateral femoral condyle medial wall somewhere back is the attachment of acl wo kahan gaya hata diya kya tune ko ek apna jo khula hua tha ye manga dena usko dikhane mein aasani hogi so somewhere there so where is the attachment will so uh, will show uh, with it उसको देखेंगे दूसरे पे वो देना ना इधर सो स्टेप वन इज ग्राफ्ट हार्वेस्ट एंड ग्राफ्ट प्रिपरेशन सो ऑन दिस मॉडल यू विल ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड वेयर इज द अटैचमेंट ऑफ सुसी बैक बैक पोर्शन सो दिस इज लाइक दिस दिस इज द अटैचमेंट ऑफ इट इज फार पॉस्टिवियर सो वी आर लुकिंग इट लाइक दिस करेक्ट we remove this we can't see back so see back from there that's the condyle so there is the attachment of that's the attachment of acl correct so if we go more precise if we take this off so where is the attachment of acl is there is a ridge which is called as bifurcate ridge pen dena jara mujhe pen hai kya marker pen so there is a bifurcate ridge like this this is a marker pen you know okay there great so there is a bifurcate ridge like this and and there is a ridge this, this divides the two bundle one bundle is here the other bundle is here can anyone see so one bundle is there one so this is bifurcate ridge lateral intercondylar ridge this is lateral intercondylar ridge and by so whole is the stump of acl footprint that's how you define acl footprint so we see you are seeing from behind that's lateral intercondylar ridge that's the bifurcate ridge on top is anteromedial bundle the bottom is posterolateral bundle this is posterolateral bundle that's the anteromedial bundle that's bifurcate ridge and that's intercondylar ridge so one has to reach from front to this portion so you can't see from there correct so as you bend knee more and more this comes in picture so if i bend knee like this it comes in picture if i straighten the knee it goes back and behind so jab bhi femoral drilling karte hain we have to bend knee to 100 110 because we want to make this come in picture correct like this so knee is bent like this so just keep this picture in mind we have different offsets offsetting all this offset कोई भी दे देना दिस ऑफसेट एक गाइड बार देना इज मैन टू पुट इट इन द बैक ऑफ द फीमर एंड वेन यू पुट अ गाइड पेन इट एग्जिट समवेयर इन फ्रंट ऑफ दैट पोर्शन सो दिस डिस्टेंस इज मार्क ऑन एवरी गाइड पेन लाइक दिस डिस्टेंस इज इन दिस केस इज सेवन मिलीमीटर ऑफसेट सो दिस सेवन मिलीमीटर दैट डिस्टेंस बिटवीन दीज टू इज सेवन मिलीमीटर 
where it is written it is written there here it is written so that 7 mm offset similarly we have 5 mm offset 6 mm offset 7 mm depending on uh, what is the size of graph you want 6 7 or 8 mm offset so here we will go with 6 mm tons offset 7 6 0 6 mm offset we will use 6 mm dena 6 7 so you want to make this graph far posterior so we are talking about isometric point on the tbl side the attachment of uh, graph is about 14 mm it is a huge attachment so we want to go to the center of the, the attachment there but we try to be on the anteromedial bundle side not the posterior lateral bundle side when are we when we are reconstructing the acl single bundle we try to be on the anteromedial side so how do we do it we pass in this guide pin through the anteromedial port and put it go behind the the femur like this this will go like this and go and attach like this zoom in zoom in zoom in zoom in zoom in, zoom in here okay so we make this go like this and go and go to the back portion of femoral condyle so it lodges in the back portion of femoral condyle and when you drill you are 7 mm anterior to it so when you put in a guide wire isme the guide wire dalna hai so when you are going to put the guide wire this guide wire will be 7 mm anterior to the desired position of kya ho position as the okay cha so you will be 7 mm anterior to where you want to be correct so from in this you bend the knee accurately because you want to bring this posterior condyle into picture so you make it go like behind and put it there so this is how you fix your guide pin that is posterior part of the femur and now you start drilling drill karna is pe so once you start drilling go it exits to the lateral femoral condyle four point so once this is done you remove the guide pin your job is done because you have marked the femoral attachment site this 5 6 7 it decided by the graph which we have either 8 graph 9 graph 10 graph the thicker the graph the bigger the offset because the thicker graph if the offset is small the tunnel will be far posterior it can blow out posteriorly also once this is done you will drill it with 4.5 or 5 mm drill bit or then zoom in there zoom in zoom in zoom in done 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 so you will exit through the femoral cortex and take everything out nikal lo nikal now you will take a depth gauge so once you have drilled you want to know what is the length of the tunnel again you will push it in and once it exits out and you will mark the tunnel there on that portion isko zoom in karna zoom in zoom in zoom in so you have a marking there i think it should be this usually comes about 35 in most of the cases you will get tunnel size of 35 50 40 Okay. In this we have forty tunnel. Tunnel is forty here because of course this is a specimen. So normally, if your tunnel is good, you will be somewhere around thirty-five, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-four is a good tunnel size. Forty is okay, acceptable. Forty-five not acceptable. Fifty absolutely not acceptable. If your tunnel length is very big, forty-five, fifty, fifty-five, sixty, that means you will have bungee effect. Now, what is bungee effect? suppose you have a tunnel length which is 50 so your loop is going to be big so your button is going to be there and loop is going to be big the more the loop is big you have this bungee effect windshield wiper effect or the bungee effect what happens that because there is there can be movement of graft in the tunnel the tunnel starts widening the more is the loop size more is the bungee effect and more is the windshield wiper effect 
wherein the tunnel is going to enlarge. So that's not a good sign. So you have to stay close to 30, 35, 40 tunnel. The more the tunnel is bigger, it is a problem. The shorter tunnel, the problem is with loop only. So So we are planning to take a loop of 15, which is the shortest loop available with the implants, not less than 15 loop we have. So the minimum loop size that we can take is 15. They don't have loop size less than 15. So because the tunnel was 40 and we want a loop size of 15, we have to drill tunnel up to 35. Now, how do we calculate this? Uh, that I'll, I'll tell you once we are off this. So what we're going to do is, okay. I'm asking Esther. B set. So he has drilled till 35. All these have markings on it. All these drill bits have marking on it. So this measurement is based on how much the tunnel size that we get and how much loop that we are taking. So we have planned 15 loop button. Oh, button open it. Open it. Is it 15? So that's the loop length. This is 15. This length is 15. So we have to accommodate 15 mm. So 1.5. So 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. That is how that, uh, the loop on. So 15 is because you want this loop to be short. The, this is going to hold the cortex. This is the loop and the graft is going to become a graft there. Graft is going to pass through this. This is the construct. This is a part of it. Yeah, 15 is best because you want this loop to be less. That is how the graft is going to sit like this. So if this loop is bigger, suppose this loop is bigger, then this graft will keep on having this play. Because the more is the play, the tunnel is going to widen. Correct? You want this play. So when we are this loop is, the play is more. That is why you want to keep this loop as small as possible. That is why 15 is the least that you want to take. So once you have done this, you have drilled the tunnel of the femur, then you come to, then you pass in the thread. So you have taken thread. So this, is this, type of this is fixed loop. This is fixed loop. Yeah. This, this is packed. They have obtained it. This, you will get it. This, uh, you will get this like this. You packed as you open it up and make it like this. That is, this is 15 is the smallest size. You don't get the size less than this. Button size is either 1.2, 1.4, different companies have different size. This is 1.4, I think, size. Indo button, CL Smith and FU is 1.2 size. They have 1.4. Different companies have different size. So when you are taking this out, you will keep the loop on that side and pass the thread like this. Correct? And then you can just make it like this. Now we are going to deal for the tibial tunnel. Tibial tunnel is the different landmark for the tibia. So what landmark? This is a footprint zig. This is called as footprint zig. This is zoom in. Karna. You have different kind of zigs for the tibia. That's a footprint zig. You only have to keep this on the footprint. Over, over shape. You can have tip aimer. Tip aimer laya hai Tip aimer hai ya zig. So you have a zig which can be like this. The wire is exiting at the tip or the wire is exiting. Like so it can be like this also. You fit in into this. Sometimes few companies have where the guide wire is going to exit there. There or it will exit there or it exits in the center of this. This is called as footprint zig. That is elbow aimer zig or tip aimer zig. All these zigs are for TBR. Footprint zig or elbow emerging or tip emerging. So here they are they have given us footprint emerging. So what do you do is this footprint zig has an advantage. You put it on the footprint of the ACL, whatever is there. Suppose with the ACL, you put it on the footprint of ACL. 
नो वायर इज गोइंग टू एग्जिट एट द सेंटर दिख रहा भैया the wire is going to exit at the center of this so you put this zig on the center of footprint and the wire is going to exit the center immediately you get the center of the footprint on the tbl side correct so that's the advantage of footprint zig so you put footprint zig like this le ab yaar drill lete hain na so you put it like this and once this is done ye yeah. yahan distal mein tight hota hoga na ha yes so that's a uh, they have this you press it like this and this opens becomes loose you leave it it becomes tight correct so goes in and out but out come, coming out is not possible it gets locked there are serrations there you see there are serrations there so once they have gone in but you want to take it out it gets locked you have to press it to take it out you leave it it can go in but doesn't come out correct so what we are going to do is put it on top of this first you fix in your tbl footprint and then dal this from the you fix it to the bone now you have different angles for this sorry this is 40 45 50 55 the more the angle the larger the tunnel usually we keep it on 55 kahan gaye fix on 55 and then you lock it so you can uh, dikh raha hai yes like this so you have different markings on top of this either this is 40 45 50 55 45 50 you can make it go to 50 you can whatever you want so here we take it on 55 okay so, so which this this is the line so this is the angle that you are getting between this and this so you reduce it the angle reduces this angle reduces you make it so you want a larger tunnel suppose what is the use of it suppose your graft length is small and you want your graft to exit the tibia and you are planning interference fixation and you want to shorten the tunnel so if you are angle is 55 and tunnel is large your graft is going to stay inside the tunnel so if you want a shorter tunnel because you have a shorter graft then you can play little bit with this zig you cannot make it 40 of course so you can go to 55 if you want a larger tunnel what happens suppose you have to do a root repair here now root repair tunnel is exiting exactly there so you want to make this acl tunnel go further down then you make it 60 65 bandho yo so what do you do you put the zig there and then aaja sanjeev drill karna larger the angle larger the tunnel yes correct so uh, suppose you have two three tunnels here we are thinking yeah ek mat chalana here we are dealing only with acl suppose you have acl pcl root tier so when you have multiple tunnels you want to cheat the tunnel correct so ye explanation kaise rakh Is, no no you it is not important important is where it is coming okay important is where it is exiting inside you cannot be on the top of pebble to cross just medial 1 cm medial tubular to cross the going between this the posterior border and correct jao upar jao ja ja the cross the correct if this is not good it will not exit in the center so it has so it has come to the footprint so that's the advantage of footprint zig so footprint medial lateral you don't have to understand here you just put it on the footprint and it comes out then you remove it like this then again you will drill kitna tha tune yahan pe kitna bhi kiya tha timer timer kitne se kiya tha 7 7 isko bhi 7 kar de sir ye jo angle hai hamara vertical se ha angle between this wire and this that is the, no no which one this one no along the vertical line you understand this lot of people are, a lot of Uh, uh, youngsters are confused in what is the angle of this that no it is only material what is where the tip is exiting here you cannot be on top of tibial to velocity if you are too medial you have to play with this when you are doing a multi ligament scenario this can be there this can be up this can be down this cannot change so why this multiple angles has been given this multiple angles has been given because sometimes you have to make it 60 
समटाइम्स यू हैव टू मेक इट 50 अदरवाइज दे वुड हैव गिवन अ फिक्स्ड एंगल फिक्स्ड एंगल तो है नहीं क्यों उसके मल्टीपल एंगल है बिकॉज़ अलग-अलग सिनेरियो में आपको एंगल चेंज करने पड़ते हैं सो व्हाट इज पैरामाउंट इज दिस हैज टू एग्जिट हियर ऑफ कोर्स दिस कैन नॉट गो देयर दिस कैन नॉट गो ऑन टॉप ऑफ टेबल टू वेलोसिटी समवेयर इन द मिडिल बेस्ट इज टू बी 1 सेंटीमीटर अवे फ्रॉम वेयर यू हैव गिवन इंसिजन फॉर द ग्राफ्ट हार्वेस्ट यू हैव टू मेक इट देयर ओनली जाओ सो वंस देन यू पुट अ a uh, uh, support like this and then you start drilling again he will drill ha na but you can put a you, know, you can put a curate on top of it now you can put a curate on top of it and then you have made the tunnel the same graph size which was there it was 6 he is making 7 suppose this is a 7 graph so same graph size you make the tunnel there aage upar so there the tunnel Yes, so you have three landmarks which help. So posterior border of anterior of lateral meniscus. You don't have a lateral meniscus there. So where the the posterior border of anterior horn comes, this should exit exactly in line with this. Correct? Towards the medial tibial spine, not the lateral tibial spine. Suppose you draw a line. This is suppose lateral meniscus. Suppose I am drawing. Oh, pen, dena jara. Suppose this is the lateral meniscus. That's the horn of lateral meniscus, like this. and like this so you follow this this border and it goes straight and there is a medial tibial spine and there's a lateral tibial spine towards the medial tibial spine you have to stay you cannot stay on the lateral tibial spine so lateral tibial spine se tumhe medial taraf rehna because you don't want a lateral intercondylar impingement to happen impingement happens on the lateral side so you want to stay on the medial tibial spine side okay so once this is done you will you will take out this wire through a retriever there put in a retriever like this and hold this wire like this and pull it through the now this is our leading suture from where our zoom in karna bhaiya zara zoom in zoom in zoom in from where our graft is going to go so make it like see like this that's how our graft is traveling inside so once this is done you have secured your रेल रोड देन ग्राफ ले लिया ये है धागा ले आओ लूप में से यू हैव प्रिपेयर दैट ग्राफ कंस्ट्रक्ट ग्राफ लूप कंस्ट्रक्ट सो व्हाट आई एम गोइंग टू डू इज नाउ दिस फोर टेल विल गो कृष्णा ने ना संजीवन छोड़ दो what you can do is initials two cases you should mark it mark what so this is your button size at the end of the button you have to mark what is your tunnel length because then you know because you are doing scopy you know when this mark will reach there that means button has come out so you mark suppose our but, uh, tunnel length was 40 40 tunnel length just mark 40 there on the graph now you know this when this mark will come at the mouth of tibial tunnel femoral tunnel sorry that button is out because the total tunnel length is 40 correct because hamari puri tunnel ki length 40 thi to ye 40 hai that means jab ye yahan pe mark pahunchega hame arthroscopy se dikh raha hai andar ki taraf button bahar aa chuka hai yahan se kya kar raha hai nikal gaya kya laga le iska so it is 7 mm anterior to posterior which you can never measure so you have two landmarks is a practical landmarks third is of course tibial stump one landmark is follow the posterior border of anterior horn of lateral meniscus follow follow and reach the medial tibial spine where the medial tibial spine starts going down that's the point where you have to exit not on the lateral side so medial tibial spine down the lateral tibial spine down in this valley you have to stay medial not lateral so that's the point okay बटन में अभी तक एक ही फ्लिप करने के लिए अच्छा। ये होता दो ही है अब ये तो गिर गया था नकली है ये तो यू मेक इट गो लाइक दिस नाउ अंडरस्टैंड दिस व्हाट इज गोइंग टू हैपन सो एक मिनट हटा दे मैं संजीवन पकड़े हूँ सो व्हाट डू वी डू इज सपोज इसको पकड़े संजीवन दोनों पकड़ ले बेटा सो सी वॉट इज हैपनिंग देर एंड आई एम डूइंग सम मैनुअर देयर लुक एट द बटन वॉट इज वॉट इज हैपनिंग दैट इज सी सो मोशन करेक्ट सो वन इज लीडिंग फ्यूचर which will pull the button all the way here 
and then with this i'll make the button flat so for example what is going to happen is i pull 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 make the button go in the femoral tunnel again i take the slack out okay vidar dikh raha sir aapko ye now again when i pull 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 so this button has to come out and come 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 it comes out comes out now make it horizontal correct yes so once i so this has pull out like this once i make this and you pull it down how much is it ye baith gaya ja kar ke kya hua now our acl has so this is set up now this calculation whole calculation 15 35 25 is because of this only so once now your button is fixed in there and acl is sitting there now you have to put in a screw so like right, a screw hai khula hua मेटल स्क्रू है क्या मेटल स्क्रू मेटल वाला है ये तो वो वाला स्क्रू है कितने साइज का दे रहा है नाइन थर्टी फाइव ओके नाइन थर्टी फाइव सो यू पुट इन लाइक दिस दिस द गाइड वायर दिस गोज इन एंड देन यू डाल दे वहाँ से अनुराग इधर आ अनुराग डॉक्टर अनुराग से डालवा छोड़ दे छोड़ दे फिफ्टीन डिग्री पंद्रह डि� उसको दे देना ये रैचेट स्क्रू सो दिस इज अ रैचेट स्क्रू ड्राइवर यू डोंट हैव टू स्क्रू जस्ट इट लाइक इट गोस ऑन ठीक है रैचेट है यार समझा ये संजीवन बता देना ना की चलना जस्ट पुल इट डाउन कीप इट पुल्ड यू गो इन दिस इज अ रैचेट स्क्रू ड्राइवर सो यू जस्ट हैव टू डोंट हैव टू लीव द द हैंडल जस्ट कीप इट डूइंग लाइक दिस चला जा अंदर कोई नहीं जा रहा ये संजीवन अटक गया तेरा बीच में आके देखिए Why this is happening? Because this guide wire is tena meda. This is it. Stop, stop, stop. No, no. Isko aise se karna hai. No, no. Go, go. Lock it. Lock it. Lock it. Yeah. Goes like this. Ja, 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 ja. Push. 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 Screw, uh, which is coming, which is a slanted screw, to match the TBL slope. Earlier we had uh, rounded uh, this thing. The, that is why this was there is a confidence there. Now in this, you tighten. Amra, karo, tight karna, tight karna. Yes, going, 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 going. Keep going in. So it will match the slope of the tibia. So you don't have to put the screw all the way inside. Or throw it. One more, one more, one more, one more. One more, one more. Now this will match the. Ja? बस शुरू किया यार सो इट इज मैचिंग द निकालना इट इज मैचिंग द स्लोप ऑफ द टीबिया करेक्ट दैट इज हाउ इसका एंगल क्या नहीं ना इसका एंगल क्या होना चाहिए इसका 15 डिग्री सॉरी ऐसे देन स्क्रू निकालेंगे बाहर स्क्रू निकालेंगे ओके हो गया स्क्रू निकाल सर को दिखा इस संजीवन इसको निकालेंगे कैसे ये बीच में कर दे बीच में सर इसका स्लांट ऐसा है नहीं 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 मैं बाहर निकाल रहा हूं ये ये कटा हुआ स्क्रू स्क्रू है है जब इसको अंदर अंदर रहे हैं तो ये जब अंदर जाएंगे तो पहले ये प्रोमिनेंस रह जाती थी बट नाउ इट मैचेस स्लो विद टीबिया ये स्लीप मैच कर जाता है सो इट बिकम्स फ्लश विद टीबिया हाँ जी सर तक आ गया नहीं यहाँ तक आने की जरूरत नहीं है इट हैज टू स्टे फाइव मिलीमीटर डाउन सर वेन इट इज वेन इट इज वेन इट वेन यू मेक द एंगल टाइप सो वेन यू आर पुटिंग द स्क्रो इन यू हैव टू पुश दी आर बैक करेक्ट सो वेन वेन यू एक्सटेंड द नी एंड कैप्सूल इज टाइट यू कैन नॉट मैन ओवर टीबिया सो वेन अंडरस्टैंड दिस वंस द नी इज लॉक इन एक्सटेंशन कैप्सूल लॉक्स द नी विच हैपन्स विद एमसीएल ऑल्सो MCL जब हम चेक करते हैं LCL करते हैं वाई वी फ्लेक्स द नी थर्टी डिग्रीज बिकॉज द मोमेंट यू एक्सटेंड द नी इट बिकम्स टाइट ऑलरेडी बिकॉज कैप्सूल होल्ड द नी सो यू हैव टू मेक इट थर्टी डिग्री फ्लेक्सड इफ यू मेक इट एप्सोल्युटली स्ट्रेट इट विल लॉक द नी देन इफ यू वॉन्ट टू पुश द टीबी अब इट विल नॉट गो बैक देन यू विल नॉट बी एबल टू अप्लाई प्रेशर इफ यू मेक इट नाइंटी हाउ डू यू अप्लाई प्रेशर And you have to apply pressure. Ninety, we can say pressure apply. So thirty is what is universally being agreed to. So you have to push the TBI back. Why? Because TBI is little anterior. 
because of anterior coming every time the tibia is so little, little little pushing back abhi tight karenge ho gaya नहीं जो टॉर्न एसीएल थी आप थी उसको क्या करते हैं पहले निकाल देते हैं नहीं उसको सर बचाते हैं अभी तो स्टंप प्रिजर्वेशन एसीएल हो गया स्टंप प्रिजर्वेशन में व्हाट एवर एसीएल वी कैन प्रिजर्व 30 डिग्री सर अब ये तो कर नहीं सकते यस इस पोजीशन में रखते हैं 30 डिग्री पे डालो 30 डिग्री पे रहने देते हैं तो ये एडिशनल करते हैं हां जी हां तो स्टेपल्स नो व्हाट डू वी डू इज दैट्स अ वेरी अरे लेगा क्या वो ले क्या यार तो व्हाट डू वी डू इज नीक फॉर दिस वेरी गुड टेक्निक बाय आशीष सर कहां चलेगा क्या हम्म नहीं नहीं इसमें बड़ा वेरी गुड टेक्निक एक ड्रिल देना जरा ड्रिल कहां गई अरे वो आपकी टेक्निक सो व्हाट डू यू डू इज दिस इज दिस इज देयर मेक अ ड्रिल फ्रॉम देयर टू देयर pass in this thread from inside and make a knot you got it make this tunnel make two threads go through this one tunnel drill kar de beta bas yahan se tunnel drill karo aur lamba inhone graph le liya ab wo hum normally kya karte hain jo it's a very good technique so ye thread yahan se nikal lo thread yahan se nikal ke upar se aa jayega and make a knot sir position kya ashish sir technique ke upar se mahi koi nahi sir so make this go position kya hoti hai tunnel ki डाल के दोनों निकाल दो कुछ है इसमें से बजाएगा बंदा बे प्लांट के सामने तक नहीं हुआ कुछ है नेटिव वीडियो वो है सामने दे दो तो यार एक बीच में ट्रिपिट दो यार ट्रिल करके ना चला जाएगा तो छोटा तो सेवा अरे अंडरस्टैंडेबल है इसको यहां से लाओ ये छोटा है ग्राफ सपोज करो छोटा है टाई नॉट सो व्हेन यू टाई दिस बिकम्स मैं नॉर्मली जो है जब बनाता हूँ तो हम एट स्टैंड बनाते हैं माग्राफ इतना नहीं निकलता माग्राफ अक्सर टनल के अंदर यहाँ पे यहाँ तक होता है then it is easy if your graft is long then you just cannot do it then you have to put a staple or something like that for fixing it warna jab graft andar reh jata hai hamara to main usko pull karke dhago yahan baandh deta hu just secondly stabilize if your screw is uh, loose something happens right, right. हमारे साथ एक दो इंस्टेंस आए कि जब स्क्रू अपने बाहर आ गया इन्फेक्ट हो गया लेकिन सेकेंडली फिक्सेशन से ग्राफ्ट रुका था इट वर्क यू हैव टू बी वेरी कॉशस नॉट बनाते समय कि ऐसा तान के नहीं कर दो कि वो तुम्हारा डेड स्पेस क्रिएट करे तो नॉट यू हैव टू एडजस्ट शुड कम समेयर हेयर ओनली तो ना तो उसको नील करने में नॉट गड़े और ना तो उसको जो है वो तुम्हारा डेड स्पेस एलिवेट करके सॉफ्ट टिश्यू को ना कर दे okay. अगर नॉट आती भी है देन आई टेक जो डीप बाइट लेकर के थोड़ा सा सॉफ्ट टिश्यू के ऊपर लड़कियों में दिक्कत है नील करना उनकी आदत है क्या अगर बड़ी नॉट बना दी तो गड़ता है सीजर है क्या सीजर हम सीजर सही है फर्स्ट टू डेमोंस्ट्रेट दो दो सीजर देना जरा काट दे वो सर्विस डिमोंस्ट्रेट करने के लिए दस टू डिमोंस्ट्रेट डुअल फिक्सेशन अगर स्क्रू लूज हो जाए स्लिप कर जाए सो देन देयर इज सम मेक इट लाइक दिस व्हिच इज होल्डिंग इट कुछ दिनों के लिए कि जब तक जुड़ना जाए वो परचर पे जुड़ना है उसको तो एक साइड इधर आ गया ना सो इतना नीचे नहीं भाई ऑब्वियसली बात है बट लुक एट दिस दैट्स द मेथड दिस शुड बी समवेयर देयर नॉट हियर क्यों उधर ले जाओ सो वन fixation is there the other fixation is not at the leg it should be somewhere there yes free ki hai na wo cut tha ye jo second fixation hai dhage hi se hota hai dhage se bas baand diya aapne isme knot baand diya sir wale swivel lock hai kya koi batate hain bhi nahi ye kis level pe rahega bone ke upar haan ji sir yahan pe rahega is jagah pe on that side 
यहाँ नहीं करना नहीं हमने ये जो धागे शुरू हो जाएंगे धागे यहाँ पे आएंगे तो उसमें इन दैट एडजस्टेबल लूप एडवांटेज इज यू डोंट हैव टू मेजर द लेंथ थर्टी फाइव फिफ्टीन फोर्टी फिफ्टी फाइव यू डोंट टू मेजर चालीस की लेंथ आई थी सर जैसे चालीस की टनल थी जो हमने का लूप लिया चालीस की टनल है चालीस की टनल है पंद्रह का लूप हो गया समझना है इस बात पेपर पे ना गया सो सपोज दिस इज फोर्टी इज माई टनल साइज करेक्ट फोर्टी पंद्रह का लूप है पच्चीस ग्राफ है करेक्ट 25 ग्राफ को फ्लिप करने के लिए मुझे कितना चाहिए प्लस 10 चाहिए तो मान लो 25 की ग्राफ 15 का लो तो प्लस 10 कितना हो गया 35 नहीं सर मैं वो मेरे को मालूम वो हां मुझे ये पूछना है अगर हम सर 20 का ग्राफ लेते 20 के 20 का तो 30 तक ड्रिल करोगे वही वो, वो हम कर सकते थे ना करेक्ट कर सकते थे सो यू कैन टेक 20 ग्राफ क्योंकि 15 का बिकॉज़ व्हाई व्हाई बिकॉज़ आई वांट दिस लूप टू बी शॉर्टेस्ट I don't want this loop to be longer. पैतीस की हो तब भी पंद्रह लो चालीस हो तब भी पंद्रह लो पैतालीस हो तुम्हारी टनल ही गलत है तो अगर अगर तुम्हारी बिकॉज यू वॉन्ट बिकॉज सी दिस टनल इज फोर्टी सपोज दिस टनल इज एट ग्राफ इज हाउ मच इट इज फिलिंग द टनल वॉट इज नॉट फिलिंग द टनल इज द लूप दिस द बटन तो ये लूप जितना प्लेस है वो लूप देगा अगर ये लूप इतना बड़ा होगा डेड स्पेस और कम कर दिया ना फॉर दिस लूप टू मूव हियर एंड देयर सपोज टनल इज लाइक दिस एंड दिस इज द लूप एंड दिस इज द ग्राफ नाउ दिस इज अ प्ले लाइक दिस एंड दिस विल कीप ऑन इन इंटरेस्ट दैट इज कॉल्ड एज टनल डायलेटेशन एंड व्हिच विल कॉज इन डिसइंटीग्रेशन ऑफ ग्राफ वो भी गलत नहीं था जैसे अब 20 का ग्राफ 20 का लूप ले लेते हैं फाइबर वायर लिया हाँ जी सर इनके पॉपुलेशन है वो ये रिकमेंड करती है की टीबिया साइड में अर्ली फेलियर जब एसियल का होता है टीबियल साइड so they recommend dual fixation on the tibial side western population doesn't believe in this with they say only one fixation is good enough but japanese korean they always fix two tbr yahan laga denge post band denge so what we do is ek aur dena ek aur dena sir agar 38 ke liye aati to kya karte hai to to kitna to tum 23 lete ho 33 wo to sir wo drill karte hain hum 33 to 15 15 hai matlab hi nahi yaar matlab hi nahi yaar kyun 20 mein aata hai why you want to chicken out yaar darte ho na 5 ml bajane se fir training se the No 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 never do that ठीक है हम ये जैसा आप कौन सा चल रहा है पता है वो है तेरे पास क्या यू वांट टू सी दिस दिस इज अ वेरी गुड सर मनीष सर पहले वो दिखा दे मनीष का हो गया यार वो जो मैंने वो उसमें तो व्हाट वी डू इज आप दूसरा दे देते हैं वो है क्या तेरे पास अरे फर्स्ट पास है सो व्हाट डू यू डू इज इसको काट देना एक और है धागा ये एक और धागा है क्या So I what I do is I take that bite and take this thread from back of the ACL like this. कुछ retriever है? शुरू back है कि मिड्स ऑफ़ है? No 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 back. back so ACL के पीछे से ले आया मैं ये. Suppose this is an evil stump. Now you have a ACL and there is a bone there. So once you put this will be on the bone. 
चौड़ा <laughs> यहां पे टनल बना लो करेक्ट अब वो सामान चला गया तो टनल बना करके उसको यहां से निकाल लिया यहां से आ गया ये ऐसे ही दूसरा एक फाइबर अरे है थ्रेड तेरे पास है और एक थ्रेड है उधर से इधर ले गए चले आओगे सो दिस विल बिकम अ क्रिस क्रॉस लाइक दिस सो इट प्रिवेंट्स दैट फ्रैगमेंट फ्रॉम गोइंग अप जस्ट एंट्रो जस्ट एंट्रो लैटरल एंट्रो मीडियल वो नहीं देगा अच्छा यहां से निकाल लेते हैं चलो निकल आया सो सो मेक दिस गो लाइक दिस कुछ रिट्रीव करने दो यार डोंट मेक इट निकाल दे यार चलो हाँ जी ये आपने ऐसे निकाला दिस इज दिस इज दिग्रेशन करेक्ट ये हमारा ये हिस्सा है ये वाला वर्ष है ये वाला हिस्सा ठीक है तो ये हमने वल्शन के इधर से निकाला इधर से निकाला जहां पे जितना बड़ा एवल्जन है मान लो एवल्जन का मिडिल कॉर्नर ये लैटरल कॉर्नर सपोज गिव मी अ मार्कर मान लो कि तुम्हारा एवल्जन इतना बड़ा है ये उसका मिडिल मार्जिन है ये उसका लैटरल मार्जिन है सो दिस विल गो लाइक दिस एंड दिस विल गो लाइक दिस मार्जिन से लेना है उसको मार्जिन से नो 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 यू हैव टू बी एंट्रो लैटरल एंट्रो मिडिल सो यू हैव टू यू कैन नॉट बी देयर यू कैन बिकॉज़ इफ यू लुक लाइक दिस When you tie it, ये बम सामने से उठ जाएगा। So आगे से दबा के रखना उसको like this। So what happens? This compresses this corner, this compresses this, and this crisscross will not allow the the bone to go up like this. That's the configuration. वो उसमें क्या करते हैं कि हाँ उसमें इसको फिर बांधो बांधना किस तरीके से? वो bone के ऊपर tunnel बना के बांधो। Cinch knot में क्या करते हैं कि इसके क्रेटर में लगा लो और क्रेटर से पास यहाँ खींचोगे तो दिस विल मेक इट सेट लाइक दिस नो नो उसके बाद भी तुम्हें दो टनल बनानी है दैट्स फॉर रिडक्शन इन द फर्स्ट टेक्निक आई यूज के वायर फॉर रिडक्शन इफ यू डोंट वांट टू यूज के वायर फॉर रिडक्शन बिकॉज दिस इज इम्पॉर्टेंट वेन दिस कॉम्बिनेशन देन यू इफ यूट के वायर इट माइट बस्ट सो यू वॉन्ट टू डू लिटिल बिट यू डोट टू हैंडल द फ्रैक्चर फ्रैगमेंट तुम इसे छूना नहीं चाहते तो तुम नीचे से जेल बना के आगे से धागा लेके नीचे से खींचोगे तो वो बैठा देगा उसको ले जाके बट दैट इज ओनली वेन ऑन सिटी स्कैन यू सीन दैट इज कॉम्बिनेशन एंड यू आर अफ्रेड यार इसको हाथ लगाऊंगा तो भला हिल जाएगा ऐसे करके ये क्या है हां सो दिस इज देयर जोन स्पेसिफिक कैनला सिस्टम द वंडरफुल सिस्टम दैट दे हैव गॉट सो दिस इसमें लिखा हुआ है सो आई थिंक ऑल मीडियल मेनिस्कस कैन बी मैनेज्ड बाय दिस सिस्टम दिस सिस्टम You don't have to do all inside for medial meniscus. They have this this zone specific posterior zone, middle zone, and anterior zone. It is written on top of this left anterior, right posterior. Right posterior. Suppose you want to do so. This is a suppose this is medial. This is lateral. So what do you? This is right posterior. So you, you use this. This is meant for that. Put it there, and then if you put push in a needle, it does the needle. so this is a uh, doctor the pasvi had in this lecture zone zone specific this is the zone specific anal system so you push in like this it will avoid the central structures so he said na zone specific se mera area bad gaya ab bad gaya so you pass on thread like this so you don't need to have that costly thing of kis layer posterior se anterior ja raha hu haan ji main anterior se posterior ja raha hu ye anterior hai aage hai piche hai मैं डिमोस्ट्रेट कर रहा हूं ऐसे सो so, उन्होंने पूरा नहीं खींचो देन यू पुट इट पुट दिस आइदर अप डाउन जहां भी लगाना है तो मैंने फिक्स कर लिया 
suppose you want to make this go like this again put in the thread so you don't need that so for media meniscus i have stopped using all inside devices very costly devices 16 20000 so make it go like this and when you tighten this holds the meniscus Correct. Then again, you can hold it like this. Hold. So then you can give a sliding knot like this, or you can just a half inch, single, single half inch. Just not push like inside out. Inside out. So you take this like you have not pushers, this shoulder system. All kind of tear you can manage medial meniscus, not lateral meniscus. Okay, so this is not pusher. So you push the knot, go, go, go in, go in, keep tightening it like this, going in, keep tightening like this, and it goes in. So it will. Okay. They push in not like this. Okay. Then again, you can give a half half inches like this. Yes, you done as well. Don't leave, no? Don't leave. So again, you can take this like this and again push in, push in, push in, and lock it. Lock it. Keep pulling. Keep pull, 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 pull. pull, pull. Then hold, keep holding, keep holding, keep holding, keep holding, don't leave. Again, back it out, push it in. Again, back it out, back it out. Again, push it in. Again, back it out. Then again, just as a spout. You push the knot in, no? that is how you tie the knot. Then you have your cutter. The cutter last me. Oh, all inside, sir. Yeah, inside out, the other cutter out there. Okay, thank you. So thank you guys. And it was an excellent cooperation by all of you. And I thank by my core of heart to all delegates, faculty, pharma sponsors, media sponsors, my AV team, Sanjay Ojas team, hotel people like uh, from the Vijay International. And of course, 
हमारी टीम जो साथ में थी उसका धन्यवाद शब्दों में तो दे नहीं सकते हैं उनके लिए तालियां बजा सकते हैं केवल और एक बढ़िया पार्टी करके उसे सेलिब्रेट किया जाएगा डॉक्टर आशीष सर जो कि कह रहे हैं कि एक साल घर छोड़ दिया मैंने साधु बन गए हैं जब से प्रेसिडेंट बने हैं और कह रहे थे सुबह के प्रेसिडेंट का पी नहीं लूंगा अगले साल से नाम थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर टेकिंग आउट द टाइम इतनी व्यस्तता में सो थ्री चीयर्स फॉर द कानपुर ऑर्थोपेडिक्स टीम थैंक यू वेरी मच हेपे फोर रे थ्री चीयर्स प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ के ओ ए and a special thank to dr gobind sethi who is our own uh, old pal so who has come after so many years from london ek sath mein photo ho jaye sir ha 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 jo bhaiya thank you guys aaiye sir ek ek photo mein aa jaiye dr rajiv sir bhateja sir aaiye aa bhai gobind ji ke darshan kahan hote hain gaurav aao aaiye dr vinay guru bhi hai gobind ji aao lambe aadmi kahi khade hain nandan aao aaiye dr ashish पवन आओ रोहित आओ वेलकम वेलकम अरे बहुत ऐसा करो चेयर्स लगा दो खिटिंग स्पेशल थैंक टू जादू तिवारी जी स्पेशल थैंक्स जादू के लिए सो वी टेक लीव नाउ थैंक यू वेरी मच Very many congrats sir